Introduction of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce. Translated by Douglas Ainsley. 1865 to 1948. Introduction. The aesthetic is dedicated by the author to the memory of his parents Pasquale and Luisa Sipari and of his sister Maria. Note. I give here a close translation of the complete theory of aesthetic and in the historical summary with the consent of the author an abbreviation of the historical portion of the original work. Introduction There are always Americas to be discovered, the most interesting in Europe. I can lay no claim to having discovered an America, but I do claim to have discovered a Columbus. His name is Benedetto Croce, and he dwells on the shores of the Mediterranean at Naples, city of the antique Parthenope. Croce's America cannot be expressed in geographical terms. It is more important than any space of mountain and river, of forest and dale. It belongs to the kingdom of the spirit, and has many provinces. That province which most interests me, I have striven in the following pages to annex to the possessions of the Anglo-Saxon race, an act which cannot be blamed as predatory, since it may be said of philosophy more truly than of love that to divide is not to take away. The historical summary will show how many a brave adventurer has navigated the perilous seas of speculation upon art, how Aristotle's marvellous insight gave him glimpses of its beauty, how Plato threw away its golden fruit, how Baumgarten sounded the depths of its waters, Kant sailed along its coast without landing, and Vico hoisted the Italian flag upon its shore. But Benedetto Croce has been the first thoroughly to explore it, cutting his way inland through the tangled undergrowth of imperfect thought. He has measured its length and breadth, marked out and described its spiritual features with minute accuracy. The country thus won to philosophy will always bear his name, Estetica di Croce, a new America. It was at Naples in the winter of 1907 that I first saw the philosopher of aesthetic. Benedetto Croce, although born in the Abruzzi, province of Aquila, in 1866, is essentially a Neapolitan, and rarely remains long absent from the city on the shore of that magical sea where once Ulysses sailed, and where sometimes yet, near Amalfi, we may hear the sirens sing their song. But more wonderful than the song of any siren seems to me the theory of aesthetic as the science of expression, and that is why I have overcome the obstacles that stood between me and the giving of this theory, which, in my belief is the truth, to the English-speaking world. No one could have been further removed than myself, as I turned over at Naples the pages of La Critica, from any idea that I was nearing the solution of the problem of art. All my youth it had haunted me. As an undergraduate at Oxford, I had caught the exquisite cadence of Walter Pater's speech, as it came from his very lips, or rose like the perfume of some exotic flower from the ribbed pages of the Renaissance. Seeming to solve the riddle of the Sphinx, he solved it not, only delighted with pure pleasure of poetry and of subtle thought as he led one along the pathways of his enchanted garden, where I shall always love to tread. Oscar Wilde, too, I had often heard at his best, the most brilliant talker of our time, his wit flashing in the spring sunlight of Oxford luncheon parties, as now in his beautiful writings like the jewelled rapier of Mercutio. But his works, too, will be searched in vain by the seeker after definite aesthetic truth. 
With A.C. Swinburne I had sat and watched the lava they yet flowed from those lips that were kissed in youth by all the muses. Neither from him, nor from J. M. Whistler's brilliant aphorisms on art, could be gathered anything more than the exquisite pleasure of the moment, the monochronous hedonae. Of the great pedagogues I had known, but never sat at the feet of Jowett, whom I found far less inspiring than any of the great men above mentioned. Among the dead I had studied Herbert Spencer and Matthew Arnold, Schopenhauer, Nietzsche, and Gaio. I had conversed with that living Neo-Latin Anatole France, the modern Rousseau, and had enjoyed the marvellous irony and eloquence of his writings, which, while they delight the society in which he lives, may well be one of the causes that lead to its eventual destruction. The solution of the problem of aesthetic is not in the gift of the muses. To return to Naples, as I looked over those pages of the bound volumes of La Critica, I soon became aware that I was in the presence of a mind far above the ordinary level of literary criticism. The profound studies of Carducci, of D'Annunzio, and of Pascoli, to name but three, in which those writers passed before me in all their strength and in all their weakness, led me to devote several days to the Critica. At the end of that time, I was convinced that I had made a discovery, and wrote to the philosopher, who owns and edits that journal. In response to his invitation, I made my way on a sunny day in November, past the little shops of the coral vendors that surround like a necklace the Rione della Bellezza, and wound zigzag along the overcrowded Toledo. I knew that Signor Croce lived in the old part of town, but had hardly anticipated so remarkable a change as I experienced on passing beneath the great archway and finding myself in old Naples. This has already been described elsewhere, and I will not here dilate upon this world within a world, having so much of greater interest to tell in a brief space. I will merely say that the costumes here seemed more picturesque, the dark eyes flashed more dangerously than elsewhere. There was a quaint life, an animation about the streets, different from anything I had known before. As I climbed the lofty stone steps of the palazzo to the floor where dwells the philosopher of aesthetic, I felt as though I had stumbled into the eighteenth century, and were calling on Giambattisto Vico. After a brief inspection by a young man with the appearance of a secretary, I was told that I was expected, and admitted into a small room opening out of the hall. Thence, after a few moments waiting, I was led into a much larger room. The walls were lined all round with bookcases, barred and numbered, filled with volumes forming part of the philosopher's great library. I had not long to wait. A door opened behind me on my left, and a rather short, thick-set man advanced to greet me, and pronouncing my name at the same time with a slight foreign accent, asked me to be seated beside him. After the interchange of a few brief formulae of politeness in French, our conversation was carried on in Italian, and I had a better opportunity of studying my host's air and manner. His hands he held clasped before him, but frequently released them, to make those vivid gestures with which Neapolitans frequently clinch their phrase. His most remarkable feature was his eyes, of a greenish-gray, extraordinary eyes, not for beauty, but for their fathomless depth, and for the sympathy which one felt welling up in them from the soul beneath. This was especially noticeable, as our conversation fell upon the question of art, and upon the many problems bound up with it. I do not know how long that first interview lasted, but it seemed a few minutes only, during which was displayed before me a vast panorama of unknown height and headland of league upon league of forest, with its bright-winged birds of thought flying from tree to tree down the long avenues into the dim blue vistas of the unknown. I returned with my brain a-whirl, as though I had been in fairyland, and when I looked at the second edition of the Estetica, with his inscription, I was sure of it. 
these lines will suffice to show how the translation of the Aesthetica originated from the acquaintance thus formed, which has developed into friendship. I will now make brief mention of Benedetto Croce's other work, especially in so far as it throws light upon the aesthetic. For this purpose, besides articles in Italian and German reviews, I have made use of the excellent monograph on the philosopher by G. Prezzolini. First, then, it will be well to point out that the aesthetic forms part of a complete philosophical system, to which the author gives the general title of Philosophy of the Spirit. The aesthetic is the first of the three volumes, the second is the logic, the third the philosophy of the practical. In the logic, as elsewhere in the system, Croce combats that false conception by which natural science in the shape of psychology makes claim to philosophy and formal logic to absolute value. The thesis of the pure concept cannot be discussed here. It is connected with the logic of evolution as discovered by Hegel, and is the only logic which contains in itself the interpretation and the continuity of reality. Bergson, in his L'Evolution Creatrice, deals with logic in a somewhat similar manner. I recently heard him lecture on the distinction between spirit and matter at the Collage de France, and those who read French and Italian will find that both Croce's logic and the book above mentioned by the French philosopher will amply repay their labor. The conception of nature as something lying outside the spirit which informs it, as the non-being which aspires to being, underlies all Croce's thought, and we find constant reference to it throughout his philosophical system. With regard to the third volume, The Philosophy of the Practical, it is impossible here to give more than a hint of its treasures. I merely refer in passing to the treatment of the will, which is posited as a unity inseparable from the volitional act. For Croce there is no difference between action and intention, means and end. They are one thing, inseparable as the intuition expression of aesthetic. The philosophy of the practical is a logic and science of the will, not a normative science. Just as in aesthetic the individuality of expression made models and rules impossible, so in practical life the individuality of action removes the possibility of catalogues of virtues, of the exact application of laws, of the existence of practical judgments, and judgments of value, previous to action. The reader will probably ask here, but what, then, becomes of morality? The question will be found answered in the theory of aesthetic. And I will merely say here that Croce's thesis of the double degree of the practical activity, economic and moral, is one of the greatest contributions to modern thought. Just as it is proved in the theory of aesthetic that the concept depends upon the intuition, which is the first degree, the primary and indispensable thing, so it is proved in the philosophy of the practical that morality or ethic depends upon economic, which is the first degree of the practical activity. The volitional act is always economic, but true freedom of the will exists and consists in conforming not merely to economic, but to moral conditions, to the human spirit, which is greater than any individual. Here we are face to face with the ethics of Christianity, to which Croce accords all honor. This philosophy of the spirit is symptomatic of the happy reaction of the twentieth century against the crude materialism of the second half of the nineteenth. It is the spirit which gives to the work of art its value, not this or that method of arrangement, this or that tint or cadence, which can always be copied by skillful plagiarists. Not so the spirit of the Creator. 
In England we hear too much of natural science, which has usurped the very name of philosophy. The natural sciences are very well in their place, but discoveries such as aviation are of infinitely less importance to the race than the smallest addition to the philosophy of the spirit. Empirical science, with the collusion of positivism, has stolen the cloak of philosophy, and must be made to give it back. Among Croce's other important contributions to thought must be mentioned his definition of history as being aesthetic, and differing from art solely in that history represents the real, art the possible. In connection with this definition and its proof, the philosopher recounts how he used to hold an opposite view. Doing everything thoroughly, he had prepared and written out a long disquisition on this thesis, which was already in type, when suddenly, from the midst of his meditations, the truth flashed upon him. He saw for the first time clearly that history cannot be a science, since, like art, it always deals with the particular. Without a moment's hesitation, he hastened to the printers and bade them break up the type. This incident is illustrative of the sincerity and good faith of Benedetto Croce. One knows him to be severe for the faults and weaknesses of others, merciless for his own. Yet though severe, the editor of La Critica is uncompromisingly just, and would never allow personal dislike or jealousy, or any extrinsic consideration, to stand in the way of fair treatment to the writer concerned. Many superficial English critics might benefit considerably by attention to this quality in one who is in other respects also so immeasurably their superior. A good instance of this impartiality is his critique of Schopenhauer, with whose system he is in complete disagreement, yet affords him full credit for what of truth is contained in his voluminous writings. Croce's education was largely completed in Germany, and, on account of their thoroughness, he has always been an upholder of German methods. One of his complaints against the Italian positivists is that they only read second-rate works in French, or, at the most, the dilettante booklets published in such profusion by the Anglo-Saxon press. This tendency towards German thought, especially in philosophy, depends upon the fact of the former undoubted supremacy of Germany in that field. But Croce does not for a moment admit the inferiority of the Neo-Latin races, and adds with homely humour in reference to Germany that we must not throw away the baby with the bath-water. Close, arduous study and clear thought are the only key to scientific, philosophical truth, and Crochet never begins an article for a newspaper without the complete collection of the works of the author to be criticized, and his own elaborate notes on the table before him. Schopenhauer said there were three kinds of writers, those who write without thinking, the great majority, those who think while they write, not very numerous, those who write after they have thought, very rare. Croce certainly belongs to the last division, and, as I have said, always feeds his thought upon complete erudition. The bibliography of the works consulted for the Aesthetica alone, as printed at the end of the Italian edition, extends to many pages and contains references to works in any way dealing with the subject in all the European languages. For instance, Croce has studied Mr. B. Bozanquet's eclectic works on aesthetic, largely based upon German sources and by no means without value. But he takes exception to Mr. Bozanquet's statement that he has consulted all works of importance on the subject of aesthetic. As a matter of fact, Mr. Bozenke reveals his ignorance of the greater part of the contribution to aesthetic made by the Neo-Latin races, which the reader of this book will recognize as of first-rate importance. 
This thoroughness it is which gives such importance to the literary and philosophical criticisms of La Critica. Croce's method is always historical, and his object in approaching any work of art is to classify the spirit of its author as expressed in that work. There are, he maintains, but two things to be considered in criticizing a book. These are, firstly, what is its peculiarity, in what way is it singular, how is it differentiated from other works? Secondly, what is its degree of purity, that is, to what extent has its author kept himself free from all considerations alien to the perfection of the work as an expression, as a lyrical intuition? With the answering of these questions, Croce is satisfied. He does not care to know if the author kept a motor-car, like Maeterlinck, or prefer to walk, on Putney Heath, like Swinburne. This amounts to saying that all works of art must be judged by their own standard. How far has the author succeeded in doing what he intended? Croce is far above any personal animus, although the same cannot be said of those he criticizes. These, like D'Annunzio, whose limitations he points out, his egoism, his lack of human sympathy, are often very bitter, and accuse the penetrating critic of want of courtesy. This seriousness of purpose runs like a golden thread through all Croce's work. The flimsy superficial remarks on poetry and fiction, which too often pass for criticism in England, Scotland is a good deal more thorough, are put to shame by La Critica, the study of which I commend to all readers who read or wish to read Italian. They will find in its back numbers a complete picture of a century of Italian literature, besides a storehouse of philosophical criticism. The quarterly and Edinburgh reviews are our only journals which can be compared to La Critica, and they are less exhaustive on the philosophical side. We should have to add to these Mind and the Hibbert Journal to get even an approximation to the scope of the Italian review. As regards Croce's general philosophical position, it is important to understand that he is not a Hegelian, in the sense of being a close follower of that philosopher. One of his last works is that in which he deals in a masterly manner with the philosophy of Hegel. The title may be translated, What is Living and What is Dead of the Philosophy of Hegel? Here he explains to us the Hegelian system more clearly than that wondrous edifice was ever before explained, and we realize at the same time that Croce is quite as independent of Hegel as of Kant, of Vico as of Spinoza. Of course, he has made use of the best of Hegel, just as every thinker makes use of his predecessors, and is in his turn made use of by those that follow him. But it is incorrect to accuse of Hegelianism, the author of an anti-Hegelian aesthetic, of a logic where Hegel is only half accepted, and of a philosophy of the practical, which contains hardly a trace of Hegel. I give an instance. If the great conquest of Hegel be the dialectic of opposites, his great mistake lies in the confusion of opposites with things which are distinct but not opposite. If, says Croce, we take as an example the application of the Hegelian triad that formulates becoming, affirmation, negation, and synthesis, we find it applicable for those opposites which are true and false, good and evil, being and not being, but not applicable to things which are distinct but not opposite, such as art and philosophy, beauty and truth, the useful and the moral. These confusions led Hegel to talk of the death of art, to conceive as possible a philosophy of history, and to the application of the natural sciences to the absurd task of constructing a philosophy of nature. Croce 
has cleared away these difficulties by showing that if from the meeting of opposites must arise a superior synthesis, such a synthesis cannot arise from things which are distinct but not opposite, since the former are connected together as superior and inferior, and the inferior can exist without the superior, but not vice versa. Thus we see how philosophy cannot exist without art, while art, occupying the lower place, can and does exist without philosophy. This brief example reveals Croce's independence in dealing with Hegelian problems. I know of no philosopher more generous than Croce in praise and elucidation of other workers in the same field, past and present. For instance, and apart from Hegel, Kant has to thank him for drawing attention to the marvellous excellence of the critique of judgment, generally neglected in favour of the critiques of pure reason and of practical judgment. Baumgarten for drawing the attention of the world to his obscure name, and for reprinting his Latin thesis in which the word aesthetic occurs for the first time. And Schleiermacher, for the tributes paid to his neglected genius in the history of aesthetic. La Critica, too, is full of generous appreciation of contemporaries by Croce and by that profound thinker, Gentile. But it is not only philosophers who have reason to be grateful to Croce for his untiring zeal and diligence. Historians, economists, poets, actors, and writers of fiction have been rescued from their undeserved limbo by this valiant Red Cross Knight, and now shine with due brilliance in the circle of their peers. It must also be admitted that a large number of false lights, popular will-o'-the-wisps, have been ruthlessly extinguished with the same breath. For instance, Karl Marx, the socialist theorist and agitator, finds in Croce an exponent of his views, in so far as they are based upon the truth, but where he blunders, his critic immediately reveals the origin and nature of his mistakes. Croce's studies in economic are chiefly represented by his work, the title of which may be translated, Historical Materialism and Marxist Economic. To indicate the breadth and variety of Croce's work, I will mention the further monograph on the 16th century Neapolitan Pulcinella, the original of our punch, and the personage of the Neapolitan in comedy, a monument of erudition and of accurate and lively dramatic criticism that would alone have occupied an ordinary man's activity for half a lifetime. One must remember, however, that Croce's average working day is of ten hours. His interest is concentrated on things of the mind, and although he sits on several royal commissions, such as those of the archives of all Italy, and of the monuments to King Victor Emmanuel, he has taken no university degree, and much dislikes any affectation of academic superiority. He is ready to meet any one on equal terms, and try with them to get at the truth of any subject, be it historical, literary, or philosophical. Truth, he says, is democratic, and I can testify that the search for it in his company is very stimulating. As is well said by Prezzolini, he has a new word for all. There can be no doubt of the great value of Croce's work as an educative influence, and if we are to judge of a philosophical system by its action on others, then we must place the philosophy of the spirit very high. It may be said, with perfect truth, that since the death of the poet Carducci, there has been no influence in Italy to compare with that of Benedetto Croce. His dislike of academies and of all forms of prejudice runs parallel with his breadth and sympathy with all forms of thought. His activity in the present is only equaled by his reverence for the past. Naples he loves with the blind love of the child for its parent, and he has been of notable assistance to such Neapolitan talent as is manifested in the works of Salvatore di Giacomo, 
whose best poems are written in the dialect of Naples, or rather in a dialect of his own, which Croce has difficulty in persuading the author always to retain. The original jet of inspiration, having been in dialect, it is clear that to amend this inspiration at the suggestion of wiseacres at the café would have been to ruin it altogether. Of the popularity that his system and teaching have already attained, we may judge by the fact that the aesthetic, despite the difficulty of the subject, is already in its third edition in Italy, where, owing to its influence, philosophy sells better than fiction, while the French and Germans, not to mention the Czechs, have long had translations of the earlier editions. His logic is on the point of appearing in its second edition, and I have no doubt that the philosophy of the practical will eventually equal these works in popularity. The importance and value of Italian thought have been too long neglected in Great Britain where, as in Benedetto Croce, we get the clarity of vision of the Latin, joined to the thoroughness and erudition of the best German tradition, we have a combination of rarer power and effectiveness, which can by no means be neglected. The philosopher feels that he has a great mission, which is nothing less than the leading back of thought to belief in the spirit, deserted by so many for crude empiricism and positivism. His view of philosophy is that it sums up all the higher human activities, including religion, and that in proper hands it is able to solve any problem. But there is no finality about problems. The solution of one leads to the posing of another, and so on. Man is the maker of life, and his spirit ever proceeds from a lower to a higher perfection. Connected with this view of life is Croce's dislike of modernism. When once a problem has been correctly solved, it is absurd to return to the same problem. Roman Catholicism cannot march with the times. It can only exist by being conservative. Its only logic is to be illogical. Therefore, Croce is opposed to Loisy and Neo-Catholicism, and supports the encyclical against modernism. The Catholic religion with its great stores of myth and morality, which for many centuries was the best thing in the world, is still there for those who are unable to assimilate other food. Another instance of his dislike for modernism is his criticism of Pascoli, whose attempts to reveal enigmas in the writings of Dante he looks upon as useless. We do not, he says, read Dante in the twentieth century for his hidden meanings, but for his revealed poetry. I believe that Croce will one day be recognized as one of the very few great teachers of humanity. At present he is not appreciated at nearly his full value. One rises from a study of his philosophy with a sense of having been all the time, as it were, in personal touch with the truth, which is very far from the case after the perusal of certain other philosophies. Croce has been called the philosopher-poet, and if we take philosophy as Novalis understood it, certainly Croce does belong to the poets, though not to the formal category of those who write in verse. Croce is at any rate a born philosopher, and as every trade tends to make its object prosaic, so does every vocation tend to make it poetic. Yet no one has toiled more earnestly than Croce. Thorough might well be his motto, and if today he is admitted to be a classic without the stiffness one connects with that term, be sure he has well merited the designation. His name stands for the best that Italy has to give the world of serious, stimulating thought. I know nothing to equal it elsewhere." Secure in his strength, Croce will often introduce a joke or some amusing illustration from contemporary life, in the midst of a most profound and serious argument. This spirit of mirth is a sign of superiority. He who is not sure of himself can spare no energy for the making of mirth. Croce loves to laugh at his enemies and with his friends. So the philosopher of Naples sits by the blue gulf and explains the universe to those who have ears to hear. 
one can philosophize anywhere he says but he remains significantly at naples thus i conclude these brief remarks upon the author of the aesthetic confident that those who give time and attention to its study will be grateful for having placed in their hands this pearl of great price from the diadem of the antique parthenope douglas ainsley the athenaeum pall mall may 1909 end of introduction Recording by Lisa Reichert Chapter 1 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce Translated by Douglas Ainsley, 1865-1948 to Chapter 1 Intuition and Expression Intuitive Knowledge Human knowledge has two forms. It is either intuitive knowledge or logical knowledge, knowledge obtained through the imagination or knowledge obtained through the intellect, knowledge of the individual or knowledge of the universal, of individual things or of the relations between them. It is, in fact, productive either of images or of concepts. In ordinary life, constant appeal is made to intuitive knowledge. It is said to be impossible to give expression to certain truths, that they are not demonstrable by syllogisms, that they must be learnt intuitively. The politician finds fault with the abstract reasoner who is without a lively knowledge of actual conditions. The pedagogue insists upon the necessity of developing the intuitive faculty in the pupil before everything else. The critic, in judging a work of art, makes it a point of honour to set aside theory and abstractions, and to judge it by direct intuition. The practical man professes to live rather by intuition than by reason. But this ample acknowledgment, granted to intuitive knowledge in ordinary life, does not meet with an equal and adequate acknowledgment in the field of theory and of philosophy. There exists a very ancient science of intellective knowledge, admitted by all without discussion, namely logic. But a science of intuitive knowledge is timidly and with difficulty admitted by but a few. Logical knowledge has appropriated the lion's share, and if she does not quite slay and devour her companion, yet yields to her with difficulty the humble little place of maidservant or doorkeeper. What it says is intuitive knowledge without the light of intellective knowledge. It is a servant without a master, and though a master find a servant useful, the master is a necessity to the servant, since he enables him to gain his livelihood. Intuition is blind. Intellect lends her eyes. Its Independence in Respect to Intellective Knowledge Now the first point to be firmly fixed in the mind is that intuitive knowledge has no need of a master, nor to lean upon any one. She does not need to borrow the eyes of others, for she has most excellent eyes of her own. Doubtless it is possible to find concepts mingled with intuitions. But in many other intuitions there is no trace of such a mixture, which proves that it is not necessary. The impression of a moonlight scene by a painter, the outline of a country drawn by a cartographer, a musical motif tender or energetic, the words of a sighing lyric, or those with which we ask, command, and lament in ordinary life, may well all be intuitive facts without a shadow of intellective relation. 
but think what one may of these instances, and admitting further that one may maintain that the greater part of the intuitions of civilized man are impregnated with concepts, there yet remains to be observed something more important and more conclusive. Those concepts which are found mingled and fused with the intuitions are no longer concepts in so far as they are really mingled and fused, for they have lost all independence and autonomy. They have been concepts, but they have now become simple elements of intuition. The philosophical maxims, placed in the mouth of a personage of tragedy or of comedy, perform there the function not of concepts, but of characteristics of such personage. In the same way as the red in a painted figure does not there represent the red color of the physicists, but is a characteristic element of the portrait. The whole it is that determines the quality of the parts. A work of art may be full of philosophical concepts. It may contain them in greater abundance, and they may be there even more profound than in a philosophical dissertation, which in its turn may be rich to overflowing with descriptions and intuitions. But notwithstanding all these concepts it may contain, the result of the work of art is an intuition, and notwithstanding all those intuitions, the result of the philosophical dissertation is a concept. The Promessi Sposi contains copious ethical observations and distinctions, but it does not for that reason lose in its total effect its character of simple story, of intuition. In like manner, the anecdotes and satirical effusions which may be found in the works of a philosopher like Schopenhauer do not remove from those works their character of intellective treatises. The difference between a scientific work and a work of art, that is, between an intellective fact and an intuitive fact, lies in the result, in the diverse effect aimed at by their respective authors. This it is that determines and rules over the several parts of each. Intuition and Perception But to admit the independence of intuition as regards concept does not suffice to give a true and precise idea of intuition. Another error arises among those who recognize this, or who, at any rate, do not make intuition explicitly dependent upon the intellect. This error obscures and confounds the real nature of intuition. By intuition is frequently understood the perception or knowledge of actual reality, the apprehension of something as real. Certainly, perception is intuition. The perception of the room in which I am writing, of the ink bottle and paper that are before me, of the pen I am using, of the objects that I touch and make use of as instruments of my person, which, if it write, therefore exists, these are all intuitions. But the image that is now passing through my brain, of a me writing in another room in another town, with different paper, pen, and ink, is also an intuition. This means that the distinction between reality and non-reality is extraneous secondary to the true nature of intuition. If we assume the existence of a human mind which should have intuitions for the first time, it would seem that it could have intuitions of effective reality only, that is to say, that it could have perceptions of nothing but the real. But if the knowledge of reality be based upon the distinction between real images and unreal images, and if this distinction does not originally exist, these intuitions would in truth not be intuitions either of the real or of the unreal, but pure intuitions. Where all is real, nothing is real. The child, with its difficulty of distinguishing true from false, history from fable, which are all one to childhood, can furnish us with a sort of very vague and only remotely approximate idea of this ingenuous state. 
intuition is the indifferentiated unity of the perception of the real and of the simple image of the possible in our intuitions we do not oppose ourselves to external reality as empirical beings but we simply objectify our impressions whatever they may be intuition and the concepts of space and time those therefore who look upon intuition as sensation formed and arranged simply according to the categories of space and time would seem to approximate more nearly to the truth space and time they say are the forms of intuition to have intuitions is to place in space and in temporal sequence intuitive activity would then consist in this double and concurrent function of spatiality and temporality but for these two categories must be repeated what was said of intellectual distinctions found mingled with intuitions we have intuitions without space and without time a tint of sky and a tint of sentiment an ah of pain and an effort of will objectified in consciousness these are intuitions which we possess and with their making space and time have nothing to do in some intuitions spatiality may be found without temporality in others this without that and even where both are found they are perceived by posterior reflection they can be fused with the intuition in like manner with all its other elements that is they are in it material eater and not formal eater as ingredients and not as essentials who without a similar act of interruptive reflection is conscious of temporal sequence while listening to a story or a piece of music that which intuition reveals in a work of art is not space and time but character individual physiognomy several attempts may be noted in modern philosophy which confirm the view here exposed space and time far from being very simple and primitive functions are shown to be intellectual constructions of great complexity and further even in some of those who do not altogether deny to space and time the quality of forming or of categories and functions one may observe the attempt to unify and to understand them in a different manner from that generally maintained in respect of these categories some reduce intuition to the unique category of spatiality maintaining that time also can only be conceived in terms of space others abandon the three dimensions of space as not philosophically necessary and conceive the function of spatiality as void of every particular spatial determination but what could such a spatial function be that should control even time may it not be a residuum of criticisms and of negations from which arises merely the necessity to posit a generic intuitive activity and is not this last truly determined when one unique function is attributed to it not spatializing nor temporalizing but characterizing or better when this is conceived as itself a category or function which gives knowledge of things in their concretion and individuality intuition and sensation having thus freed intuitive knowledge from any suggestion of intellectualism and from every posterior and external adjunct we must now make clear and determine its limits from another side and from a different kind of invasion and confusion on the other side and before the inferior boundary is sensation formless matter which the spirit can never apprehend in itself in so far as it is mere matter this it can only possess with form and in form but postulates its concept as precisely a limit matter in its abstraction is mechanism 
passivity. It is what the spirit of man experiences, but does not produce. Without it no human knowledge and activity is possible, but mere matter produces animality. Whatever is brutal and impulsive in man, not the spiritual dominion, which is humanity. How often do we strive to understand clearly what is passing within us? We do catch a glimpse of something, but this does not appear to the mind as objectified and formed. In such moments it is that we best perceive the profound difference between matter and form. These are not two acts of ours, face to face with one another, but we assault and carry off the one that is outside us, while that within us tends to absorb and make its own that without. Matter, attacked and conquered by form, gives place to concrete form. It is the matter, the content, that differentiates one of our intuitions from another. Form is constant, it is spiritual activity, while matter is changeable. Without matter, however, our spiritual activity would not leave its abstraction to become concrete and real, this or that spiritual content, this or that definite intuition. It is a curious fact, characteristic of our times, that this very form, this very activity of the spirit, which is essentially ourselves, is so easily ignored or denied. Some confound the spiritual activity of man with the metaphorical and mythological activity of so-called nature, which is mechanism and has no resemblance to human activity, save when we imagine with Aesop that arboris locuntur non tantum fere. Some even affirm that they have never observed in themselves this miraculous activity, as though there were no difference, or only one of quantity, between sweating and thinking, feeling cold and the energy of the will. Others, certainly with greater reason, desire to unify activity and mechanism in a more general concept, though admitting that they are specifically distinct. Let us, however, refrain for the moment from examining if such a unification be possible, and in what sense, but admitting that the attempt may be made, it is clear that to unify two concepts in a third implies a difference between the two first, and here it is this difference that is of importance, and we set it in relief. Intuition and Association Intuition has often been confounded with simple sensation, but since this confusion is too shocking to good sense, it has more frequently been attenuated or concealed with a phraseology which seems to wish to confuse and to distinguish them at the same time. Thus it has been asserted that intuition is sensation, but not so much simple sensation as association of sensations. The equivoque arises precisely from the word association. Association is understood either as memory mnemonic association, conscious recollection, and in that case is evident the absurdity of wishing to join together in memory elements which are not intuified, distinguished, possessed in some way by the spirit, and produced by consciousness, or it is understood as association of unconscious elements. In this case we remain in the world of sensation and of nature. Further, if with certain associationists we speak of an association which is neither memory nor flux of sensations, but is a productive association, formative, constructive, distinguishing, then we admit the thing itself and deny only its name. In truth, productive association is no longer association in the sense of the sensualists, but synthesis, that is to say, spiritual activity. Synthesis may be called association, but with the concept of productivity is already posited the distinction between passivity and activity, between sensation and intuition. Intuition and Representation 
other psychologists are disposed to distinguish from sensation something which is sensation no longer, but is not yet intellective concept, the representation or image. What is the difference between their representation or image and our intuitive knowledge? The greatest and none at all. Representation, too, is a very equivocal word. If by representation be understood something detached and standing out from the psychic base of the sensations, then representation is intuition. If, on the other hand, it be conceived as a complex sensation, a return is made to simple sensation, which does not change its quality according to its richness or poverty, operating alike in a rudimentary or in a developed organism full of traces of past sensations. Nor is the equivoque remedied by defining representation as a psychic product of secondary order in relation to sensation, which should occupy the first place. What does secondary order mean here? Does it mean a qualitative, a formal difference? If so, we agree. Representation is elaboration of sensation, it is intuition. Or does it mean greater complexity and complication, a quantitative material difference? In that case, intuition would be again confused with simple sensation. Intuition and Expression And yet there is a sure method of distinguishing true intuition, true representation, from that which is inferior to it. The spiritual fact from the mechanical, passive, natural fact. Every true intuition or representation is also expression. That which does not objectify itself in expression is not intuition or representation, but sensation and naturality. The spirit does not obtain intuitions otherwise than by making forming, expressing. He who separates intuition from expression never succeeds in reuniting them. Intuitive activity possesses intuitions to the extent that it expresses them. Should this expression seem at first paradoxical, that is chiefly because, as a general rule, a too restricted meaning is given to the word expression. It is generally thought of as restricted to verbal expression, but there exist also nonverbal expressions, such as those of line, color, and sound. To all of these must be extended our affirmation. The intuition and expression together of a painter are pictorial, those of a poet are verbal. But be it pictorial, or verbal, or musical, or whatever else it be called, to no intuition can expression be wanting because it is an inseparable part of intuition. How can we possess a true intuition of a geometrical figure unless we possess so accurate an image of it as to be able to trace it immediately upon paper or on a slate? How can we have an intuition of the contour of a region, for example, of the island of Sicily, if we are not able to draw it as it is in all its meanderings? Every one can experience the internal illumination which follows upon his success in formulating to himself his impressions and sentiments, but only so far as he is able to formulate them. Sentiments or impressions, then, pass by means of words from the obscure region of the soul into the clarity of the contemplative spirit. In this cognitive process it is impossible to distinguish intuition from expression. The one is produced with the other at the same instant, because they are not two, but one. Illusions as to their difference The principal reason which makes our theme appear paradoxical, as we maintain it, is the illusion or prejudice that we possess a more complete intuition of reality than we really do. One often hears people say that they have in their minds many important thoughts, but that they are not able to express them. In truth, if they really had them, they would have coined them into beautiful ringing words and thus expressed them. 
if these thoughts seem to vanish or to become scarce and poor in the act of expressing them, either they did not exist, or they really were scarce and poor. People think that all of us ordinary men imagine and have intuitions of countries, figures, and scenes like painters, of bodies like sculptors, save that painters and sculptors know how to paint and how to sculpture those images, while we possess them only within our souls. They believe that anyone could have imagined a Madonna of Raphael, but that Raphael was Raphael owing to his technical ability in putting the Madonna upon the canvas. Nothing can be more false than this view. The world of which, as a rule, we have intuitions is a small thing, it consists of little expressions which gradually become greater and more ample with the increasing spiritual concentration of certain moments. These are the sort of words which we speak within ourselves, the judgments that we tacitly express. Here is a man, here is a horse. This is heavy, this is hard, this pleases me, etc., it is a medley of light and colour, which could not pictorially attain to any more sincere expression than a haphazard splash of colours, from among which would with difficulty stand out a few special, distinctive traits. This and nothing else is what we possess in our ordinary life. This is the basis of our ordinary action. It is the index of a book. The labels tied to things take the place of the things themselves. This index and labels, which are themselves expressions, suffice for our small needs and small actions. From time to time we pass from the index to the book, from the label to the thing, or from the slight to the greater intuitions, and from these to the greatest and most lofty. This passage is sometimes far from being easy, it has been observed by those who have best studied the psychology of artists that when, after having given a rapid glance at anyone, they attempt to obtain a true intuition of him, in order, for example, to paint his portrait, then this ordinary vision, that seemed so precise, so lively, reveals itself as little better than nothing. What remains is found to be at the most some superficial trait, which would not even suffice for a caricature. The person to be painted stands before the artist like a world to discover. Michelangelo said, One paints not with one's hands, but with one's brain. Leonardo shocked the prior of the convent della Grazia by standing for days together opposite the Last Supper, without touching it with the brush. He remarked of this attitude, that men of the most lofty genius, when they are doing the least work, are then the most active, seeking invention with their minds. The painter is a painter, because he sees what others only feel or catch a glimpse of, but do not see. We think we see a smile, but in reality we have only a vague impression of it. We do not perceive all the characteristic traits from which it results, as the painter perceives them, after his internal meditations, which thus enable him to fix them on the canvas. Even in the case of our intimate friend, who is with us every day and at all hours, we do not possess intuitively more than, at the most, certain traits of his physiognomy, which enable us to distinguish him from others. The illusion is less easy as regards musical expression, because it would seem strange to everyone to say that the composer had added or attached notes to the motive, which is already in the mind of him who is not the composer. As if Beethoven's Ninth Symphony were not his own intuition, and his own intuition the Ninth Symphony. Thus, just as he who is deceived as to his material wealth is confuted by arithmetic, which states its exact amount, so is he confuted who nourishes delusions as to the wealth of his own thoughts and images. He is brought back to reality when he is obliged to cross the bridge of asses of expression. We say to the former, count. To the latter, speak, 
Here is a pencil. Draw. Express yourself. We have each of us, as a matter of fact, a little of the poet, of the sculptor, of the musician, of the painter, of the prose writer. But how little, as compared with those who are so-called, precisely because of the lofty degree in which they possess the most universal dispositions and energies of human nature, how little does a painter possess of the intuitions of a poet? How little does one painter possess those of another painter? Nevertheless, that little is all our actual patrimony of intuitions or representations. Beyond these are only impressions, sensations, feelings, impulses, emotions, or whatever else one may term what is outside the spirit, not assimilated by man, postulated for the convenience of exposition, but effectively inexistent, if existence is also a spiritual fact. Identity of Intuition and Expression We may then add this to the verbal variants descriptive of intuition noted at the beginning. Intuitive knowledge is expressive knowledge, independent and autonomous in respect to intellectual function, indifferent to discriminations posterior and empirical, to reality and to unreality, to formations and perceptions of space and time, even when posterior. Intuition or representation is distinguished as form, from what is felt and suffered, from the flux or wave of sensation, or from the psychic material, and this form, this taking possession of, is expression. To have an intuition is to express, it is nothing else, nothing more but nothing less, than to express. End of chapter 1 Recording by Lisa Reigert Chapter 2 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce. Translated by Douglas Ainsley, 1865-1948 Chapter 2 Intuition and Art Corollaries and Explanations Before proceeding further, it seems opportune to draw certain consequences from what has been established and to add some explanation. Identity of Art and Intuitive Knowledge we have frankly identified intuitive or expressive knowledge with the aesthetic or artistic fact, taking works of art as examples of intuitive knowledge and attributing to them the characteristics of intuition, and vice versa. But our identification is combated by the view held even by many philosophers who consider art to be an intuition of an altogether special sort. Let us admit, they say, that art is intuition. But intuition is not always art. Artistic intuition is of a distinct species differing from intuition in general by something more. No specific difference. But no one has ever been able to indicate of what this something more consists. It has sometimes been thought that art is not a simple intuition, but an intuition of an intuition, in the same way as the concept of science has been defined not as the ordinary concept, but as the concept of a concept. Thus man should attain to art by objectifying not his sensations, as happens with ordinary intuition, but intuition itself. But this process of raising to a second power does not exist, and the comparison of it with the ordinary and scientific concept 
does not imply what is wished for the good reason that it is not true that the scientific concept is the concept of a concept. If this comparison imply anything, it implies just the opposite. The ordinary concept, if it be really a concept and not a simple representation, is a perfect concept, however poor and limited. Science substitutes concepts for representations. It adds and substitutes other concepts, larger and more comprehensive, for those that are poor and limited. It is ever discovering new relations. But its method does not differ from that by which is formed the smallest universal in the brain of the humblest of men. What is generally called art by antonomasia collects intuitions that are wider and more complex than those which we generally experience, but these intuitions are always of sensations and impressions. Art is the expression of impressions, not the expression of expressions. No difference of intensity. For the same reason, it cannot be admitted that intuition, which is generally called artistic, differs from ordinary intuition as to intensity. This would be the case if it were to operate differently on the same matter. But since artistic function is more widely distributed in different fields, but yet does not differ in method from ordinary intuition, the difference between the one and the other is not intensive, but extensive. The intuition of the simplest popular love song, which says the same thing, or very nearly, as a declaration of love such as issues at every moment from the lips of thousands of ordinary men, may be intensively perfect in its poor simplicity, though it be extensively so much more limited than the complex intuition of a love song by Leopardi. The difference is extensive and empirical. The whole difference, then, is quantitative and, as such, indifferent to philosophy, scientia qualitatum. Certain men have a greater aptitude, a more frequent inclination fully to express certain complex states of the soul. These men are known in ordinary language as artists. Some very complicated and difficult expressions are more rarely achieved, and these are called works of art. The limits of the expressions and intuitions that are called art, as opposed to those that are vulgarly called not art, are empirical and impossible to define. If an epigram be art, why not a single word? If a story, why not the occasional note of the journalist? If a landscape, why not a topographical sketch? The teacher of philosophy in Moliere's comedy was right. Whenever we speak, we create prose. But there will always be scholars, like Monsieur Jourdain, astonished at having created prose for forty years without knowing it, and who will have difficulty in persuading themselves that when they call their servant John to bring their slippers, they have spoken nothing less than prose. We must hold firmly to our identification, because among the principal reasons which have prevented aesthetic, the science of art, from revealing the true nature of art, its real roots in human nature, has been its separation from the general spiritual life, the having made of it a sort of special function, or aristocratic circle. No one is astonished when he learns from physiology that every cellule is an organism and every organism a cellule or synthesis of cellules. No one is astonished at finding in a lofty mountain the same chemical elements that compose a small stone or fragment. There is not one physiology of small animals and one of large animals, nor is there a special chemical theory of stones as distinct from mountains. In the same way, there is not a science of lesser intuition distinct from a science of greater intuition, nor one of ordinary intuition distinct from artistic intuition. There is but one aesthetic, 
the science of intuitive or expressive knowledge, which is the aesthetic or artistic fact. And this aesthetic is the true analogy of logic. Logic includes, as facts of the same nature, the formation of the smallest and most ordinary concept and the most complicated scientific and philosophical system. Artistic Genius Nor can we admit that the word genius or artistic genius, as distinct from the non-genius of the ordinary man, possesses more than a quantitative signification. Great artists are said to reveal us to ourselves. But how could this be possible unless there be identity of nature between their imagination and ours, and unless the difference be only one of quantity? It were well to change poeta nascitur into homo nascitur poeta. Some men are born great poets, some small. The cult and superstition of the genius has arisen from this quantitative difference, having been taken as a difference of quality. It has been forgotten that genius is not something that has fallen from heaven, but humanity itself. The man of genius, who poses or is represented as distant from humanity, finds his punishment in becoming or appearing somewhat ridiculous. Examples of this are the genius of the Romantic period, and the superman of our time. But it is well to note here that those who claim unconsciousness as the chief quality of an artistic genius hurl him from an eminence far above humanity to a position far below it. Intuitive or artistic genius, like every form of human activity, is always conscious, otherwise it would be blind mechanism. The only thing that may be wanting to the artistic genius is the reflective consciousness, the superadded consciousness of the historian or critic which is not essential to artistic genius. Content and Form in Aesthetic The relation between matter and form, or between content and form, as it is generally called, is one of the most disputed questions in aesthetic. Does the aesthetic fact consist of content alone, or of form alone, or of both together? This question has taken on various meanings, which we shall mention, each in its place. But when these words are taken as signifying what we have above defined, and matter is understood as emotivity not aesthetically elaborated, that is to say, impressions, and form elaboration, intellectual activity, and expression, then our meaning cannot be doubtful. We must therefore reject the thesis that makes the aesthetic fact to consist of the content alone, that is, of the simple impressions, in like manner with that other thesis which makes it to consist of a junction between form and content, that is, of impressions plus expressions. In the aesthetic fact, the aesthetic activity is not added to the fact of the impressions, but these latter are formed and elaborated by it. The impressions reappear, as it were, in expression, like water put into a filter, which reappears the same and yet different on the other side. The aesthetic fact, therefore, is form and nothing but form. From this it results not that the content is something superfluous, it is, on the contrary, the necessary point of departure for the expressive fact, but that there is no passage between the quality of the content and that of the form. It has sometimes been thought that the content, in order to be aesthetic, that is to say, transformable into form, should possess some determinate or determinable quality. But were that so, then form and content, expression and impression, would be the same thing. It is true that the content is that which is convertible into form, but it has no determinable qualities until this transformation takes place. We know nothing of its nature. 
it does not become aesthetic content at once but only when it has been effectively transformed aesthetic content has also been defined as what is interesting that is not an untrue statement it is merely void of meaning what then is interesting expressive activity certainly the expressive activity would not have raised the content to the dignity of form had it not been interested the fact of its having been interested is precisely the fact of its raising the content to the dignity of form but the word interesting has also been employed in another not illegitimate sense which we shall explain further on critique of the imitation of nature and of the artistic illusion the proposition that art is imitation of nature has also several meanings now truth has been maintained or at least shadowed with these words now error more frequently nothing definite has been thought one of the legitimate scientific meanings occurs when imitation is understood as representation or intuition of nature a form of knowledge and when this meaning has been understood by placing in greater relief the spiritual character of the process the other proposition becomes also legitimate namely that art is the idealization or idealizing imitation of nature but if by imitation of nature we understood that art gives mechanical reproductions more or less perfect duplicates of natural objects before which the same tumult of impressions caused by natural objects begins over again then the proposition is evidently false the painted wax figures that seem to be alive and before which we stand astonished in the museums where such things are shown do not give aesthetic intuitions illusion and hallucination have nothing to do with the calm domain of artistic intuition if an artist paint the interior of a waxwork museum or if an actor give a burlesque portrait of a man statue on the stage we again have spiritual labor and artistic intuition finally if photography have anything in it of artistic it will be to the extent that it transmits the intuition of the photographer his point of view the pose and the grouping which he has striven to attain and if it be not altogether art that is precisely because the element of nature in it remains more or less insubordinate and ineradicable do we ever indeed feel complete satisfaction before even the best of photographs would not an artist vary and touch up much or little remove or add something to any of them critique of art conceived as a sentimental not a theoretical fact aesthetic appearance and feeling the statements repeated so often with others similar that art is not knowledge that it does not tell the truth that it does not belong to the world of theory but to the world of feeling arise from the failure to realize exactly the theoretic character of the simple intuition this simple intuition is quite distinct from intellectual knowledge as it is distinct from the perception of the real the belief that only the intellective is knowledge or at the most also the perception of the real also arises from the failure to grasp the theoretic character of the simple intuition we have seen that intuition is knowledge free of concepts and more simple than the so-called perception of the real since art is knowledge and form it does not belong to the world of feeling and of psychic material the reason why so many aestheticians have so often insisted that art is appearance shine is precisely because they have felt the necessity of distinguishing it from the more complex fact of perception by maintaining its pure intuitivity for the same reason it has been claimed that art is sentimental in fact if the concept as content of art and historical reality as such be excluded there remains no other content than reality apprehended in all its ingenuousness 
and immediateness in the vital effort in sentiment that is to say pure intuition critique of theory of aesthetic senses the theory of the aesthetic senses has also arisen from the failure to establish or from having lost to view the character of the expression as distinct from the impression of the form as distinct from the matter as has just been pointed out this reduces itself to the error of wishing to seek a passage from the quality of the content to that of the form to ask in fact what the aesthetic senses may be implies asking what sensible impressions may be able to enter into aesthetic expressions and what must of necessity do so to this we must at once reply that all impressions can enter into aesthetic expressions or formations but that none are bound to do so dante raised to the dignity of form not only the sweet color of the oriental sapphire visual impression but also tactile or thermic impressions such as the thick air and the fresh rivulets which parch all the more the throat of the thirsty the belief that a picture yields only visual impressions is a curious illusion the bloom of a cheek the warmth of a youthful body the sweetness and freshness of a fruit the cutting of a sharpened blade are not these also impressions that we have from a picture maybe they are visual what would a picture be for a hypothetical man deprived of all or many of his senses who should in an instant acquire the sole organ of sight the picture we are standing opposite and believe we see only with our eyes would appear to his eyes as little more than the paint-smeared palette of a painter some who hold firmly to the aesthetic character of given groups of impressions for example the visual the auditive and exclude others admit however that if visual and auditive impressions enter directly into the aesthetic fact those of the other senses also enter into it but only as associated but this distinction is altogether arbitrary aesthetic expression is a synthesis in which it is impossible to distinguish direct and indirect all impressions are by it placed on a level in so far as they are aestheticized he who takes into himself the image of a picture or of a poem does not experience as it were a series of impressions as to this image some of which have a prerogative or precedence over others and nothing is known of what happens prior to having received it for the distinctions made after reflection have nothing to do with art the theory of the aesthetic senses has also been presented in another way that is to say as the attempt to establish what physiological organs are necessary for the aesthetic fact the physiological organ or apparatus is nothing but a complex of cellules thus and thus constituted thus and thus disposed that is to say it is merely physical and natural fact or concept but expression does not recognize physiological facts expression has its point of departure in the impressions and the physiological path by which these have found their way to the mind is to it altogether indifferent one way or another amounts to the same thing it suffices that they are impressions it is true that the want of given organs that is of given complexes of cells produces an absence of given impressions when these are not obtained by another path by a kind of organic compensation the man born blind cannot express or have the intuition of light but the impressions are not conditioned solely by the organ but also by the stimuli which operate upon the organ thus he who has never had the impression of the sea will never be able to express it in the same way as he who has never had the impression of the great world or of the political conflict will never express the one or the other this however does not establish a dependence of the expressive function on the stimulus or on the organ it is the repetition of what we know already 
expression presupposes impression. Therefore, given expressions imply given impressions. Besides, every impression excludes other impressions during the moment in which it dominates, and so does every expression. Unity and Indivisibility of the Work of Art Another corollary of the conception of expression as activity is the indivisibility of the work of art. Every expression is a unique expression. Activity is a fusion of the impressions in an organic whole. A desire to express this has always prompted the affirmation that the world of art should have unity, or what amounts to the same thing, unity in variety. Expression is a synthesis of the various, the multiple, in the one. The fact that we divide a work of art into parts, as a poem into scenes, episodes, similes, sentences, or a picture into single figures and objects, background, foreground, etc., may seem to be an objection to this affirmation. But such division annihilates the work, as dividing the organism into heart, brain, nerves, muscles, and so on, turns the living being into a corpse. It is true that there exist organisms in which the division gives place to more living things, but in such a case, and if we transfer the analogy to the aesthetic fact, we must conclude for a multiplicity of germs of life, that is to say, for a speedy re-elaboration of the single parts into new single expressions. It will be observed that expression is sometimes based on other expressions. There are simple and there are compound expressions. One must admit some difference between the Eureka, with which Archimedes expressed all his joy after his discovery, and the expressive act, indeed all the five acts, of a regular tragedy. Not in the least, expression is always directly based on impressions. He who conceives a tragedy puts into a crucible a great quantity, so to say, of impressions. The expressions themselves, conceived on other occasions, are fused together with the new in a single mass, in the same way as we can cast into a smelting furnace formless pieces of bronze and most precious statuettes. Those most precious statuettes must be melted in the same way as the formless bits of bronze, before they can be a new statue. The old expressions must descend again to the level of impressions in order to be synthesized in a new single expression. Art as the Deliverer By elaborating his impressions, man frees himself from them. By objectifying them, he removes them from him and makes himself their superior. The liberating and purifying function of art is another aspect and another formula of its character of activity. Activity is the deliverer, just because it drives away passivity. This also explains why it is customary to attribute to artists alike the maximum of sensibility or passion and the maximum insensibility or Olympic serenity. Both qualifications agree, for they do not refer to the same object. The sensibility or passion relates to the rich material which the artist absorbs into his psychic organism. The insensibility or serenity to the form with which he subjugates and dominates the tumult of the feelings and of the passions. End of chapter 2 Recording by Lisa Reichert Chapter 3 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce Translated by Douglas Ainsley 
1865 to 1948. Chapter 3 Art and Philosophy Indissolubility of Intellective from Intuitive Knowledge The two forms of knowledge, aesthetic and intellectual or conceptual, are indeed diverse, but this does not amount altogether to separation and disjunction, as we find with two forces going each its own way. If we have shown that the aesthetic form is altogether independent of the intellectual and suffices to itself without external support, we have not said that the intellectual can stand without the aesthetic. This reciprocity would not be true. What is knowledge by concepts? It is knowledge of relations of things, and those things are intuitions. Concepts are not possible without intuitions, just as intuition is itself impossible without the material of impressions. Intuitions are this river, this lake, this brook, this rain, this glass of water. The concept is water, not this or that appearance and particular example of water, but water in general, in whatever time or place it be realized the material of infinite intuitions, but of one single and constant concept. However, the concept, the universal, if it be no longer intuition in one respect, is in another respect intuition, and cannot fail of being intuition. For the man who thinks has impressions and emotions, in so far as he thinks. His impression and emotion will not be love or hate, but the effort of his thought itself with the pain and the joy, the love and the hate joined to it. This effort cannot but become intuitive in form, in becoming objective to the mind. To speak is not to think logically, but to think logically is at the same time to speak. Critique of the Negations of this Thesis That thought cannot exist without speech is a truth generally admitted. The negations of this thesis are all founded on equivoques and errors. The first of the equivoques is implied by those who observe that one can likewise think with geometrical figures, algebraical numbers, ideographic signs, without a single word, even pronounced silently and almost insensibly within one. They also affirm that there are languages in which the word, the phonetic sign, expresses nothing unless the written sign also be looked at. But when we said speech, we intended to employ a synecdoche, and that expression generically should be understood, for expression is not only so-called verbal expression, as we have already noted. It may be admitted that certain concepts may be thought without phonetic manifestations, but the very examples adduced to show this also prove that those concepts never exist without expressions. Others maintain that animals, or certain animals, think or reason without speaking. Now as to how, whether, and what animals think, whether they be rudimentary, half-savage men resisting civilization, rather than physiological machines, as the old spiritualists would have it, are questions that do not concern us here. When the philosopher talks of animal, brutal, impulsive, instinctive nature and the like, he does not base himself on conjectures as to these facts concerning dogs or cats, lions or ants, but upon observations of what is called animal and brutal in man of the boundary or animal basis of what we feel in ourselves. If individual animals, dogs or cats, lions or ants, possess something of the activity of man, so much the better, or so much the worse for them. This means that as regards them also we must talk, not of their nature as a whole, but of its animal basis, as being perhaps larger and more strong than the animal basis of man. And if we suppose that animals think and form concepts, what is there in the line of conjecture to justify the admission that they do so without corresponding expressions? The analogy with man, 
the knowledge of the spirit, human psychology, which is the instrument of all our conjectures as to animal psychology, would oblige us to suppose that if they think in any way, they also have some sort of speech. It is from human psychology, that is, literary psychology, that comes the other objection, to the effect that the concept can exist without the word, because it is true that we all know books that are well thought and badly written, that is to say, a thought which remains thought beyond the expression, notwithstanding the imperfect expression. But when we talk of books well thought and badly written, we cannot mean other than that in those books are parts, pages, periods, or propositions well thought out and well written, and other parts, perhaps the least important, ill thought out and badly written, not truly thought out, and therefore not truly expressed. Where Vico's Cienza Nuova is really ill written, it is also ill thought out. If we pass from the consideration of big books to a short proposition, the error or the imprecision of this statement will be recognized at once. How could a proposition be clearly thought and confusedly written out? All that can be admitted is that sometimes we possess thoughts, concepts, in an intuitive form, or in an abbreviated or, better, peculiar expression, sufficient for us, but not sufficient to communicate it with ease to another or other definite individuals. Hence people say inaccurately that we have the thought without the expression, whereas it should properly be said that we have, indeed, the expression, but in a form that is not easy of social communication. This, however, is a very variable and altogether relative fact. There are always people who catch our thought on the wing, and prefer it in its abbreviated form, and would be displeased with the greater development of it, necessary for other people. In other words, the thought considered abstractly and logically will be the same, but aesthetically we are dealing with two different intuition expressions, into both of which enter different psychological elements. The same argument suffices to destroy, that is, to interpret correctly, the altogether empirical distinction between an internal and an external language. Art and Science The most lofty manifestations, the summits of intellectual and of intuitive knowledge shining from afar, are called, as we know, art and science. Art and science, then, are different and yet linked together. They meet on one side, which is the aesthetic side. Every scientific work is also a work of art. The aesthetic side may remain little noticed when our mind is altogether taken up with the effort to understand the thought of the man of science and to examine its truth. But it is no longer concealed when we pass from the activity of understanding to that of contemplation and behold that thought either developed before us limpid, exact, well-shaped, without superfluous words, without lack of words, with appropriate rhythm and intonation, or confused, broken, embarrassed, tentative. Great thinkers are sometimes termed great writers, while other equally great thinkers remain more or less fragmentary writers, if indeed their fragments are scientifically to be compared with harmonious, coherent, and perfect works. Content and Form Another Meaning Prose and Poetry We pardon thinkers and men of science their literary mediocrity. The fragments console us for the failure of the whole, for it is far more easy to recover the well-arranged composition from the fragmentary work of genius than to achieve the discovery of genius. But how can we pardon mediocre expression in pure artists? Mediocribus esse poetis non di, non hominis, non concessere columnae. The poet or painter who lacks form lacks everything because he lacks himself. Poetical material permeates the soul of all. The expression alone, that is to say the form, makes the poet. 
And here appears the truth of the thesis which denies to art all content, as content being understood just the intellectual concept. In this sense, when we take content as equal to concept, it is most true, not only that art does not consist of content, but also that it has no content. In the same way, the distinction between poetry and prose cannot be justified, save in that of art and science. It was seen in antiquity that such distinction could not be founded on external elements, such as rhythm and meter, or on the freedom or the limitation of the form, that it was, on the contrary, altogether internal. Poetry is the language of sentiment, prose of the intellect. But since the intellect is also sentiment, in its concretion and reality, so all prose has a poetical side. The Relation of First and Second Degree The relation between intuitive knowledge or expression and intellectual knowledge or concept, between art and science, poetry and prose, cannot be otherwise defined than by saying that it is one of double degree. The first degree is the expression, the second the concept. The first can exist without the second, but the second cannot exist without the first. There exists poetry without prose, but not prose without poetry. Expression, indeed, is the first affirmation of human activity. Poetry is the maternal language of the human race. The first men were by nature sublime poets. We also admit this in another way, when we observe that the passage from soul to mind, from animal to human activity, is effected by means of language. And this should be said of intuition or expression in general. But to us it appears somewhat inaccurate to define language or expression as an intermediate link between nature and humanity, as though it were a mixture of the one and of the other. Where humanity appears, the rest has already disappeared. The man who expresses himself certainly emerges from the state of nature, but he really does emerge. He does not stand half within and half without, as the use of the phrase intermediate link would imply. In Existence of Other Forms of Knowledge The cognitive intellect has no form other than these two, expression and concept, exhaust it completely. The whole speculative life of man is spent in passing from one to the other, and back again. History, its identity with and difference from art. Historicity is incorrectly held to be a third theoretical form. History is not form but content. As form it is nothing but intuition or aesthetic fact. History does not seek for laws nor form concepts. It employs neither induction nor deduction. It is directed ad nerandum, non ad demonstrandum. It does not construct universals and abstractions, but posits intuitions. The this, the that, the individuum omni modo determinatum is its kingdom, as it is the kingdom of art. History, therefore, is included under the universal concept of art. Faced with this proposition and with the impossibility of conceiving a third mode of knowledge, objections have been brought forward which would lead to the affiliation of history to intellective or scientific knowledge. The greater portion of these objections is dominated by the prejudice that in refusing to history the character of conceptual science, something of its value and dignity has been taken from it. This really arises from a false idea of art, conceived not as an essential theoretic function, but as an amusement, a superfluity, a frivolity. Without reopening a long debate, which so far as we are concerned is finally closed, we will mention here one sophism which has been and still is widely repeated. It is intended to show the logical and scientific nature of history. The sophism consists in admitting that historical knowledge has for its object the individual. 
but not the representation, it is added, so much as the concept of the individual. From this it is argued that history is also a logical or scientific form of knowledge. History, in fact, should elaborate the concept of a personage, such as Charlemagne or Napoleon, of an epoch like the Renaissance or the Reformation, of an event such as the French Revolution and the unification of Italy. This it is held to do in the same way as geometry elaborates the concepts of spatial form, or aesthetic those of expression. But all this is untrue. History cannot do otherwise than represent Napoleon and Charlemagne, the Renaissance and the Reformation, the French Revolution and the unification of Italy, as individual facts, with their individual physiognomy. That is, in the same way, as logicians state, that one cannot have a concept of an individual, but only a representation. The so-called concept of the individual is always a universal or general concept, full of details, very rich, if you will, but however rich it be, yet incapable of attaining to that individuality to which historical knowledge, as aesthetic knowledge, alone attains. Let us rather show how the content of history comes to be distinguished from that of art. The distinction is secondary. Its origin will be found in what has already been observed as to the ideal character of the intuition or first perception in which all is real and therefore nothing is real. The mind forms the concepts of external and internal at a later stage as it does those of what has happened and what is desired, of object and subject and the like. Thus it distinguishes historical from non-historical intuition, the real from the unreal, real fancy from pure fancy. Even internal facts, what is desired and imagined, castles in the air and countries of cocaine, have their reality. The soul, too, has its history. His illusions form part of the biography of every individual. But the history of an individual soul is history, because in it is always active the distinction between the real and the unreal, even when the real is the illusion themselves. But these distinctive concepts do not appear in history, as do scientific concepts, but rather like those that we have seen dissolved and melted in the aesthetic intuitions, although they stand out in history in an altogether new relief. History does not construct the concepts of the real and the unreal, but makes use of them. History, in fact, is not the theory of history. Mere conceptual analysis is of no use in realizing whether an event in our lives were real or imaginary. It is necessary to reproduce the intuitions in the mind in the most complete form, as they were at the moment of production, in order to recognize the content. Historicity is distinguished in the concrete from pure imagination only as one intuition is distinguished from another, in the memory. Historical Criticism, Historical Skepticism Where this is not possible, owing to the delicate and fleeting shades between the real and unreal intuitions, which confuse the one with the other, we must either renounce, for the time at least, the knowledge of what really happened, and this we often do, or we must fall back upon conjecture, verisimilitude, probability. The principle of verisimilitude and of probability dominates, in fact, all historical criticism. Examination of the sources and of authority is directed toward establishing the most credible evidence. And what is the most credible evidence, save that of the best observers, that is, of those who best remember, and, be it understood, have not desired to falsify, nor had interest in falsifying the truth of things? From this it follows that intellectual skepticism finds it easy to deny the certainty of any history, for the certainty of history is never that of science. Historical certainty is composed of memory and of authority, 
not of analyses and of demonstration. To speak of historical induction or demonstration is to make a metaphorical use of these expressions, which bear quite a different meaning in history to that which they bear in science. The conviction of the historian is the undemonstrable conviction of the juryman, who has heard the witnesses, listened attentively to the case, and prayed heaven to inspire him. Sometimes, without doubt, he is mistaken, but the mistakes are in a negligible minority compared with the occasions when he gets hold of the truth. That is why good sense is right against the intellectualists in believing in history, which is not a fable agreed upon, but that which the individual and humanity remember of their past. We strive to enlarge and to render as precise as possible this record, which in some places is dim, in others very clear. We cannot do without it, such as it is, and taken as a whole, it is rich in truth. In a spirit of paradox only can one doubt if there ever were a Greece or a Rome, an Alexander or a Caesar, a feudal Europe overthrown by a series of revolutions, that on the 1st of November, 1517, the thesis of Luther were seen fixed to the door of the Church of Wittenberg, or that the Bastille was taken by the people of Paris on the 14th of July in 1789. "'What proof givest thou of all this?' asked the sophists, ironically. Humanity replies, "'I remember.' Philosophy as Perfect Science, the So-Called Natural Sciences and Their Limits The world of what has happened, of the concrete, of history, is the world that is called real, natural, including in this definition the reality that is called physical, as well as that which is called spiritual and human. All this world is intuition historical intuition, if it be realistically shown as it is, or imaginary intuition, artistic in the strict sense, if shown under the aspect of the possible, that is to say, of the imaginable. Science, true science, which is not intuition but concept, not individuality but universality, cannot be anything but a science of the spirit, that is, of what is universal in reality, philosophy. If natural sciences be spoken of, apart from philosophy, it is necessary to observe that these are not perfect sciences. They are complexes of knowledge, arbitrarily abstracted and fixed. The so-called natural sciences themselves recognize, in fact, that they are surrounded by limitations. These limitations are nothing more than historical and intuitive data. They calculate, measure, establish equalities, regularity, create classes and types, formulate laws, show in their own way how one fact arises out of other facts, but in their progress they are always met with facts which are known intuitively and historically. Even geometry now states that it rests altogether on hypotheses, since space is not three-dimensional or Euclidean, but this assumption is made use of by preference, because it is more convenient. What there is of truth in the natural sciences is either philosophy or historical fact. What they contain proper to themselves is abstract and arbitrary. When the natural sciences wish to form themselves into perfect sciences, they must issue from their circle and enter the philosophical circle. This they do when they posit concepts which are anything but natural, such as those of the atom without extension in space, of ether or vibrating matter, of vital force, of space beyond the reach of intuition, and the like. These are true and proper philosophical efforts, when they are not mere words void of meaning. The concepts of natural science are, without doubt, most useful, but one cannot obtain from them that system which belongs only to the spirit. These historical and intuitive assumptions, which cannot be separated from the natural sciences, furthermore explain not only how, in the progress of knowledge, that which was once considered to be truth, descends gradually to the grade of mythological beliefs and imaginary illusions, but also how, 
among natural scientists, there are some who term all that serves as basis of argument in their teaching mythical facts, verbal expedients, or conventions. The naturalists and mathematicians who approach the study of the energies of the spirit without preparation are apt to carry thither these mental habits and to speak in philosophy of such and such conventions as arranged by man. They make conventions of truth and morality, and their supreme convention is the spirit itself. However, if there are to be conventions, something must exist about which there is no convention to be made, but which is itself the agent of the convention. This is the spiritual activity of man. The limitation of the natural sciences postulates the limitation of philosophy. THE PHENOMENON AND THE NEUMENON These explications have firmly established that the pure or fundamental forms of knowledge are two, the intuition and the concept, art and science or philosophy. With these are to be included history, which is, as it were, the product of intuition placed in contact with the concept, that is, of art receiving in itself philosophic distinctions while remaining concrete and individual. All the other forms, natural sciences and mathematics, are impure, being mingled with extraneous elements of practical origin. The intuition gives the world the phenomenon. The concept gives the noumenon, the spirit. End of chapter 3 Recording by Lisa Reichert Chapter 4 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Lisa Reichert Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce, translated by Douglas Ainsley, 1865-1948 Chapter 4 Historicism and Intellectualism in Aesthetic These relations between intuitive or aesthetic knowledge and the other fundamental or derivative forms of knowledge having been definitely established, we are now in a position to reveal the errors of a series of theories which have been or are presented as theories of aesthetic. Critique of Verisimilitude and of Naturalism From the confusion between the exigencies of art in general and the particular exigencies of history has arisen the theory, which has lost ground today but used to dominate in the past, of verisimilitude as the object of art. As is generally the case with erroneous propositions, the intention of those who employed and employ the concept of verisimilitude has no doubt often been much more reasonable than the definition given of the word. By verisimilitude used to be meant the artistic coherence of the representation, that is to say, its completeness and effectiveness, if verisimilar be translated by coherent, a most exact meaning will often be found in the discussions, examples, and judgments of the critics. An improbable personage, an improbable ending to a comedy, are really badly drawn personages, badly arranged endings, happenings without artistic motive. It has been said with reason that even fairies and sprites must have verisimilitude that is to say, be really sprites and fairies, coherent artistic intuitions. Sometimes the word possible has been used instead of verisimilar. As we have already remarked in passing, this word possible is synonymous with that which is imaginable, or may be known intuitively. Everything which is really, that is to say, coherently imagined is possible. But formerly, and especially by the theoreticians, by verisimilar was understood historical credibility, 
or that historical truth which is not demonstrable, but conjecturable, not true, but verisimilar. It has been sought to impose a like character upon art. Who does not recall the great part played in literary history by the criticism of the verisimilar? For example, the fault found with the Jerusalem delivered, based upon the history of the Crusades, or of the Homeric poems, upon that of the verisimilitude of the costume of the emperors and kings. At other times has been imposed upon art the duty of the aesthetic reproduction of historical reality. This is another of the erroneous significations assumed by the theory concerning the imitation of nature. Verism and naturalism have since afforded the spectacle of a confusion of the aesthetic fact with the processes of the natural sciences, by aiming at some sort of experimental drama or romance. Critique of Ideas in Art, of Theses in Art, and of the Typical the confusions between the methods of art and those of the philosophical sciences have been far more frequent. Thus it has often been held to be within the competence of art to develop concepts, to unite the intelligible with the sensible, to represent ideas or universals, putting art in the place of science, that is, confusing the artistic function in general with the particular case in which it becomes aesthetico-logical. The theory of art as supporting theses can be reduced to the same error, as can be the theory of art considered as individual representation, exemplifying scientific laws. The example, in so far as it is an example, stands for the thing exemplified, and is thus an exposition of the universal, that is to say, a form of science, more or less popular or vulgarized. The same may be said of the aesthetic theory of the typical, when by type is understood, as it frequently is, just the abstraction or the concept, and it is affirmed that art should make the species shine in the individual. If by typical we here understood the individual, here too we have a merely verbal variation. To typify would signify, in this case to characterize, that is, to determine and to represent the individual. Don Quixote is a type, but of whom is he a type, if not of all Don Quixotes? A type, that is to say, of himself. Certainly he is not a type of abstract concepts, such as the loss of the sense of reality, or of the love of glory. An infinite number of personages can be thought of under these concepts, who are not Don Quixote. In other words, we find our own impressions fully determined and verified in the expression of a poet, for example, in a poetical personage. We call that expression typical, which we might call simply aesthetic. Poetical or artistic universals have been spoken of in like manner in order to show that the artistic product is altogether spiritual and ideal in itself. Critique of the Symbol and of the Allegory Continuing to correct these errors, or to make clear equivoques, we will note that the symbol has sometimes been given as essence of art. Now if the symbol be given as inseparable from the artistic intuition, it is the synonym of the intuition itself, which always has an ideal character. There is no double bottom to art, but one only. In art all is symbolical, because all is ideal. But if the symbol be looked upon as separable, if on the one side can be expressed the symbol and on the other the thing symbolized, we fall back again into the intellectualist error. That pretended symbol is the exposition of an abstract concept. It is an allegory. It is science, or art that apes science. But we must be just toward the allegorical also. In some cases it is altogether harmless. Given the Jerusalem Liberata, the allegory was imagined afterwards. Given the Adona of Marino, the poet of the lascivious insinuated afterwards that it was written to show how, 
a moderate indulgence ends in pain. Given a statue of a beautiful woman, the sculptor can write on a card that the statue represents clemency or goodness. This allegory linked to a finished work, post festum, does not change the work of art. What is it, then? It is an expression externally added to another expression. A little page of prose is added to the Jerusalem, expressing another thought of the poet. A verse or a strophe is added to the Adona, expressing what the poet would like to make a part of his public swallow, while to the statue nothing more than the single word is added, clemency or goodness. Critique of the Theory of Artistic and Literary Classes But the greatest triumph of the intellectualist error lies in the theory of artistic and literary classes, which still has vogue in literary treatises, and disturbs the critics and the historians of art. Let us observe its genesis. The human mind can pass from the aesthetic to the logical, just because the former is a first step in respect to the latter. It can destroy the expressions, that is, the thought of the individual, with the thought of the universal. It can reduce expressive facts to logical relations. We have already shown that this operation, in its turn, becomes concrete in an expression, but this does not mean that the first expressions have not been destroyed. They have yielded their place to the new aesthetico-logical expressions. When we are on the second step, we have left the first. He who enters a picture gallery, or who reads a series of poems, may, after he has looked and read, go further. He may seek out the relations of the things there expressed. Thus those pictures and compositions, each of which is an individual inexpressible by logic, are resolved into universals and abstractions, such as costumes, landscapes, portraits, domestic life, battles, animals, flowers, fruit, seascapes, lakes, deserts, tragic, comic, piteous, cruel, lyrical, epic, dramatic, knightly, idyllic facts, and the like. They are often also resolved into merely quantitative categories, such as little picture, picture, statuette, group, madrigal, song, sonnet, garland of sonnets, poetry, poem, story, romance, and the like. When we think the concept domestic life, or knighthood, or idyll, or cruelty, or any other quantitative concept, the individual expressive fact from which we started is abandoned. From aesthetes that we were, we have been changed into logicians, from contemplators of expression into reasoners. Certainly no objection can be made to such a process. In what other way could science be born, which, if aesthetic expression be assumed in it, yet has for function to go beyond them? The logical or scientific form as such excludes the aesthetic form. He who begins to think scientifically has already ceased to contemplate aesthetically, although his thought will assume of necessity in its turn an aesthetic form, as has already been said, and as it would be superfluous to repeat. The error begins when we try to deduce the expression from the concept and to find in the thing substituting the laws of the thing substituted. When the difference between the second and the first step has not been observed, and when in consequence we declare that we are standing on the first step when we are really standing on the second. This error is known as the theory of artistic and literary classes. What is the aesthetic form of domestic life, of knighthood, of the ideal, of cruelty, and so forth? How should these contents be represented? Such is the absurd problem implied in the theory of artistic and literary classes. It is in this that consists all search after laws or rules of styles. Domestic life, knighthood, ideal, cruelty, and the like, are not impressions but concepts, they are not contents but logico-aesthetic forms.
you cannot express the form, for it is already itself an expression. And what are the words cruelty, idol, knighthood, domestic life, and so on, but the expression of those concepts? Even the most refined of these distinctions, those that have the most philosophic appearance, do not resist criticism, as, for instance, when works of art are divided into the subjective and the objective styles, into lyric and epic, into works of feeling and works of design. It is impossible to separate, in aesthetic analysis, the subjective from the objective side, the lyric from the epic, the image of feeling from that of things. Errors derived from this theory appearing in judgments on art. From the theory of the artistic and literary classes derive those erroneous modes of judgment and of criticism, thanks to which, instead of asking before a work of art if it be expressive, and what it expresses, whether it speak or stammer, or be silent altogether, it is asked if it be obedient to the laws of the epic poem, or to those of tragedy, to those of historical portraiture, or to those of landscape painting. Artists, however, while making a verbal pretense of agreeing, or yielding a feigned obedience to them, have really always disregarded these laws of styles. Every true work of art has violated some established class and upset the ideas of the critics, who have thus been obliged to enlarge the number of classes, until finally even this enlargement has proved too narrow, owing to the appearance of new works of art, which are naturally followed by new scandals, new upsettings, and new enlargements. From the same theory come the prejudices, owing to which at one time, and is it really past, people used to lament that Italy had no tragedy, until a poet arose who gave to Italy that wreath which was the only thing wanting to her glorious hair, nor France the epic poem, until the Henriade, which slaked the thirsty throats of the critics. Eulogies accorded to the inventors of new styles are connected with these prejudices, so much so that in the seventeenth century the invention of the mock heroic poem seemed an important event, and the honor of it was disputed as though it were the discovery of America. But the works adorned with this name, the Secchia Rapita and the Scherno Tele Dei, were stillborn because their authors, a slight drawback, had nothing new or original to say. Mediocrities racked their brains to invent, artificially, new styles. The piscatorial eclogue was added to the pastoral, and then finally the military eclogue. The aminta was bathed and became the alcio. Finally, there have been historians of art and literature so much fascinated with these ideas of classes that they claimed to write the history not of single and effective literary and artistic works but of their classes those empty phantoms they have claimed to portray not the evolution of the artistic spirit but the evolution of classes the philosophical condemnation of artistic and literary classes is found in the formulation and demonstration of what artistic activity has ever sought, and good taste ever recognized. What is to be done if good taste, and the real fact put into formulas, sometimes assume the air of paradoxes? Empirical Sense of the Divisions of Classes Now if we talk of tragedies, comedies, dramas, romances, pictures of everyday life, Battle pieces, landscapes, seascapes, poems, versicles, lyrics, and the like, if it be only with a view to be understood, and to draw attention in general and approximatively to certain groups of works, to which, for one reason or another, it is desired to draw attention, in that case no scientific error has been committed. We employ vocables and phrases we do not establish laws and definitions. The mistake arises when the weight of a scientific definition is given to a word, when we ingenuously let ourselves be caught in the meshes of that phraseology. 
pray permit me a comparison. It is necessary to arrange the books in a library in one way or another. This used generally to be done by means of a rough classification by subjects, among which the categories of miscellaneous and eccentric were not wanting. They are now generally arranged by sizes or by publishers. Who can deny the necessity and the utility of these groupings? But what should we say if someone began seriously to seek out the literary laws of miscellanies and of eccentricities from the Aldine or Bodonian collection, from size A or size B, that is to say, from these altogether arbitrary groupings whose sole object has been their practical use? Well, whoever should undertake an enterprise such as this would be doing neither more nor less than those who seek out the aesthetic laws of literary and artistic classes. End of chapter 4 Recording by Lisa Reichert Chapter 5 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce. Translated by Douglas Ainsley, 1865 to 1948. Chapter 5 Analogous Errors in Historic and Logic. The better to confirm these criticisms, it will be opportune to cast a rapid glance over analogous and opposite errors, born of ignorance as to the true nature of art, and of its relation to history and to science. These errors have injured alike the theory of history and of science, of historic, or historiology, and of logic. Critique of the Philosophy of History Historical intellectualism has been the cause of the many researches which have been made, especially during the last two centuries, researches which continue today for a philosophy of history, for an ideal history, for a sociology, for a historical psychology, or however may be otherwise entitled or described, a science whose object is to extract from history universal laws and concepts. Of what kind must be these laws, these universals? Historical laws and historical concepts? In that case, an elementary criticism of knowledge suffices to make clear the absurdity of the attempt. When such expressions as a historical law, a historical concept, are not simply metaphors colloquially employed, they are true contradictions in terms. The adjective is as unsuitable to the substantive as is the expressions qualitative quantity or pluralistic monism. History means concretion and individuality, law and concept mean abstraction and universality. If, on the other hand, the attempt to draw from history historical laws and concepts be abandoned, and it be merely desired to draw from it laws and concepts, the attempt is certainly not frivolous, but the science thus obtained will be not a philosophy of history, but rather, according to the case, either philosophy in its various specifications of ethic, logic, etc., or empirical science in its infinite divisions and subdivisions. Thus are sought out either those philosophical concepts which are, as has already been observed, at the bottom of every historical construction, and separate perception from intuition, historical intuition from pure intuition, history from art, or already formed historical intuitions are collected and reduced to types and classes, which is exactly the method of the natural sciences. Great thinkers have sometimes donned the unsuitable cloak of the philosophy of history, and notwithstanding the covering, they have conquered philosophical truths of the greatest magnitude. The cloak has been dropped, the truth has remained. 
modern sociologists are rather to be blamed not so much for the illusion in which they are involved when they talk of an impossible science of sociology as for the infecundity which almost always accompanies their illusion it is but a small evil that aesthetic should be termed sociological aesthetic or logic social logic the grave evil is that their aesthetic is an old-fashioned expression of sensualism their logic verbal and incoherent the philosophical movement to which we have referred has borne two good fruits in relation to history first of all has been felt the desire to construct a theory of historiography that is to understand the nature and the limits of history a theory which in conformity with the analysis made above cannot obtain satisfaction save in a general science of intuition in an aesthetic from which historic would be separated under a special head by means of the intervention of the universals furthermore concrete truths relating to historical events have often been expressed beneath the false and presumptuous cloak of a philosophy of history canons and empirical advice have been formulated by no means superfluous to students and critics it does not seem possible to deny this utility to the most recent of philosophies of history to so-called historical materialism which has thrown a very vivid light upon many sides of social life formerly neglected or ill understood aesthetic invasions into logic the principle of authority of the ipsit dixit is an invasion of historicity into the domains of science and philosophy which has raged in the schools this substitutes for introspection and philosophical analyses this or that evidence document or authoritative statement with which history certainly cannot dispense but logic the science of thought and of intellectual knowledge has suffered the most grave and destructive disturbances and errors of all through the imperfect understanding of the aesthetic fact how indeed could it be otherwise if logical activity come after and contain in itself aesthetic activity an inexact aesthetic must of necessity drag after it an inexact logic whoever opens logical treatises from the organuum of aristotle to the moderns must admit that they all contain a haphazard mixture of verbal facts and facts of thought of grammatical forms and of conceptual forms of aesthetic and of logic not that attempts have been wanting to escape from verbal expression and to seize thought in its effective nature aristotelian logic itself did not become mere syllogistic and verbalism without some stumbling and oscillation the especially logical problem was often touched upon in the middle ages by the nominalists realists and conceptualists in their disputes with galileo and with bacon the natural sciences gave an honourable place to induction vico combated formalist and mathematical logic in favour of inventive methods kant called attention to a priori synthesis the absolute idealists despised the aristotelian logic the followers of herbart bound to aristotle on the other hand set in relief those judgments which they called narrative which are of a character altogether different from other logical judgments finally the linguists insisted upon the irrationality of the word in relation to the concept but a conscious sure and radical movement of reform can find no base or starting point save in the science of aesthetic logic in its essence in a logic suitably reformed on this basis it will be fitting to proclaim before all things this truth and to draw from it all its consequences the logical fact the only logical fact is the concept the universal the spirit that forms and in so far as it forms the universal and if be understood by induction as has sometimes been understood the formation of universals and by deduction the verbal development of these then it is clear that true logic can be nothing 
but inductive logic. But since by the word deduction has been more frequently understood the special processes of mathematics, and by the word induction those of the natural sciences, it will be advisable to avoid the one and the other denomination, and to say that true logic is the logic of the concept. The logic of the concept, adopting a method which is at once induction and deduction, will adopt neither the one nor the other exclusively, that is, will adopt the speculative method, which is intrinsic to it. The concept, the universal, is in itself, abstractly considered, inexpressible. No word is proper to it. So true is this, that the logical concept remains always the same, notwithstanding the variation of verbal forms. In respect to the concept, expression is a simple sign or indication. There must be an expression, it cannot fail. But what it is to be, this or that, is determined by the historical and psychological conditions of the individual who is speaking. The quality of the expression is not deducible from the nature of the concept. There does not exist a true, logical sense of words. He who forms a concept bestows on each occasion their true meaning on the words. Distinction between logical and non-logical judgments This being established, the only truly logical, that is, aesthetical logical propositions, the only rigorously logical judgments, can be nothing but those whose proper and exclusive content is the determination of a concept. These propositions or judgments are the definitions. Science itself is nothing but a complex of definitions unified in a supreme definition, a system of concepts or chief concept. It is therefore necessary to exclude from logic all those propositions which do not affirm universals. Narrative judgments, not less than those termed non-enunciative by Aristotle, such as the expression of desires, are not properly logical judgments. They are either purely aesthetic propositions or historical propositions. Peter is passing. It is raining today. I am sleepy. I want to read. These and an infinity of propositions of the same kind are nothing but either a mere enclosing, in words the impression of the fact that Peter is passing, of the falling rain, of my organism inclining to sleep, and of my will directed to reading, or they are existential affirmation concerning those facts. They are expressions of the real or of the unreal, of historical or of pure imagination, they are certainly not definitions of universals. Syllogistic This exclusion cannot meet with great difficulties. It is already almost an accomplished fact, and the only thing required is to render it explicit, decisive, and coherent. But what is to be done with all that part of human experience, which is called syllogistic, consisting of judgments and reasonings which are based on concepts? What is syllogistic? Is it to be looked down upon from above with contempt, as something useless, as has so often been done in the reaction of the humanists against scholasticism, in the absolute idealism, in the enthusiastic admiration of our times for the methods of observation and experiment of the natural sciences? Syllogistic, reasoning in forma, is not a discovery of truth, it is the art of exposing, debating, disputing with oneself and others. Proceeding from concepts already formed, from facts already observed and making appeal to the persistence of the true or of thought, such as the meaning of the principle of identity and contradiction, it infers consequences from these data, that is, it represents what has already been discovered. Therefore, if it be an idem per idem, from the point of view of invention, it is most efficacious as a teaching and an exposition. To reduce affirmations 
to the syllogistic scheme is a way of controlling one's own thought and of criticizing that of others. It is easy to laugh at syllogizers, but if syllogistic has been born and retains its place, it must have good roots of its own. Satire, applied to it, can concern only its abuses, such as the attempt to prove syllogistically questions of fact, observation, and intuition, or the neglect of profound meditation and unprejudiced investigation of problems for syllogistic formality. And if so-called mathematical logic can sometimes aid us in our attempt to remember with ease, to manipulate the results of our own thought, let us welcome this form of the syllogism also, long prophesied by Leibniz and essayed by many, even in our days. But precisely because syllogistic is the art of exposing and of debating, its theory cannot hold the first place in a philosophical logic, usurping that belonging to the doctrine of the concept, which is the central and dominating doctrine to which is reduced everything logical in syllogistic without leaving a residuum, relations of concepts, subordination, coordination, identification, and so on. Nor must it ever be forgotten that the concept, the logical judgment, and the syllogism do not occupy the same position. The first alone is the logical fact. The second and third are the forms in which the first manifests itself. These, in so far as they are forms, cannot be examined save aesthetically, grammatically. In so far as they possess logical content, only by neglecting the forms themselves and passing to the doctrine of the concept. False Logic and True Aesthetic This shows the truth of the ordinary remark to the effect that he who reasons ill also speaks and writes ill. That exact logical analysis is the basis of good expression. This truth is a tautology, for to reason well is in fact to express oneself well, because the expression is the intuitive possession of one's own logical thought. The principle of contradiction itself is at bottom nothing but the aesthetic principle of coherence. It will be said that starting from erroneous concepts, it is possible to write and to speak exceedingly well, as it is also possible to reason well, that some who are dull at research may yet be most limpid writers. That is precisely because to write well depends upon having a clear intuition of one's own thought, even if it be erroneous. That is to say, not of its scientific, but of its aesthetic truth, since it is this truth itself. A philosopher like Schopenhauer can imagine that art is a representation of the platonic ideas. This doctrine is absolutely false scientifically, yet he may develop this false knowledge in excellent prose, aesthetically most true. But we have already replied to these objections when we observed that at that precise point where a speaker or writer enunciates an ill thought concept, he is at the same time speaking ill and writing ill. He may, however, afterwards recover himself in the many other parts of his thought, which consist of true propositions, not connected with the preceding errors, and lucid expressions may with him follow upon turbid expressions. Logic Reformed All inquiries as to the forms of judgments and of syllogisms, on their conversion and on their various relations, which still encumber treatises on logic, are therefore destined to become less, to be transformed, to be reduced to something else. The doctrine of the concept and of the organism of the concepts, of definition, of system, of philosophy, and of the various sciences and the like, will fill the place of these, and will constitute the only true and proper logic. Those who first had some suspicion of the intimate connection between aesthetic and logic, and conceived aesthetic as logic of sensible knowledge, were strangely addicted to applying logical categories to the new knowledge, talking of aesthetic concepts, aesthetic judgments, aesthetic syllogisms, and so on. We are less superstitious as regards the solidity of the traditional logic of the schools, and better informed as to the nature of aesthetic. 
we do not recommend the application of logic to aesthetic, but the liberation of logic from aesthetic forms. These have given rise to non-existent forms or categories of logic due to the following of altogether arbitrary and crude distinctions. Logic, thus reformed, will always be formal logic. It will study the true form or activity of thought, the concept, excluding single and particular concepts. The old logic is ill-called formal. It were better to call it verbal or formalistic. Formal logic will drive out formalistic logic. To attain this object, it will not be necessary to have recourse, as some have done, to a real or material logic, which is not a science of thought, but thought itself in the act, not only a logic, but the complex of philosophy, in which logic also is included. The science of thought, logic, is that of the concept, as that of fancy, aesthetic, is the science of expression. The well-being of both sciences lies in exactly following in every particular the distinction between the two domains. End of chapter 5 Recording by Lisa Reichert Chapter 6 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce Translated by Douglas Ainsley, 1865-1948 to Chapter 6 Theoretic and Practical Activity The intuitive and intellective forms exhaust, as we have said, all the theoretic form of the spirit, but it is not possible to know them thoroughly, nor to criticize another series of erroneous aesthetic theories, without first establishing clearly their relations with another form of the spirit, which is the practical form. The Will This form, or practical activity, is the will. We do not employ this word here in the sense of any philosophical system, in which the will is the foundation of the universe, the principle of things, and the true reality nor do we employ it in the ample sense of other systems which understand by will the energy of the spirit, the spirit or activity in general, making of every act of the human spirit an act of will. Neither such metaphysical nor such metaphorical meaning is ours. For us the will is, as generally accepted, that activity of the spirit which differs from the mere theoretical contemplation of things and is productive, not of knowledge, but of actions. Action is really action, in so far as it is voluntary. It is not necessary to remark that in the will to do is included, in the scientific sense, also what is vulgarly called not doing. The will to resist, to reject, the prometheutic will, is also action. The will as an ulterior stage in respect to knowledge. Man understands things with the theoretical form, with the practical form he changes them. With the one he appropriates the universe, with the other he creates it. But the first form is the basis of the second, and the relation of double degree, which we have already found existing between aesthetic and logical activity, is repeated between these two on a larger scale. Knowledge independent of the will is thinkable. Will, independent of knowledge, is unthinkable. Blind will is not will. True will has eyes. How can we will without having before us historical intuitions, perceptions, of objects, and knowledge of, logical, relations, which enlighten us as to the nature of those objects? How can we really will if we do not know the world which surrounds us and the manner of changing things by acting upon them? Objections and Elucidations It has been objected that men of action, practical men in the eminent sense, are the least disposed to contemplate and to theorize, 
their energy is not delayed in contemplation, it rushes at once into will. And conversely, that contemplative men, philosophers, are often very mediocre in practical matters, weak-willed, and therefore neglected and thrust aside in the tumult of life. It is easy to see that these distinctions are merely empirical and quantitative. Certainly the practical man has no need of a philosophical system in order to act, but in the spheres where he does act he starts from intuitions and concepts which are most clear to him. Otherwise he could not will the most ordinary actions. It would not be possible to will to feed oneself, for instance, without knowledge of the food, and of the link of cause and effect between certain movements and certain organic sensations. Rising gradually to the more complex forms of action, for example to the political, how could we will anything politically good or bad, without knowing the real conditions of society, and consequently the means and expedients to be adopted? When the practical man feels himself in the dark about one or more of these points, or when he is seized with doubt, action either does not begin or stops. It is then that the theoretical moment, which in the rapid succession of human actions is hardly noticed and rapidly forgotten, becomes important and occupies consciousness for a longer time, and if this moment be prolonged, then the practical man may become Hamlet, divided between desire for action and his small amount of theoretical clarity as regards the situation and the means to be employed. And if he develop a taste for contemplation and discovery, and leave willing and acting, to a more or less great extent, to others, there is formed in him the calm disposition of the artist, of the man of science, or of the philosopher, who are sometimes unpractical or altogether blameworthy. These observations are all obvious. Their exactitude cannot be denied. Let us, however, repeat that they are founded on quantitative distinctions and do not disprove, but confirm the fact that an action, however slight it be, cannot really be an action, that is, an action that is willed, unless it be preceded by cognoscitive activity. Critique of Practical Judgments or Judgments of Value Some psychologists, on the other hand, place before practical action an altogether special class of judgments, which they call practical judgments or judgments of value. They say that in order to resolve to perform an action, it is necessary to have judged, this action is useful, this action is good. And at first sight this seems to have the testimony of consciousness on its side. But he who observes better and analyzes with greater subtlety, discovers that such judgments follow instead of preceding the affirmation of the will. They are nothing but the expression of the already exercised volition. A good or useful action is an action that is willed. It will always be impossible to distill from the objective study of things a single drop of usefulness or goodness. We do not desire things because we know them to be good or useful but we know them to be good and useful because we desire them. Here, too, the rapidity with which the facts of consciousness follow one another has given rise to an illusion. Practical action is preceded by knowledge, but not by practical knowledge, or better by the practical. To obtain this, it is first necessary to have practical action. The third moment, therefore, of practical judgments or judgments of value is altogether imaginary. It does not come between the two moments or degrees of theory and practice. That is why there exist no normative sciences in general, which regulate or command, discover and indicate values to the practical activity, because there is none for any other activity, assuming every science already realized and that activity developed, which it afterwards takes as its object. Exclusion of the Practical from the Aesthetic These distinctions established, we must condemn as erroneous every theory which confuses aesthetic with practical activity, or introduces the laws of the second into the first. That science's theory and art, practice, has been many times affirmed. 
those who make this statement and look upon the aesthetic fact as a practical fact do not do so capriciously or because they are groping in the void but because they have their eye on something which is really practical but the practical which they are looking at is not aesthetic nor within aesthetic it is outside and beside it and although they are often found united they are not necessarily united that is to say by the bond of identity of nature the aesthetic fact is altogether completed in the expressive elaboration of the impressions when we have conquered the word within us conceived definitely and vividly a figure or a statue or found a musical motive expression is born and is complete there is no need for anything else if after this we should open our mouths and will to open them to speak or our throats to sing and declare in a loud voice and with extended throat what we have completely said or sung to ourselves or if we should stretch out and will to stretch out our hands to touch the notes of the piano or to take up the brushes and the chisel making thus in detail those movements in which we have already done rapidly and doing so in such a way as to leave more or less durable traces this is all an addition a fact which obeys quite different laws to the first and with these laws we have not to occupy ourselves for the moment let us however here recognize that this second movement is a production of things a practical fact or a fact of will it is customary to distinguish the internal from the external work of art the terminology seems here to be infelicitous for the work of art the aesthetic work is always internal and that which is called external is no longer a work of art others distinguish between aesthetic fact and artistic fact meaning by the second the external or practical stage which may and generally does follow the first but in this case it is simply a case of linguistic usage doubtless permissible although perhaps not opportune critique of the theory of the end of art and of the choice of the content for the same reasons the search for the end of art is ridiculous when it is understood of art as art and since to fix an end is to choose the theory that the content of art must be selected is another form of the same error a selection from among impressions and sensations implies that these are already expressions otherwise how can a selection be made among what is continuous and indistinct to choose is to will to will this and not to will that and this and that must be before us they must be expressed practice follows it does not precede theory expression is free inspiration the true artist in fact finds himself big with his theme he knows not how he feels the moment of birth drawing near but he cannot will it or not will it if we were to wish to act in opposition to his inspiration to make an arbitrary choice if born in acreon he were to wish to sing of atreus and of alcides his lyre would warn him of his mistake echoing only of venus and of love notwithstanding his efforts to the contrary practical innocence of art the theme or content cannot therefore be practically or morally charged with epithets of praise or of blame when critics of art remark that a theme is badly selected in cases where that observation has a just foundation it is a question of blaming not the selection of the theme which would be absurd but the manner in which the artist has treated it the expression has failed owing to the contradictions which it contains and when the same critics rebel against the theme or the content as being unworthy of art and blameworthy in respect to works which they proclaim to be artistically perfect if these expressions really are perfect there is nothing to be done but to advise the critics to leave the artists in peace for they cannot get inspiration save from what has made an impression upon them the critics should think rather of how they can effect changes in nature and in society in order that those impressions may not exist if ugliness were to vanish from the world if universal virtue and felicity were established there 
Perhaps artists would no longer represent perverse or pessimistic sentiments, but sentiments that are calm, innocent, and joyous, like Arcadians of a real Arcady. But so long as ugliness and turpitude exist in nature and impose themselves on the artist, it is not possible to prevent the expression of these things also. And when it has arisen, factum infectum fiari nequit. We speak thus entirely from the aesthetic point of view, and from that of pure aesthetic criticism. We do not delay to pass here in review the damage which the criticism of choice does to artistic production, with the prejudices which it produces or maintains among the artists themselves, and with the contrast which it occasions between artistic impulse and critical exigencies. It is true that sometimes it seems to do some good also, by assisting the artists to discover themselves, that is, their own impressions and their own inspiration, and to acquire consciousness of the task which is, as it were, imposed upon them by the historical moment in which they live, and by their individual temperament. In these cases, criticism of choice merely recognizes and aids the expressions which are already being formed. It believes itself to be the mother, where, at most, it is only the midwife. THE INDEPENDENCE OF ART The impossibility of choice of content completes the theorem of the independence of art, and is also the only legitimate meaning of the expression, art for art's sake. Art is thus independent of science, as it is of the useful and the moral. Let it not be feared that thus may be justified art that is frivolous or cold, since that which is truly frivolous or cold is so because it has not been raised to expression. Or, in other words, frivolity and frigidity come always from the form of the aesthetic elaboration, from the lack of a content, not from the material qualities of the content. Critique of the saying, The style is the man. The saying, the style is the man, can also not be completely criticized, save by starting from the distinction between the theoretic and the practical, and from the theoretic character of the aesthetic activity. Man is not simply knowledge and contemplation, he is also will, which contains in it the cognoscitive moment. Now the saying is either altogether void, as when it is understood that the man is the style, in so far as he is style, that is to say, the man, but only in so far as he is an expression of activity, or it is erroneous, when the attempt is made to deduce from what a man has seen and expressed that which he has done and willed, inferring thereby that there is a necessary link between knowing and willing. Many legends in the biographies of artists have sprung from this erroneous identification, since it seemed impossible that a man who gives expression to generous sentiments should not be a noble and generous man in practical life, or that the dramatist who gives a great many stabs in his plays should not himself have given a few at least in real life. Vainly do the artists protest, Lasciva est nobis pagina. Vita proba. They are merely taxed in addition with lying and hypocrisy. Oh, you poor women of Verona, how far more subtle you were when you founded your belief that Dante had really descended to hell upon his dusky countenance. Yours was at any rate a historical conjecture. Critique of the Concept of Sincerity in Art Finally, Sincerity, imposed upon the artist as a duty, this law of ethics which, they say, is also a law of aesthetic, arises from another equivoque. For by sincerity is meant either the moral duty not to deceive one's neighbor, and in that case is foreign to the artist, for he in fact deceives no one since he gives form to what is already in his mind. He would deceive only if he were to betray his duty as an artist by a lesser devotion to the intrinsic necessity of his task. If lies and deceit are in his mind, then the form which he gives to these things cannot be deceit or lies, precisely because it is aesthetic. The artist, 
if he be a charlatan, a liar, or a miscreant, purifies his other self by reflecting it in art, or by sincerity is meant fullness and truth of expression, and it is clear that this second sense has nothing to do with the ethical concept. The law, which is at once ethical and aesthetic, reveals itself in this case in a word employed alike by ethic and aesthetic. End of chapter 6. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Chapter 7 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce. Translated by Douglas Ainsley, 1865 to 1948. Chapter 7 Analogy Between the Theoretic and the Practical The Two Forms of Practical Activity The twofold grade of the theoretical activity, aesthetic and logical, has an important parallel in the practical activity, which has not yet been placed in due relief. The practical activity is also divided into a first and second degree, the second implying the first. The first practical degree is the simply useful or economical activity, the second the moral activity. Economy is, as it were, the aesthetic of practical life, morality its logic. The economically useful. If this has not been clearly seen by philosophers, if its suitable place in the system of the mind has not been given to the economic activity, and it has been left to wander in the prolegomena to treatises on political economy, often uncertain and but slightly elaborated, this is due, among other reasons, to the fact that the useful or economic has been confused now with the concept of technique, now with that of the egoistic. Distinction between the useful and the technical Technique is certainly not a special activity of the spirit, Technique is knowledge, or better, it is knowledge itself, in general, that takes this name, as we have seen, in so far as it serves as basis for practical action. Knowledge which is not followed, or is presumed to be not easily followed by practical action, is called pure. The same knowledge, if effectively followed by action, is called applied. If it is presumed that it can be easily followed by the same action, it is called technical or applied. This word, then, indicates a situation in which knowledge already is or easily can be found, not a special form of knowledge. So true is this that it would be altogether impossible to establish whether a given order of knowledge were intrinsically pure or applied. All knowledge, however abstract and philosophical one may imagine it to be, can be a guide to practical acts, a theoretical error in the ultimate principles of morals can be reflected and always is reflected in some way in practical life. One can only speak roughly and unscientifically of truths that are pure and of others that are applied. The same knowledge, which is called technical, can also be called useful. But the word useful, in conformity with the criticism of judgments of value made above, is to be understood as used here in a linguistic or metaphorical sense. When we say that water is useful for putting out fire, the word useful is used in a non-scientific sense. Water thrown on the fire is the cause of its going out. This is the knowledge that serves for basis to the action, let us say, of firemen. There is a link, not of nature, but of simple succession, between the useful action of the person who extinguishes the conflagration and this knowledge. The technique of the effects of the water is the theoretical activity which precedes. The action of him who extinguishes the fire is alone useful. Distinction between the useful and the egoistic 
Some economists identify utility with egoism, that is to say, with merely economical action or desire, with that which is profitable to the individual, in so far as individual, without regard to, and indeed in complete opposition, to the moral law. The egoistic is the immoral. In this case, economy would be a very strange science, standing not beside, but facing ethic, like the devil facing God, or at least like the advocatus diaboli in the processes of canonization. Such a conception of it is altogether inadmissible. The science of immorality is implied in that of morality, as the science of the false is implied in logic, the science of the true, and a science of ineffectual expression in aesthetic, the science of successful expression. If, then, economy were the scientific treatment of egoism, it would be a chapter of ethic, or ethic itself, because every moral determination implies, at the same time, a negation of its contrary. Further, conscience tells us that to conduct oneself economically is not to conduct oneself egoistically, that even the most morally scrupulous man must conduct himself usefully, economically, if he does not wish to be inconclusive and therefore not truly moral. If utility were egoism, how could it be the duty of the altruist to behave like an egoist? Economic Will and Moral Will If we are not mistaken, the difficulty is solved in a manner perfectly analogous to that in which is solved the problem of the relations between the expression and the concept, between aesthetic and logic. To will economically is to will an end. To will morally is to will the rational end. But whoever wills and acts morally cannot but will and act usefully, economically. How could he will the rational unless he willed it also as his particular end? Pure Economicity the reciprocal is not true, as it is not true in aesthetic science, that the expressive fact must of necessity be linked with the logical fact. It is possible to will economically without willing morally, and it is possible to conduct oneself with perfect economic coherence while pursuing an end which is objectively irrational, immoral, or better, an end which would be so judged in a superior grade of consciousness. Examples of the economic without the moral character are the Prince of Machiavelli, Caesar Borgia, or the Iago of Shakespeare. Who can help admiring their strength of will, although their activity is only economic and is opposed to what we hold moral? Who can help admiring the Sir Ciappelletto of Boccaccio, who even on his deathbed pursues and realizes his ideal of the perfect rascal making the small and timid little thieves who are present at his burlesque confession exclaim, What manner of man is this, whose perversity, neither age nor infirmity, nor the fear of death, which he sees at hand, nor the fear of God, before whose judgment seat he must stand in a little while, have been able to remove, nor to cause that he should not wish to die as he has lived? THE ECONOMIC SIDE OF MORALITY The moral man unites with the pertinacity and fearlessness of a Caesar Borgia, or an Iago, or of a Sir Giappoletto, the good will of the saint or of the hero, or better, good will would not be will, and consequently not good, if it did not possess, in addition to the side which makes it good, also that which makes it will. Thus a logical thought which does not succeed in expressing itself, is not thought, but at the most, a confused presentiment of a thought yet to come. It is not correct, then, to conceive of the amoral man as also the anti-economical man, or to make of morality an element of coherence in the acts of life, and therefore of economicity. Nothing prevents us from conceiving an hypothesis which is verified at least during certain periods and moments, if not during whole lifetimes, 
a man altogether without moral conscience. In a man thus organized, what for us is immorality is not so for him, because it is not so felt. The consciousness of the contradiction between what is desired as a rational end and what is pursued egoistically cannot be born in him. This contradiction is anti-economicity. Immoral conduct becomes also anti-economical only in the man who possesses moral conscience. The moral remorse which is the proof of this is also economical remorse, that is to say, pain at not having known how to will completely and to attain to that moral ideal which was willed at the first moment, but was afterwards perverted by the passions. Video miliora proboque deteriora sequor. The video and the probo are here an initial will immediately contradicted and passed over. In the man deprived of moral sense, we must admit a remorse which is merely economic, like that of a thief or of an assassin who should be attacked when on the point of robbing or of assassinating, and should abstain from doing so, not owing to a conversion of his being, but owing to his impressionability and bewilderment, or even owing to a momentary awakening of the moral consciousness. When he has come back to himself, that thief or assassin will regret and be ashamed of his inconsequence. His remorse will not be due to having done wrong, but to not having done it. His remorse is therefore economic, not moral, since the latter is excluded by hypothesis. However, a lively moral conscience is generally found among the majority of men, and its total absence is a rare and perhaps non-existent monstrosity. It may therefore be admitted that morality coincides with economicity in the conduct of life. The merely economic and the error of the morally indifferent. There need be no fear lest the parallelism affirmed by us should introduce afresh into the category of the morally indifferent, of that which is in truth action and volition, but is neither moral nor immoral the category in some of the licit and the permissible which has always been the cause or mirror of ethical corruption as is the case with jesuitical morality in which it dominated it remains quite certain that indifferent moral actions do not exist because moral activity pervades and must pervade every least volitional movement of man but this far from upsetting the parallelism confirms it do there exist intuitions which science and the intellect do not pervade and analyze, resolving them into universal concepts or changing them into historical affirmations? We have already seen that true science, philosophy, knows no external limits which bar its way, as happens with the so-called natural sciences. Science and morality entirely dominate. The one the aesthetic intuitions the other the economic volitions of man, although neither of them can appear in the concrete, save in the intuitive form as regards the one, in the economic as regards the other. Critique of Utilitarianism and the Reform of Ethic and of Economic This combined identity and difference of the useful and of the moral, of the economic and of the ethic, explains the fortune enjoyed now and formerly by the utilitarian theory of ethic. It is in fact easy to discover and to show a utilitarian side in every moral action, as it is easy to show an aesthetic side of every logical proposition. The criticism of ethical utilitarianism cannot escape by denying this truth and seeking out absurd and inexistent examples of useless moral actions. It must admit the utilitarian side and explain it as the concrete form of morality, which consists of what is within this form. Utilitarians do not see this within. This is not the place for a more ample development of such ideas. Ethic and economic cannot but be gainers, as we have said of logic and aesthetic, by a more exact determination of the relations that exist between them. 
economic science is now rising to the animating concept of the useful as it strives to pass beyond the mathematical phase in which it is still entangled a phase which when it superseded historicism was in its turn a progress destroying a series of arbitrary distinctions and false theories of economic implied in the confusion of the theoretical with the historical with this conception it will be easy on the one hand to absorb and to verify the semi-philosophical theories of so-called pure economy and on the other by the introduction of successive complications and additions and by passing from the philosophical to the empirical or naturalistic method to include the particular theories of the political or national economy of the schools phenomenon and noumenon in practical activity as aesthetic intuition knows the phenomenon or nature and philosophic intuition the noumenon or spirit so economic activity wills the phenomenon or nature and moral activity the noumenon or spirit the spirit which desires itself its true self the universal which is in the empirical and finite spirit that is the formula which perhaps defines the essence of morality with the least impropriety this will for the true self is absolute liberty end of chapter 7 recording by lisa reichert chapter 8 of aesthetic as science of expression and general linguistic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce Translated by Douglas Ainsley, 1865-1948 Chapter 8 Exclusion of Other Spiritual Forms The System of the Spirit In this summary sketch that we have given, of the entire philosophy of the spirit in its fundamental moments, the spirit is conceived as consisting of four moments or grades, disposed in such a way that the theoretical activity is to the practical, as is the first theoretical grade to the second theoretical, and the first practical grade to the second practical. The four moments imply one another regressively by their concretion. The concept cannot be without expression, the useful without the one and the other, and morality without the three preceding grades. If the aesthetic fact is alone independent and the others more or less dependent, then the logical is the least so and the moral will the most. Moral intention operates on given theoretic bases, which cannot be dispensed with, save by that absurd practice, the Jesuitical direction of intention. Here people pretend to themselves not to know what at bottom they know perfectly well. THE FORMS OF GENIUS If the forms of human activity are four, four also are the forms of genius. Geniuses in art, in science, in moral will or heroes, have certainly always been recognized, but the genius of pure economic has met with opposition. It is not altogether without reason that a category of bad geniuses, or of geniuses of evil, has been created. The practical, merely economic genius, which is not directed to a rational end, cannot but excite an admiration mingled with alarm. It would be a mere question of words, were we to discuss whether the word genius should be applied only to creators of aesthetic expression, or also to men of scientific research and of action. To observe, on the other hand, that genius, of whatever kind it be, is always a quantitative conception and an empirical distinction, would be to repeat what has already been explained as regards artistic genius. Non-existence of a fifth form of activity, law, sociality. A fifth form of spiritual activity does not exist, it would be easy to demonstrate how all the other forms either do not possess the character of activity or are verbal variants of the activities already examined or are complex and derived facts 
in which the various activities are mingled, or are filled with special contents and contingent data. The judicial fact, for example, considered as what is called objective law, is derived both from the economic and from the logical activities. Law is a rule, a formula, whether oral or written matters little here, in which is contained an economic relation willed by an individual or by a collectivity. This economic side at once unites it with and distinguishes it from moral activity. Take another example. Sociology, among the many meanings the word bears in our times, is sometimes conceived as the study of an original element which is called sociality. Now what is it that distinguishes sociality, or the relations which are developed in a meeting of men, not of subhuman beings, if it be not just the various spiritual activities which exist among the former and which are supposed not to exist, or to exist only in a rudimentary degree, among the latter? Sociality, then, far from being an original, simple, irreducible conception, is very complex and complicated. This could be proved by the impossibility generally recognized of enunciating a single sociological law properly so called. Those that are improperly called by that name are revealed as either empirical historical observations or spiritual laws, that is to say judgments, into which are translated the conceptions of the spiritual activities, when they are not simply empty and indeterminate generalizations like the so-called law of evolution. Sometimes, too, nothing more is understood by sociality than social rule, and so law, and thus sociology is confounded with the science or theory of law itself. Law, sociality, and like terms are to be dealt with in a mode analogous to that employed by us in the consideration of historicity and technique. Religiosity it may seem fitting to form a different judgment as to religious activity, but religion is nothing but knowledge, and does not differ from its other forms and subforms. For it is in truth, and in turn either the expression of practical and ideal aspirations, religious ideals, or historical narrative, legend, or conceptual science, dogma. It can therefore be maintained with equal truth both that religion is destroyed by the progress of human knowledge, and that it is always present there. Their religion was the whole patrimony of knowledge of primitive peoples. Our patrimony of knowledge is our religion. The content has been changed, bettered, refined, and it will change and become better and more refined in the future also, but its function is always the same. We do not know what use could be made of religion by those who wish to preserve it side by side with the theoretic activity of man, with his art, with his criticism, and with his philosophy. It is impossible to preserve an imperfect and inferior kind of knowledge like religion side by side with what has surpassed and disproved it. Catholicism, which is always coherent, will not tolerate a science, a history, an ethic, in contradiction to its views and doctrines. The rationalists are less coherent. They are disposed to allow a little space in their souls for a religion which is in contradiction with their whole theoretic world. These affectations and religious susceptibilities of the rationalists of our times have their origin in the superstitious cult of the natural sciences. These, as we know, and as is confessed by the mouth of their chief adepts, are all surrounded by limits. Science having been wrongly identified with the so-called natural sciences, it could be foreseen that the remainder would be asked of religion, that remainder with which the human spirit cannot dispense. We are therefore indebted to materialism, to positivism, to naturalism for this unhealthy and often disingenuous reflowering of religious exaltation. Such things are the business of the hospital, when they are not the business of the politician." Metaphysic Philosophy withdraws from religion all reason for existing because it substitutes itself for religion. As the science of the spirit, it looks upon religion as a phenomenon, a transitory historical fact, a psychic condition that can be surpassed. 
philosophy shares the domain of knowledge with the natural disciplines, with history and with art. It leaves to the first narration, measurement, and classification, to the second the chronicling of what has individually happened, to the third the individually possible. There is nothing left to share with religion. For the same reason, philosophy, as the science of the spirit, cannot be philosophy of the intuitive datum, nor, as has been seen, philosophy of history, nor philosophy of nature, and therefore there cannot be a philosophic science of what is not form and universal, but material and particular. This amounts to affirming the impossibility of metaphysic. The method, or logic, of history followed the philosophy of history, a nosiology of the conceptions which are employed in the natural sciences succeeded natural philosophy. What philosophy can study of the one is its mode of construction, intuition, perception, document, probability, etc. Of the others, she can study the forms of the conceptions which appear in them, space, time, motion, number, types, classes, etc., Philosophy, which should become metaphysical in the sense above described, would, on the other hand, claim to compete with narrative history and with the natural sciences, which in their field are alone legitimate and effective. Such a competition becomes, in fact, a labor spoiling labor. We are anti-metaphysical in this sense, while yet declaring ourselves ultra-metaphysical if by that word it be desired to claim and to affirm the function of philosophy as the autoconsciousness of the spirit, as opposed to the merely empirical and classificatory function of the natural sciences. Mental Imagination and the Intuitive Intellect In order to maintain itself side by side with the sciences of the spirit, metaphysic has been obliged to assert the existence of a specific spiritual activity, of which it would be the product. This activity, which in antiquity was called mental or superior imagination, and in modern times more often intuitive intellect or intellectual intuition, would unite in an altogether special form the characters of imagination and of intellect. It would provide the method of passing by deduction or dialectically from the infinite to the finite, from form to matter, from the concept to the intuition, from science to history, operating by a method which should be at once unity and compenetration of the universal and the particular, of the abstract and the concrete, of intuition and of intellect, a faculty marvellous indeed and delightful to possess, but we who do not possess it have no means of proving its existence. Mystical Aesthetic Intellectual intuition has sometimes been considered as the true aesthetic activity. At others, a not less marvellous aesthetic activity has been placed beside, below, or above it, a faculty altogether different from simple intuition. The glories of this faculty have been sung, and to it have been attributed the fact of art, or at the least certain groups of artistic production, arbitrarily chosen. Art, religion, and philosophy have seemed, in turn, one only, or three distinct faculties of the spirit, now one, now another of these being superior in the dignity assigned to each. It is impossible to enumerate all the various attitudes assumed by this conception of aesthetic, which we will call mystical. We are here in the kingdom, not of the science of imagination, but of imagination itself, which creates its world with the varying elements of the impressions and of the feelings. Let it suffice to mention that this mysterious faculty has been conceived, now as practical, now as a mean between the theoretic and the practical, at others again as a theoretic grade together with philosophy and religion. Mortality and Immortality of Art the immortality of art has sometimes been deduced from this last conception as belonging with its sisters to the sphere of absolute spirit. At other times, on the other hand, when religion has been looked upon as mortal and as dissolved in philosophy, then the mortality, even the actual death, 
or at least the agony of art, has been proclaimed? These questions have no meaning for us, because, seeing that the function of art is a necessary grade of the spirit, to ask if art can be eliminated is the same thing as asking if sensation or intelligence can be eliminated. But metaphysic, in the above sense, since it transplants itself to an arbitrary world, is not to be criticized in detail any more than one can criticize the botany of the Garden of Alcina, or the navigation of the voyage of Astolfo. Criticism can only be made by refusing to join the game, that is to say, by rejecting the very possibility of metaphysic, always in the sense above indicated. As we do not admit intellectual intuition in philosophy, we can also not admit its shadow or equivalent, aesthetic intellectual intuition, or any other mode by which this imaginary function may be called and represented. We repeat again that we do not know of a fifth grade beyond the four grades of spirit which consciousness reveals to us. End of chapter 8 Recording by Lisa Reichert Chapter 9 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce. Translated by Douglas Ainsley, 1865-1948. to Chapter 9 indivisibility of expression into modes or grades and critique of rhetoric the characteristics of art it is customary to give long enumerations of the characteristics of art having reached this point of the treatise having studied the artistic function as spiritual activity as theoretic activity and as special theoretic activity intuitive we are able to discern that those various and copious descriptions mean, when they mean anything at all, nothing but a repetition of what may be called the qualities of the aesthetic function, generic, specific, and characteristic. To the first of these are referred, as we have already observed, the characters, or better, the verbal variants of unity, and of unity in variety, those also of simplicity, of originality, and so on. To the second of these the characteristics of truth, of sincerity, and the like. To the third, the characteristics of life, of vivacity, of animation, of concretion, of individuality, of characteristicality. The words may vary yet more, but they will not contribute anything scientifically new. The results which we have shown have altogether exhausted the analysis of expression as such. In existence of modes of expression. But at this point, the question as to whether there be various modes or grades of expression is still perfectly legitimate. We have distinguished two grades of activity, each of which is subdivided into two other grades, and there is certainly, so far, no visible logical reason why there should not exist two or more modes of the aesthetic, that is, of expression. The only objection is that these modes do not exist. For the present, at least, it is a question of simple internal observation and of self-consciousness. One may scrutinize aesthetic facts as much as one will. No formal differences will ever be found among them, nor will the aesthetic fact be divisible into a first and a second degree. This signifies that a philosophical classification of expressions is not possible. Single expressive facts are so many individuals of which the one cannot be compared with the other, save generically, in so far as each is expression. To use the language of the schools, expression is a species which cannot in its turn perform the functions of genus. Impressions, that is to say contents, vary. Every content differs from every other content, because nothing in life repeats itself, and the continuous variation of contents follows the irreducible variety of expressive facts, the aesthetic syntheses of the impressions. Impossibility of Translations 
A corollary of this is the impossibility of translations, in so far as they pretend to effect the transference of one expression into another, like a liquid poured from a vase of a certain shape into a vase of another shape. We can elaborate logically what we have already elaborated in aesthetic form only, but we cannot reduce that which has already possessed its aesthetic form to another form also aesthetic. In truth, every translation either diminishes and spoils, or it creates a new expression by putting the former back into the crucible and mixing it with other impressions belonging to the pretended translator. In the former case, the expression always remains one, that of the original, the translation being more or less deficient, that is to say, not properly expression. In the other case, there would certainly be two expressions, but with two different contents. Ugly faithful ones, or faithless beauties, is a proverb that well expresses the dilemma with which every translator is faced. In aesthetic translations, such as those which are word for word or interlinear, or paraphrastic translations, are to be looked upon as simple commentaries on the original. Critique of Rhetorical Categories The division of expressions into various classes is known in literature by the name of theory of ornament, or of rhetorical categories. But similar attempts at classification in the other forms of art are not wanting. Suffice it to mention the realistic and symbolic forms, spoken of in painting and sculpture. The scientific value to be attached in aesthetic and in aesthetic criticism to these distinctions of realistic and symbolic, of style and absence of style, of objective and subjective, of classic and romantic, of simple and ornate, of proper and metaphorical, of the fourteen forms of metaphor, of the figures of word and of sentence, and further of pleonism, of ellipse, of inversion, of repetition, of synonyms and homonyms, and so on, is nil or altogether negative. To none of these terms and distinctions can be given a satisfactory aesthetic definition. Those that have been attempted, when they are not obviously erroneous, are words devoid of sense. A typical example of this is the very common definition of metaphor as of another word used in place of the word itself. Now why give oneself this trouble? Why take the worse and longer road when you know the shorter and better road? Perhaps, as is generally said, because the correct word is in certain cases not so expressive as the so-called incorrect word or metaphor. But in that case, the metaphor becomes exactly the right word, and the so-called right word, if it were used, would be but little expressive and therefore most improper. Similar observations of elementary good sense can be made regarding the other categories, as for example the generic one of the ornate. One can ask oneself how an ornament can be joined to expression. Externally? In that case it must always remain separate. Internally? In that case either it does not assist expression and mars it, or it does form part of it and is not ornament, but a constituent element of expression, indistinguishable from the whole. It is not necessary to dwell upon the harm done by these distinctions. Rhetoric has often been declaimed against, but although there has been rebellion against its consequences, its principles have been carefully preserved, perhaps in order to show proof of philosophic coherence. Rhetoric has contributed, if not to make dominant in literary production, at least to justify, theoretically, that particular mode of writing ill which is called fine writing, or writing according to rhetoric. Empirical Sense of the Rhetorical Categories The terms above mentioned would never have gone beyond the schools where we all of us learned them, certain of never finding the opportunity of using them in strictly aesthetic discussions, or even of doing so jocosely and with a comic intention, save when occasionally employed in one of the following significations, as verbal variants of the aesthetic concept, as indications of the anti-aesthetic, or finally, and this is their most important use, in a sense which is no longer aesthetic and literary, but merely logical. Use of these categories as synonyms of the aesthetic fact. 
Expressions are not divisible into classes, but some are successful, others half successful, others failures. There are perfect and imperfect, complete and deficient expressions. The terms already cited, then, sometimes indicate the successful expression, sometimes the various forms of the failures. But they are employed in the most inconstant and capricious manner, for it often happens that the same word serves now to proclaim the perfect, now to condemn the imperfect. An instance of this is found when someone criticizing two pictures, the one without inspiration in which the author has copied natural objects without intelligence, the other inspired, but without obvious likeness to existing objects, calls the first realistic, the second symbolic. Others, on the contrary, pronounce the word realistic about a strongly felt picture representing a scene of ordinary life, while they talk of symbolic in reference to another picture representing but a cold allegory. It is evident that in the first case symbolic means artistic, and realistic inartistic, while in the second, realistic is synonymous with artistic and symbolic with inartistic. How then can we be astonished when some hotly maintain that the true art form is the symbolic, and that the realistic is inartistic, others that the realistic is the artistic, and the symbolic the inartistic? We cannot but grant that both are right, since each makes use of the same words in senses so diverse. The great disputes about the classic and the romantic are frequently based upon such equivoques. Sometimes the former was understood as the artistically perfect, and the second as lacking balance and imperfect. At others the classic was cold and artificial, the romantic sincere, warm, efficacious, and truly expressive. Thus it was always possible to take the side of the classic against the romantic, or of the romantic against the classic. The same thing happens as regards the word style. Sometimes it is affirmed that every writer should have style. Here style is synonymous with form or expression. Sometimes the form of a code of laws or of a mathematical work is said to be devoid of style. Here the error of admitting diverse modes of expression is again committed, of admitting an ornate and a naked form of expression, because, since style is form, the code and the mathematical treatise must also, strictly speaking, have each its style. At other times, one hears the critics blaming someone for having too much style, or for writing a style. Here it is clear that style signifies not the form, nor a mode of it, but improper and pretentious expression, which is one form of the inartistic. They are used to indicate various aesthetic imperfections. Passing to the second, not altogether insignificant, use of these words and distinctions, we sometimes find in the examination of a literary composition such remarks as follow. Here is pleonasm. Here an ellipse, there a metaphor, here again a synonym or an equivoque. This means that in one place is an error consisting of using a larger number of words than is necessary, pleonasm, that in another the error arises from too few having been used, ellipse, elsewhere from the use of an unsuitable word, metaphor, or from the use of two words which seem to express two different things, where they really express the same thing, synonym, or that, on the contrary, it arises from having employed one which seems to express the same thing where it expresses two different things, equivoque. This pejorative and pathological use of the terms is, however, more uncommon than the preceding. Their use, in a sense, transcending aesthetic in the service of science. Finally, when rhetorical terminology possesses no aesthetic signification, similar or analogous to those passed in review, and yet one is aware that it is not void of meaning and designates something that deserves to be noted, it is then used in the service of logic and of science. If it be granted that a concept used in a scientific sense by a given writer is expressed with a definite term, it is natural that other words formed by that writer as used to signify the same concept, or incidentally made use of by him, become, in respect to, the vocabulary fixed upon by him as true, 
metaphors, synecdoches, synonyms, elliptic forms, and the like. We too, in the course of this treatise, have several times made use of, and intend again to make use of such terms, in order to make clear the sense of the words we employ, or may find employed. But this proceeding, which is of value in the disquisitions of scientific and intellectual criticism, has none whatever in aesthetic criticism. For science there exist appropriate words and metaphors. The same concept may be psychologically formed in various circumstances, and therefore be expressed with various intuitions. When the scientific terminology of a given writer has been established, and one of these modes has been fixed as correct, then all other uses of it become improper or tropical. But in the aesthetic fact exist only appropriate words. The same intuition can only be expressed in one way, precisely because it is an intuition and not a concept. Rhetoric in the Schools Some, while they admit the aesthetic insufficiency of the rhetorical categories, yet make a reserve as regards their utility and the service they are supposed to render, especially in schools of literature. We confess that we fail to understand how error and confusion can educate the mind to logical clearness, or aid the teaching of a science which they disturb and obscure. Perhaps it may be desired to say that they can aid memory and learning as empirical classes, as was admitted above for literary and artistic styles. But there is another purpose for which the rhetorical categories should certainly continue to be admitted to the schools, to be criticized there. We cannot simply forget the errors of the past, and truth cannot be kept alive save by making it fight against error. Unless a notion of the rhetorical categories be given, accompanied by a suitable criticism of these, there is a risk of their springing up again. For they are already springing up with certain philologists, disguised as most recent psychological discoveries. THE RESEMBLANCES OF EXPRESSIONS It would seem as though we wish to deny all bond of likeness among themselves between expressions and works of art. The likenesses exist, and owing to them, works of art can be arranged in this or that group, but they are likenesses such as are observed among individuals, and can never be rendered with abstract definitions. That is to say, these likenesses have nothing to do with identification, subordination, coordination, and the other relations of concepts. They consist wholly in what is called a family likeness and are connected with those historical conditions existing at the birth of the various works, or in an affinity of soul between the artists. THE RELATIVE POSSIBILITY OF TRANSLATIONS It is in these resemblances that lies the relative possibility of translations. This does not consist of the reproduction of the same original expressions, which it would be vain to attempt, but in the measure that expressions are given, more or less nearly resembling those. The translation that passes for good is an approximation which has original value as a work of art and can stand by itself. End of chapter 9 Recording by Lisa Reichert Chapter 10 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce Translated by Douglas Ainsley, 1865-1948 Chapter 10 Aesthetic Feelings and the Distinction Between the Ugly and the Beautiful Passing on to the study of more complex concepts, where the aesthetic activity is found in conjunction with other orders of facts, and showing the mode of this union or complication, we find ourselves at once face to face with the concept of feeling and with the feelings which are called aesthetic. Various Significances of the Word Feeling The word feeling is one of the richest in meanings. We have already had occasion to meet with it once among those used to designate the spirit in its passivity, 
the matter or content of art, and also as synonym of impressions. Once again, and then the meaning was altogether different, we have met with it as designating the non-logical and non-historical character of the aesthetic fact, that is to say pure intuition, a form of truth which defines no concept and states no fact. Feeling as activity. But feeling is not here understood in either of these two senses, nor in the others in which it has nevertheless been used to designate other cognoscitive forms of spirit. Its meaning here is that of a special activity, of non-cognoscitive nature, but possessing its two poles, positive and negative, in pleasure and pain. This activity has always greatly embarrassed philosophers who have attempted either to deny it as an activity or to attribute it to nature and to exclude it from spirit. Both solutions bristle with difficulties, and these are of such a kind that the solutions prove themselves finally unacceptable to anyone who examines them with care. For of what could a non-spiritual activity consist, an activity of nature, when we have no other knowledge of activity save as spiritual, and of spirituality save as activity? Nature is, in this case, by definition, the merely passive, inert, mechanical, and material. On the other hand, the negation of the character of activity to feeling is energetically disproved by those very poles of pleasure and of pain which appear in it and manifest activity in its concreteness, and we will say, all a quiver. Identification of feeling with economic activity. This critical conclusion ought to place us in the greatest embarrassment, for in the sketch of the system of the spirit given above, we have left no room for the new activity, of which we are now obliged to recognize the existence. But activity of feeling, if it be activity, is not specially new. It has already had its place assigned to it in the system which we have sketched, where, however, it has been indicated under another name, as economic activity. What is called the activity of feeling is nothing but that more elementary and fundamental practical activity which we have distinguished from ethical activity, and made to consist of the appetite and desire for some individual end, without any moral determination. Critique of Hedonism If feeling has been sometimes considered as organic or natural activity, this has happened precisely because it does not coincide either with logical, aesthetic, or ethical activity. Looked at from the standpoint of these three, which were the only ones admitted, it has seemed to lie outside the true and real spirit, the spirit in its aristocracy, and to be almost a determination of nature and of the soul, in so far as it is nature. Thus the thesis, several times maintained, that the aesthetic activity, like the ethical and intellectual activities, is not feeling, becomes at once completely proved. This thesis was inexpugnable, when sensation had already been reduced confusedly and implicitly to economic volition. The view which has been refuted is known by the name of hedonism. For hedonism, all the various forms of the spirit are reduced to one, which thus itself also loses its own distinctive character and becomes something turbid and mysterious, like the shades in which all cows are black. Having effected this reduction and mutilation, the hedonists naturally do not succeed in seeing anything else in any activity but pleasure and pain. They find no substantial difference between the pleasure of art and that of an easy digestion, between the pleasure of a good action and that of breathing the fresh air with wide-expanded lungs. Feeling as a concomitant to every form of activity but if the activity of feeling in the sense here defined must not be substituted for all the other forms of spiritual activity, we have not said that it cannot accompany them. Indeed, it accompanies them of necessity, because they are all in close relation, both with one another and with the elementary volitional form. Therefore, each of them has for concomitants individual volitions and volitional pleasures and pains, which are known as feeling but we must not confound what is concomitant with the principal fact and take the one for the other. 
The discovery of the truth, or the satisfaction of a moral duty fulfilled, produces in us a joy which makes our whole being vibrate, for by attaining to those forms of spiritual activity, it attains at the same time that to which it was practically tending, as to its end, during the effort. Nevertheless, economic or hedonistic satisfaction, ethical satisfaction, aesthetic satisfaction, intellectual satisfaction, remain always distinct, even when in union. Thus is solved at the same time the much debated question, which has seemed, not wrongly, a matter of life or death for aesthetic science, namely, whether the feeling and the pleasure precede or follow, are cause or effect of the aesthetic fact. We must enlarge this question to include the relation between the various spiritual forms, and solve it in the sense that in the unity of the spirit one cannot talk of cause and effect, and of what comes first and what follows it in time. And once the relation above exposed is established, the statements, which it is customary to make, as to the nature of aesthetic, moral, intellectual, and even, as is sometimes said, economic feelings, must also fall. In this last case, it is clear that it is a question not of two terms, but of one, and the quest of economic feeling can be but that same one concerning the economic activity. But in the other cases also, the search can never be directed to the substantive, but to the adjective. Aesthetic, morality, logic, explain the colouring of the feelings as aesthetic, moral, and intellectual, while feeling studied alone will never explain those refractions. Meaning of Certain Ordinary Distinctions of Feelings A further consequence is that we can free ourselves from the distinction between values or feelings of value and feelings that are merely hedonistic and without value. Also from other similar distinctions, like those between disinterested feelings and interested feelings, between objective feelings and the others that are not objective but simply subjective, between feelings of approval and others of mere pleasure, Gefallen and Virgnügen of the Germans. Those distinctions strove hard to save the three spiritual forms which have been recognized as the triad of the true, the good, and the beautiful, from confusion with the fourth form, still unknown, yet insidious through its indeterminateness, and mother of scandals. For us this triad has finished its task, because we are capable of reaching the distinction far more directly, by welcoming even the selfish, subjective, merely pleasurable feelings among the respectable forms of the spirit, and where formerly antitheses were conceived of, by ourselves and others, between value and feelings, as between spirituality and naturality, henceforth we see nothing but difference between value and value. Value and Disvalue, the Contraries and Their Union As has already been said, the economic feeling or activity reveals itself as divided into two poles, positive and negative, pleasure and pain, which we can now translate into useful and useless or hurtful. This bipartition has already been noted above as a mark of the active character of feeling, precisely because the same bipartition is found in all forms of activity. If each of these is a value, each has opposed to it anti-value, or disvalue. Absence of value is not sufficient to cause disvalue, but activity and passivity must be struggling between themselves, without the one getting the better of the other. Hence the contradiction, and the disvalue of the activity that is embarrassed, contested, or interrupted. Value is activity that unfolds itself freely. Disvalue is its contrary. We will content ourselves with this definition of the two terms, without entering into the problem of the relation between value and disvalue, that is, between the problem of contraries. Are these to be thought of dualistically as two beings or two orders of beings, like Ormuzd and Araman, angels and devils, enemies to one another, or as a unity, which is also contrariety? This definition of the two terms will be sufficient for our purpose which is to make clear aesthetic activity in particular, and one of the most obscure and disputed concepts of aesthetic, which arises at this point, the concept of the beautiful. 
the beautiful as the value of expression, or expression and nothing more. Aesthetic, intellectual, economic, and ethical values and disvalues are variously denominated in current speech. Beautiful, true, good, useful, just, and so on. These words designate the free development of spiritual activity, action, scientific research, artistic production, when they are successful. Ugly, false, bad, useless, unbecoming, unjust, inexact, designate embarrassed activity, the product of which is a failure. In linguistic usage, these denominations are being continually shifted from one order of facts to another, and from this to that. Beautiful, for instance, is said not only of a successful expression, but also of a scientific truth, of an action successfully achieved, and of a moral action. Thus we talk of an intellectual beauty, of a beautiful action, of a moral beauty. Many philosophers, especially aestheticians, have lost their heads in their pursuit of these most varied uses. They have entered an inextricable and impervious verbal labyrinth. For this reason it has hitherto seemed convenient studiously to avoid the use of the word beautiful, to indicate successful expression. But after all the explanations that have been given, and all danger of misunderstanding being now dissipated, and since, on the other hand, we cannot fail to recognize that the prevailing tendency, alike in current speech and in philosophy, is to limit the meaning of the vocable, beautiful, altogether to the aesthetic value, we may define beauty as successful expression, or better, as expression and nothing more, because expression, when it is not successful, is not expression. The ugly and the elements of beauty which compose it. Consequently, the ugly is unsuccessful expression. The paradox is true that, in works of art that are failures, the beautiful is present as unity, and the ugly as multiplicity. Thus, with regard to works of art that are more or less failures, we talk of qualities, that is to say, of those parts of them that are beautiful. We do not talk thus of perfect works. It is in fact impossible to enumerate their qualities or to designate those parts of them that are beautiful. In them there is complete fusion. They have but one quality. Life circulates in the whole organism. It is not withdrawn into certain parts. The qualities of works that are failures may be of various degrees. They may even be very great. The beautiful does not possess degrees, for there is no conceiving a more beautiful, that is, an expressive that is more expressive, an adequate that is more than adequate. Ugliness, on the other hand, does possess degrees, from the rather ugly or almost beautiful, to the extremely ugly. But if the ugly were complete, that is to say, without any element of beauty, it would for that very reason cease to be ugly because in it would be absent the contradiction which is the reason of its existence. The disvalue would become non-value. Activity would give place to passivity, with which it is not at war, save when there effectively is war. Illusions that there exist expressions which are neither beautiful nor ugly. And because the distinctive consciousness of the beautiful and of the ugly is based on the contrasts and contradictions in which aesthetic activity is developed, it is evident that this consciousness becomes attenuated to the point of disappearing altogether as we descend from the more complicated to the more simple and to the simplest cases of expression. From this arises the illusion that there are expressions which are neither beautiful nor ugly, those which are obtained without sensible effort and appear easy and natural being so considered. True aesthetic feelings and concomitant or accidental feelings. The whole mystery of the beautiful and the ugly is reduced to these henceforth most easy definitions. Should anyone object that there exist perfect aesthetic expressions before which no pleasure is felt, and others, perhaps even failures, which give him the greatest pleasure, it is necessary to advise him to pay great attention, as regards the aesthetic fact, to that only which is truly aesthetic pleasure. Aesthetic pleasure is sometimes reinforced by pleasures arising from extraneous facts, which are only casually found united with it. 
the poet or any other artist affords an instance of purely aesthetic pleasure during the moment in which he sees or has the intuition of his work for the first time that is to say when his impressions take form and his countenance is irradiated with the divine joy of the creator on the other hand a mixed pleasure is experienced by any one who goes to the theatre after a day's work to witness a comedy when the pleasure of rest and amusement and that of laughingly snatching a nail from the gaping coffin is accompanied at a certain moment by real aesthetic pleasure obtained from the art of the dramatist and of the actors the same may be said of the artist who looks upon his labour with pleasure when it is finished experiencing in addition to the aesthetic pleasure that very different one which arises from the thought of self-love satisfied or of the economic gain which will come to him from his work examples could be multiplied critique of apparent feelings a category of apparent aesthetic feelings has been formed in modern aesthetic these have nothing to do with the aesthetic sensations of pleasure arising from the form that is to say from the work of art on the contrary they arise from the content of the work of art it has been observed that artistic representations arouse pleasure and pain in their infinite variety and gradations we tremble with anxiety we rejoice we fear we laugh we weep we desire with the personages of a drama or of a romance with the figures in a picture or with the melody of music but these feelings are not those that would give occasion to the real fact outside art that is to say they are the same in quality but they are quantitatively an attenuation aesthetic and apparent pleasure and pain are slight of little depth and changeable we have no need to treat of these apparent feelings for the good reason that we have already amply discussed them indeed we have treated of them alone what are ever feelings that become apparent or manifest but feelings objectified intensified expressed and it is natural that they do not trouble and agitate us passionately as do those of real life because those were matter these are form and activity those true and proper feelings these intuitions and expressions the formula then of apparent feelings is nothing but a tautology the best that can be done is to run the pen through it end of chapter 10 recording by lisa reichert chapter 11 of aesthetic as science of expression and general linguistic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce Translated by Douglas Ainsley, 1865-1948 Chapter 11 Critique of Aesthetic Hedonism As we are opposed to hedonism in general, that is to say, to the theory which is based on the pleasure and pain intrinsic to economy and accompanies every other form of activity confounding the content and that which contains it and fails to recognize any process but the hedonistic so we are opposed to aesthetic hedonism in particular which looks upon the aesthetic at any rate if not also upon all other activities as a simple fact of feeling and confounds the pleasurable of expression which is the beautiful with the pleasurable and nothing more and with the pleasurable of all sorts critique of the beautiful as that which pleases the higher senses the aesthetic hedonistic point of view has been presented in several forms one of the most ancient conceives the beautiful as that which pleases the sight and hearing that is to say the so-called superior senses when analysis of aesthetic facts first began it was in fact difficult to avoid the mistake of thinking that a picture and a piece of music are impressions of sight or of hearing it was and is an indisputable fact that the blind man does not enjoy the picture nor the deaf man the music to show as we have shown that the aesthetic fact does not depend upon the nature of the impressions but that all sensible impressions can be raised to aesthetic expression 
and that none need of necessity be so raised is an idea which presents itself only when all the other ways out of the difficulty have been tried but whoso imagines that the aesthetic fact is something pleasing to the eyes or to the hearing has no line of defence against him who proceeds logically to identify the beautiful with the pleasurable in general and includes cooking in aesthetic or as some positivist has done the viscerally beautiful critique of the theory of play the theory of play is another form of aesthetic hedonism the conception of play has sometimes helped towards the realization of the actifying character of the expressive fact man it has been said is not really man save when he begins to play that is to say when he frees himself from natural and mechanical causality and operates spiritually and his first game is art but since the word play also means that pleasure which arises from the expenditure of the exuberant energy of the organism that is to say from a practical act the consequence of this theory has been that every game has been called an aesthetic fact and that the aesthetic function has been called a game in so far as it is possible to play with it for like science and every other thing aesthetic can be made part of a game but morality cannot be provoked at the intention of playing on the ground that it does not consent on the contrary it dominates and regulates the act of playing itself critique of the theories of sexuality and of the triumph finally there have been some who have tried to deduce the pleasure of art from the reaction of the sexual organs there are some very modern aestheticians who place the genesis of the aesthetic fact in the pleasure of conquering of triumphing or as others add in the desire of the male who wishes to conquer the female this theory is seasoned with much anecdotal erudition heaven knows of what degree of credibility on the customs of savage peoples but in very truth there was no necessity for such important aid for one often meets in ordinary life poets who adorn themselves with their poetry like cocks that raise their crests or turkeys that spread their tails but he who does such things in so far as he does them is not a poet but a poor devil of a cock or turkey the conquest of woman does not suffice to explain the art fact it would be just as correct to term poetry economic because there have been aulic and stipendiary poets and there are poets the sale of whose verses help them to gain their livelihood if it does not altogether provide it however this definition has not failed to win over some zealous neophytes of historical materialism critique of the aesthetic of the sympathetic meaning in it of content and form another less vulgar current of thought considers aesthetic to be the science of the sympathetic of that with which we sympathize which attracts rejoices gives us pleasure and excites admiration but the sympathetic is nothing but the image or representation of what pleases and as such it is a complex fact resulting from a constant element the aesthetic element of representation and from a variable element the pleasing in its infinite forms arising from all the various classes of values in ordinary language there is sometimes a feeling of repugnance at calling an expression beautiful which is not an expression of the sympathetic hence the continual contrast between the point of view of the aesthetician or of the art critic and that of the ordinary person who cannot succeed in persuading himself that the image of pain and of turpitude can be beautiful or at least can be beautiful with as much right as the pleasing and the good the opposition could be solved by distinguishing two different sciences one of expression and the other of the sympathetic if the latter could be the object of a special science that is to say if it were not as has been shown a complex fact if predominance be given to the expressive fact it becomes a part of aesthetic as a science of expression if to the pleasurable content we fall back to the study of facts which are essentially hedonistic utilitarian however complicated they may appear the origin also of the connection between content and form is to be sought for in the aesthetic of the sympathetic when this is conceived as the sum of two values 
Aesthetic Hedonism and Moralism In all the doctrines just now discussed, the art fact is posited as merely hedonistic, but this view cannot be maintained save by uniting it with a philosophic hedonism that is complete and not partial, that is to say, with a hedonism which does not admit any other form of value. Hardly has this hedonistic conception of art been received by philosophers, who admit one or more spiritual values, of truth or of morality, than the following question must necessarily be asked. What should be done with art? To what use should it be put? Should a free course be allowed to its pleasures? And if so, to what extent? The question of the end of art, which in the aesthetic of expression would be a contradiction of terms, here appears in place and altogether logical. THE RIGORISTIC NEGATION AND THE PEDAGOGIC JUSTIFICATION OF ART Now it is evident that, admitting the premises, but two solutions of such a question can be given, the one altogether negative, the other restrictive. The first which we shall call rigoristic or ascetic appears several times, although not frequently, in the history of ideas. It looks upon art as an inebriation of the senses, and therefore not only useless but harmful. According to this theory, then, it is necessary to drive it with all our strength from the human soul, which it troubles. The other solution, which we shall call pedagogic or moralistico-utilitarian, admits art, but only in so far as it concurs with the end of morality. In so far as it assists with innocent pleasure, the work of him who leads to the true and the good, in so far as it sprinkles with dulcet balm the sides of the vase of wisdom and of morality. It is well to observe that it would be an error to divide this second view into intellectualist and moralistico utilitarian, according to whether the end of leading to the true or to what is practically good be assigned to art. The task of instructing, which is imposed upon it, precisely because it is an end which is sought after and advised, is no longer merely a theoretical fact, but a theoretical fact become the material for practical action. It is not, therefore, intellectualism, but pedagogism and practicism. Nor would it be more exact to subdivide the pedagogic view into the pure utilitarian and the moralistico-utilitarian, because those who admit only the individually useful, the desire of the individual, precisely because they are absolute hedonists, have no motive for seeking an ulterior justification for art. But to enunciate these theories at the point to which we have attained is to confute them. We therefore restrict ourselves to observing that in the pedagogic theory of art is to be found another of the reasons why it has been erroneously claimed that the content of art should be chosen with a view to certain practical effects. Critique of Pure Beauty The thesis, re-echoed by the artists, that art consists of pure beauty, has often been brought forward against hedonistic and pedagogic aesthetic. Heaven places all our joy in pure beauty, and the verse is everything. If it is wished that this should be understood in the sense that art is not to be confounded with sensual pleasure, that is, in fact, with utilitarian practicism, nor with moralism, then our aesthetic also must be permitted to adorn itself with the title of Aesthetic of Pure Beauty. But if, as is often the case, something mystical and transcendental be meant by this, something that is unknown to our poor human world, or something spiritual and beatific, but not expressive, we must reply that while applauding the conception of a beauty, free of all that is not the spiritual form of expression, we are yet unable to conceive a beauty altogether purified of expression, that is to say, separated from itself. End of chapter 11 Reading by Lisa Reichert Chapter 12 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce. Translated by Douglas Ainsley, 1865 to 1948. Chapter 12. The Aesthetic of the Sympathetic and Pseudo-Aesthetic Concepts. Pseudo-Aesthetic Concepts and the Aesthetic of the Sympathetic. The doctrine of the sympathetic, very often animated and seconded in this by the capricious metaphysical and mystical aesthetic, and by that blind tradition which assumes an intimate connection between things by chance treated of together by the same authors and in the same books, has introduced and rendered familiar in systems of aesthetic a series of concepts of which one example suffices to justify our resolute expulsion of them from our own treatise. Their catalogue is long, not to say interminable. Tragic, comic, sublime, pathetic, moving, sad, ridiculous, melancholy, tragicomic, humoristic, majestic, dignified, serious, grave, imposing, noble, decorous, graceful, attractive, piquant, coquettish, idyllic, elegiac, cheerful, violent, ingenuous, cruel, base, horrible, disgusting, dreadful, nauseating, the list can be increased at will. Since that doctrine took as its special object the sympathetic, it was naturally unable to neglect any of the varieties of this, or any of the combinations or gradations which lead at last from the sympathetic to the antipathetic. And seeing that the sympathetic content was held to be the beautiful, and the antipathetic the ugly, the varieties, tragic, comic, sublime, pathetic, etc., constituted for it the shades and gradations intervening between the beautiful and the ugly. Critique of the Theory of the Ugly in Art and of the Ugly Surmounted Having enumerated and defined, as well as it could, the chief among these varieties, the aesthetic of the sympathetic set itself the problem of the place to be assigned to the ugly in art. This problem is without meaning for us, who do not recognize any ugliness, save the anti-aesthetic or inexpressive, which can never form part of the aesthetic fact, being, on the contrary, its antithesis. But the question for the doctrine which we are here criticizing was to reconcile in some way the false and effective idea of art from which it started, reduced to the representation of the agreeable, with effective art, which occupies a far wider field. Hence the artificial attempt to settle what examples of the ugly, antipathetic, could be admitted in artistic representation, and for what reasons, and in what ways. The answer was that the ugly is admissible only when it can be overcome, an unconquerable ugliness, such as the disgusting or the nauseating, being altogether excluded. Further, that the duty of the ugly, when admitted in art, is to contribute towards heightening the effect of the beautiful, sympathetic, by producing a series of contrasts, from which the pleasurable shall issue more efficacious and pleasure-giving. It is, in fact, a common observation that pleasure is more vividly felt when it has been preceded by abstinence or by suffering. Thus the ugly in art was looked upon as the servant of the beautiful, its stimulant and condiment. That special theory of hedonistic refinement, which used to be pompously called the surmounting of the ugly, falls with the general theory of the sympathetic, and with it the enumeration and the definition of the concepts mentioned above remain completely excluded from aesthetic, for aesthetic does not recognize the sympathetic or the antipathetic in their varieties, but only the spiritual activity of the representation. Pseudo-aesthetic concepts belong to psychology. However, the large space which, as we have said, those concepts have hitherto occupied in aesthetic treatises, makes opportune a rather more copious explanation of what they are. What will be their lot? As they are excluded from aesthetic, 
in what other part of philosophy will they be received? Truly in none. All those concepts are without philosophical value. They are nothing but a series of classes which can be bent in the most various ways and multiplied at pleasure, to which it is sought to reduce the infinite complications and shadings of the values and disvalues of life. Of those classes, there are some that have an especially positive significance, like the beautiful, the sublime, the majestic, the solemn, the serious, the weighty, the noble, the elevated. Others have a significance especially negative, like the ugly, the horrible, the dreadful, the tremendous, the monstrous, the foolish, the extravagant. In others prevails a mixed significance, as is the case with the comic, the tender, the melancholy, the humorous, the tragicomic. The complications are infinite because the individuations are infinite. Hence it is not possible to construct the concepts save in the arbitrary and approximate manner of the natural sciences, whose duty it is to make as good a plan as possible of that reality which they cannot exhaust by enumeration, nor understand and surpass speculatively. And since psychology is the naturalistic discipline, which undertakes to construct types and plans of the spiritual processes of man, of which, in fact, it is always accentuating in our day the merely empirical and descriptive character, these concepts do not appertain to aesthetic, nor, in general, to philosophy. They must simply be handed over to psychology. Impossibility of Rigoristic Definitions of Them As is the case with all other psychological constructions, so is it with those concepts. No rigorous definitions are possible and consequently the one cannot be deduced from the other, and they cannot be connected in a system, as has nevertheless often been attempted, at great waste of time and without result. But it can be claimed as possible to obtain, apart from philosophical definitions recognized as impossible, empirical definitions universally acceptable as true. Since there does not exist a unique definition of a given fact, but innumerable definitions can be given of it, according to the cases and the objects for which they are made, so it is clear that if there were only one, and that the true one, this would no longer be an empirical, but a rigorous and philosophical definition. Speaking exactly, every time that one of the terms to which we have referred has been employed, or any other of the innumerable series, a definition of it has at the same time been given, expressed, or understood, and each one of these definitions has differed somewhat from the others, in some particular, perhaps of very small importance, such as tacit reference to some individual fact or other, which thus became especially an object of attention, and was raised to the position of a general type. So it happens that not one of such definitions satisfies him who hears it, nor does it satisfy even him who constructs it. For, the moment after, this same individual finds himself face to face with a new case, for which he recognizes that his definition is more or less insufficient, ill-adapted, and in need of remodeling. It is necessary, therefore, to leave writers and speakers free to define the sublime or the comic, the tragic or the humoristic, on every occasion, as they please, and as may seem suitable to their purpose and if you insist upon obtaining an empirical definition of universal validity, we can but submit this one. The sublime, comic, tragic, humoristic, etc., is everything that is or will be so called by those who have employed or shall employ this word. Examples Definitions of the sublime, the comic, and the humoristic What is the sublime? the unexpected affirmation of an ultra-powerful moral force. That is one definition. But that other definition is equally good, which also recognizes the sublime where the force which declares itself is an ultra-powerful but immoral and destructive will. Both remain vague and assume no precise form until they are applied to a concrete case, which makes clear what is here meant by ultra-powerful, and what by unexpected. They are quantitative concepts, but falsely quantitative, since there is no way of measuring them. They are, at bottom, metaphors, emphatic phrases, 
or logical tautologies. The humorous will be laughter mingled with tears, bitter laughter, the sudden passage from the comic to the tragic, and from the tragic to the comic, the comic romantic, the inverted sublime, war declared against every attempt at insincerity, compassion which is ashamed to lament, the mockery not of the fact but of the ideal itself, and whatever else may better please, according as it is desired to get a view of the physiognomy of this or that poet, of this or that poem, which is, in its uniqueness, its own definition, and though momentary and circumscribed, yet the soul adequate. The comic has been defined as the displeasure arising from the perception of a deformity immediately followed by a greater pleasure arising from the relaxation of our physical forces, which were strained in anticipation of a perception whose importance was foreseen. While listening to a narrative which, for example, should describe the magnificent and heroic purpose of a definite person, we anticipate in imagination the occurrence of an action both heroic and magnificent, and we prepare ourselves to receive it by straining our psychic forces. If, however, in a moment, instead of the magnificent and heroic action which the premises and the tone of the narrative had led us to expect, by an unexpected change there occur a slight, mean, foolish action, unequal to our expectation, we have been deceived, and the recognition of the deceit brings with it an instant of displeasure. But this instant is, as it were, overcome by the one immediately following, in which we are able to discard our strained attention, to free ourselves from the provision of psychic energy accumulated, and henceforth superfluous, to feel ourselves reasonable and relieved of a burden. This is the pleasure of the comic, with its physiological equivalent, laughter. If the unpleasant fact that has occurred should painfully affect our interests, pleasure would not arise, laughter would be at once choked, the psychic energy would be strained and overstrained by other more serious perceptions. If, on the other hand, such more serious perceptions do not arise, if the whole loss be limited to a slight deception of our foresight, then the supervening feeling of our psychic wealth affords ample compensation for this very slight displeasure. This, stated in a few words, is one of the most accurate modern definitions of the comic. It boasts of containing, justified or corrected, the manifold attempts to define the comic, from Hellenic antiquity to our own day. It includes Plato's dictum in the Philebus, and Aristotle's, which is more explicit. The latter looks upon the comic as an ugliness without pain. It contains the theory of Hobbes, who placed it in the feeling of individual superiority, of Kant, who saw in it a relaxation of tension, and those of other thinkers, for whom it was the contrast between great and small, between the finite and the infinite. But on close observation the analysis and definition above given, although most elaborate and rigorous in appearance, yet enunciates characteristics which are applicable not only to the comic, but to every spiritual process, such as the succession of painful and agreeable moments, and the satisfaction arising from the consciousness of force and of its free development. The differentiation here given is that of quantitative determinations, to which limits cannot be assigned. They remain vague phrases, attaining to some meaning from their reference to this or that single comic fact. If such definitions be taken too seriously, there happens to them what Jean-Paul Richter said of all the definitions of the comic, namely, that their sole merit is to be themselves comic, and to produce in reality the fact which they vainly try to define logically. And who will ever determine logically the dividing line between the comic and the non-comic, between smiles and laughter, between smiling and gravity? Who will cut into clearly divided parts that ever-varying continuity into which life melts? Relations between those concepts and aesthetic concepts The facts classified as well as possible in the above-quoted psychological concepts, bear no relation to the artistic fact, beyond the generic that all of them, in so far as they designate the material of life, can be represented by art, 
and the other accidental relation that aesthetic facts also may sometimes enter into the processes described as in the impression of the sublime that the work of a titanic artist such as dante or shakespeare may produce and that of the comic produced by the effort of a dauber or of a scribbler the process is external to the aesthetic fact in this case also for the only feeling linked with that is the feeling of aesthetic value and disvalue of the beautiful and of the ugly the dantesque farinata is aesthetically beautiful and nothing but beautiful if in addition the force of will of this personage appears sublime or the expression that dante gives him by reason of his great genius seems sublime by comparison with that of a less energetic poet all this is not a matter for aesthetic consideration this consists always and only in adequation to truth that is in beauty end of chapter 12 recording by lisa reichert chapter 13 of aesthetic as science of expression and general linguistic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lisa reichert aesthetic as science of expression and general linguistic by benedetto croce translated by douglas ainsley 1865 to 1948 Chapter 13. The So-Called Physically Beautiful in Nature and Art. Aesthetic Activity and Physical Concepts. Aesthetic activity is distinct from practical activity, but when it expresses itself is always physical accompanied by practical activity, hence its utilitarian or hedonistic side and the pleasure and pain, which are, as it were, the practical echo of aesthetic values and disvalues, of the beautiful and of the ugly. But this practical side of the aesthetic activity has also in its turn a physical or psychophysical accompaniment, which consists of sounds, tones, movements, combinations of lines and colors, and so on. Does it really possess this side, or does it only seem to possess it, as the result of the construction which we raise in physical science, and of the useful and arbitrary methods which we have shown to be proper to the empirical and abstract sciences? Our reply cannot be doubtful, that is, it cannot be affirmative as to the first of the two hypotheses, However, it will be better to leave it at this point in suspense, for it is not at present necessary to prosecute this line of inquiry any further. The mention already made must suffice to prevent our having spoken of the physical element, as of something objective and existing, for reasons of simplicity and adhesion to ordinary language, from leading to hasty conclusions as to the concepts and the connection between spirit and nature expression in the aesthetic sense and expression in the naturalistic sense it is important to make clear that as the existence of the hedonistic side in every spiritual activity has given rise to the confusion between the aesthetic activity and the useful or pleasurable so the existence or better the possibility of constructing this physical side has generated the confusion between aesthetic expression and expression in the naturalistic sense, between a spiritual fact, that is to say, and a mechanical and passive fact, not to say between a concrete reality and an abstraction or fiction. In common speech, sometimes it is the words of the poet that are called expressions, the notes of the musician, or the figures of the painter. Sometimes the blush which is wont to accompany the feeling of shame, the pallor resulting from fear, the grinding of the teeth proper to violent anger, the glittering of the eyes, and certain movements of the muscles of the mouth which reveal cheerfulness. A certain degree of heat is also said to be the expression of fever, as the falling of the barometer is of rain, and even that the height of the rate of exchange expresses the discredit of the paper money of a state, or social discontent the approach of a revolution. 
one can well imagine what sort of scientific results would be attained by allowing oneself to be governed by linguistic usage and placing in one sheaf facts so widely different. But there is, in fact, an abyss between a man who is the prey of anger with all its natural manifestations and another man who expresses it aesthetically, between the aspect, the cries, and the contortions of one who is tortured with sorrow at the loss of a dear one, and the words or song with which the same individual portrays his torture at another moment, between the distortion of emotion and the gesture of the actor. Darwin's book on the expression of the feelings in man and animals does not belong to aesthetic, because there is nothing in common between the science of spiritual expression and a semiotic, whether it be medical, meteorological, political, physiognomic, or chiromantic. Expression in the naturalistic sense simply lacks expression in the spiritual sense, that is to say, the characteristic itself of activity and of spirituality, and therefore the bipartition into poles of beauty and of ugliness. It is nothing more than a relation between cause and effect, fixed by the abstract intellect. The complete process of aesthetic production can be symbolized in four steps which are a. Impressions b. Expression or spiritual aesthetic synthesis c. Hedonistic accompaniment or pleasure of the beautiful, aesthetic pleasure d. Translation of the aesthetic fact into physical phenomena sounds, tones, movements, combinations of lines and colors, etc. Anyone can see that the capital point, the only one that is properly speaking aesthetic and truly real, is in that B, which is lacking to the mere manifestation or naturalistic construction, metaphorically also called expression. The expressive process is exhausted when those four steps have been taken. It begins again with new impressions, a new aesthetic synthesis, and relative accompaniments. Intuitions and Memory Expressions, or representations, follow and expel one another. Certainly this passing away, this disassociation, is not perishing, it is not total elimination. Nothing of what is born dies with that complete death which would be identical with never having been born. Though all things pass away, yet none can die. The representations which we have forgotten also persist in some way in our spirit, for without them we could not explain acquired habits and capacities. Thus the strength of life lies in this apparent forgetting. One forgets what has been absorbed and what life has superseded. But many other things, many other representations, are still efficacious elements in the actual processes of our spirit, and it is incumbent on us not to forget them, or to be capable of recalling them when necessity demands them. The will is always vigilant in this work of preservation, for it aims at preserving, so to say, the greater and more fundamental part of all our riches. Certainly its vigilance is not always sufficient. Memory, we know, leaves or betrays us in various ways. For this very reason, the vigilant will excogitates expedients, which help memory in its weakness, and are its aids. THE PRODUCTION OF AIDS TO MEMORY We have already explained how these aids are possible. Expressions or representations are, at the same time, practical facts, which are also called physical facts, in so far as to the physical belongs the task of classifying them and reducing them to types. Now it is clear that if we can succeed in making those facts in some way permanent, it will always be possible, other conditions remaining equal, to reproduce in us, by perceiving it, the already produced expression or intuition. If that in which the practical concomitant acts, or, to use physical terms, the movements have been isolated and made in some sort permanent, be called the object or physical stimulus, and if it be designated by the letter E, then the process of reproduction will take place in the following order. E, the physical stimulus, D to B, perceptions of physical facts, 
sounds, tones, mimic, combinations of lines and colors, etc., which form together the aesthetic synthesis already produced, c. the hedonistic accompaniment, which is also reproduced. And what are those combinations of words which are called poetry, prose, poems, novels, romances, tragedies or comedies, but physical stimulants of reproduction, the E stage? What are those combinations of sound which are called operas, symphonies, sonatas, and what those of lines and of colors, which are called pictures, statues, architecture? The spiritual energy of memory, with the assistance of those physical facts above mentioned, makes possible the preservation and the reproduction of the intuitions produced, often so laboriously, by ourselves and by others. If the physiological organism, and with it memory, become weakened, if the monuments of art be destroyed, then all the aesthetic wealth, the fruit of the labors of many generations, becomes lessened and rapidly disappears. The Physically Beautiful Monuments of art, which are the stimulants of aesthetic reproduction, are called beautiful things, or the physically beautiful. This combination of words constitutes a verbal paradox, because the beautiful is not a physical fact. It does not belong to things, but to the activity of man, to spiritual energy. But henceforth it is clear, through what wanderings and what abbreviations, physical things and facts, which are simply aids to the reproduction of the beautiful, end by being called, elliptically, beautiful things and physically beautiful. And now that we have made the existence of this ellipse clear, we shall ourselves make use of it without hesitation. Content and Form Another Meaning The intervention of the physically beautiful serves to explain another meaning of the words content and form, as employed by aestheticians. Some call content the internal fact or expression, which is for us already form, and they call form the marble, the colors, the rhythm, the sounds, for us form no longer. Thus they look upon the physical fact as the form, which may or may not be joined to the content. This serves to explain another aspect of what is called aesthetic ugliness. He who has nothing definite to express may try to hide his internal emptiness with a flood of words, with sounding verse, with deafening polyphony, with painting that dazzles the eye or by collocating great architectonic masses which arrest and disturb, although at bottom they convey nothing. Ugliness, then, is the arbitrary, the charlatanesque, and in reality, if the practical will do not intervene in the theoretic function, there may be absence of beauty, but never effective presence of the ugly. Natural and Artificial Beauty Physical beauty is wont to be divided into natural and artificial beauty. Thus we reach one of the facts which has given great labor to thinkers. The beautiful in nature. These words often designate simply facts of practical pleasure. He alludes to nothing aesthetic who calls a landscape beautiful, where the eye rests upon verdure, where bodily motion is easy, and where the warm sun-ray envelops and caresses the limbs but it is nevertheless indubitable that on other occasions the adjective beautiful applied to objects and scenes existing in nature has a completely aesthetic signification it has been observed that in order to enjoy natural objects aesthetically we should withdraw them from their external and historical reality and separate their simple appearance or origin from existence that if we contemplate a landscape with our head between our legs in such a way as to remove ourselves from our wanted relations with it, the landscape appears as an ideal spectacle. That nature is beautiful only for him who contemplates her with the eye of the artist. That zoologists and botanists do not recognize beautiful animals and flowers. That natural beauty is discovered, and examples of discovery are the points of view pointed out by men of taste and imagination, and to which more or less aesthetic travellers and excursionists afterwards have recourse in pilgrimage, whence a more or less collective suggestion, that without the aid of the imagination, 
no part of nature is beautiful and that with such aid the same natural object or fact is now expressive according to the disposition of the soul now insignificant now expressive of one definite thing now of another sad or glad sublime or ridiculous sweet or laughable finally that natural beauty which an artist would not to some extent correct does not exist all these observations are most just and confirm the fact that natural beauty is simply a stimulus to aesthetic reproduction which presupposes previous production without preceding aesthetic intuitions of the imagination nature cannot arouse any at all as regards natural beauty man is like the mythical narcissus at the fountain they show further that since this stimulus is accidental it is for the most part imperfect or equivocal leopardi said that natural beauty is rare scattered and fugitive every one refers the natural fact to the expression which is in his mind one artist is as it were carried away by a laughing landscape another by a rag shop another by the pretty face of a young girl another by the squalid countenance of an old ruffian perhaps the first will say that the rag shop and the ugly face of the old ruffian are disgusting the second that the laughing landscape and the face of the young girl are insipid they may dispute forever but they will never agree save when they have supplied themselves with a sufficient dose of aesthetic knowledge which will enable them to recognize that they are both right artificial beauty created by man is a much more ductile and efficacious aid to reproduction mixed beauty in addition to these two classes aestheticians also sometimes talk in their treatises of a mixed beauty of what is it a mixture just of natural and artificial whoso fixes and externalizes operates with natural materials which he does not create but combines and transforms in this sense every artificial product is a mixture of nature and artifice and there would be no occasion to speak of a mixed beauty as of a special category but it happens that in certain cases combinations already given in nature can be used a great deal more than in others as for instance when we design a beautiful garden and include in our design groups of trees or ponds which are already there on other occasions externalization is limited by the impossibility of producing certain effects artificially thus we may mix the coloring matters but we cannot create a powerful voice or a personage and an appearance appropriate to this or that personage of a drama we must therefore seek for them among things already existing and make use of them when we find them when therefore we adopt a great number of combinations already existing in nature such as we should not be able to produce artificially if they did not exist the result is called mixed beauty writings we must distinguish from artificial beauty those instruments of reproduction called writings such as alphabets musical notes hieroglyphics and all pseudo languages from the language of flowers and flags to the language of patches so much the vogue in the society of the eighteenth century writings are not physical facts which arouse directly impressions answering to aesthetic expressions they are simple indications of what must be done in order to produce such physical facts a series of graphic signs serves to remind us of the movements which we must execute with our vocal apparatus in order to emit certain definite sounds if through practice we become able to hear the words without opening our mouths and what is much more difficult to hear the sounds by running the eye down the page of the music all this does not alter anything of the nature of the writings which are altogether different from direct physical beauty no one calls the book which contains the divine comedy or the portfolio which contains don giovanni beautiful in the same sense as the block of marble which contains michelangelo's moses or the piece of colored wood which contains the transfiguration are metaphorically called beautiful both serve for the reproduction of the beautiful 
but the former by a far longer and far more indirect route than the latter. The beautiful as free and not free. Another division of the beautiful, which is still found in treatises, is that into free and not free. By beauties that are not free are understood those objects which have to serve a double purpose, extra-aesthetic and aesthetic, stimulants of intuitions. And since it appears that the first purpose limits and impedes the second, the beautiful object resulting therefrom has been considered as a beauty that is not free. Architectural works are especially cited, and precisely for this reason has architecture often been excluded from the number of the so-called fine arts. A temple must be, above all things, adapted to the use of a cult. A house must contain all the rooms requisite for commodity of living. They must be arranged with a view to this commodity. A fortress must be a construction capable of resisting the attacks of certain armies and the blows of certain instruments of war. It is therefore held that the architect's field is limited. He may be able to embellish to some extent the temple, the house, the fortress, but his hands are bound by the object of these buildings, and he can only manifest that part of his vision of beauty in their construction which does not impair their extrinsic but fundamental objects. Other examples are taken from what is called art applied to industry. Plates, glasses, knives, guns, and combs can be made beautiful, but it is held that their beauty must not so far exceed as to prevent our eating from the plate, drinking from the glass, cutting with the knife, firing off the gun, or combing one's hair with the comb. The same is said of the art of printing. A book should be beautiful, but not to the extent of its being difficult or impossible to read it. Critique of the Beautiful That Is Not Free In respect to all this, we must observe in the first place that the external purpose, precisely because it is such, does not, of necessity, limit or trammel the other purpose of being a stimulus to aesthetic reproduction. Nothing, therefore, can be more erroneous than the thesis that architecture, for example, is by its nature not free and imperfect, since it must also fulfill other practical objects. Beautiful architectural works, however, themselves undertake to deny this by their simple presence. In the second place, not only are the two objects not necessarily in opposition, but we must add, the artist always has the means of preventing this contradiction from taking place. In what way? By taking, as the material of his intuition and aesthetic externalization, precisely the destination of the object, which serves a practical end. He will not need to add anything to the object in order to make it the instrument of aesthetic intuitions. It will be so, if perfectly adapted to its practical purpose. Rustic dwellings and palaces, churches and barracks, swords and ploughs, are beautiful, not in so far as they are embellished and adorned, but in so far as they express the purpose for which they were made. A garment is only beautiful because it is quite suitable to a given person in given conditions. The sword bound to the side of the warrior Rinaldo by the amorous Armida was not beautiful. So adorned that it seemed a useless ornament, not the warlike instrument of a warrior. It was beautiful, if you will, in the eyes and imagination of the sorceress, who loved her lover in this effeminate way. The aesthetic fact can always accompany the practical fact, because expression is truth. It cannot, however, be denied that aesthetic contemplation sometimes hinders practical use. For instance, it is a quite common experience to find certain new things so well adapted to their purpose, and yet so beautiful, that people occasionally feel scruples in maltreating them by using after contemplating them, which amounts to consuming them. It was for this reason that King Frederick William of Prussia evinced repugnance to ordering his magnificent grenadiers, so well suited for war, to endure the strain of battle. But his less aesthetic son, Frederick the Great, obtained from them excellent services. The Stimulants of Production 
it might be objected to the explanation of the physically beautiful as a simple adjunct for the reproduction of the internally beautiful, that is to say, of expressions, that the artist creates his expressions by painting or by sculpturing, by writing or by composing, and that therefore the physically beautiful, instead of following, sometimes precedes the aesthetically beautiful. This would be a somewhat superficial mode of understanding the procedure of the artist, who never makes a stroke with his brush without having previously seen it with his imagination. And if he has not yet seen it, he will make the stroke, not in order to externalize his expression, which does not yet exist, but as though to have a rallying point for ulterior meditation and for internal concentration. The physical point on which he leans is not the physically beautiful instrument of reproduction, but what may be called a pedagogic means, similar to retiring into solitude, or to the many other expedients, frequently very strange, adopted by artists and philosophers, who vary in these according to their various idiosyncrasies. The old aesthetician Baumgarten advised poets to ride on horseback as a means of inspiration, to drink wine in moderation, and, provided they were chaste, to look at beautiful women. End of chapter 13. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Chapter 14 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce. Translated by Douglas Ainsley, 1865-1948. to Chapter 14. Mistakes Arising from the confusion between physic and aesthetic. It is necessary to mention a series of scientific mistakes which have arisen from the failure to understand the purely external relation between the aesthetic fact or artistic vision and the physical fact or instrument which serves as an aid to reproduce it. We must here indicate the proper criticism which derives from what has already been said. Critique of Aesthetic associationism that form of associationism which identifies the aesthetic fact with the association of two images finds a place among these errors by what path has it been possible to arrive at such a mistake against which our aesthetic consciousness which is a consciousness of perfect unity never of duality rebels just because the physical and the aesthetic facts have been considered separately as two distinct images which enter the spirit, the one drawn forth from the other, the one first and the other afterwards, a picture is divided into the image of the picture and the image of the meaning of the picture, a poem into the image of the words and the image of the meaning of the words. But this dualism of images is non-existent, the physical fact does not enter the spirit as an image, but causes the reproduction of the image, the only image, which is the aesthetic fact, in so far as it blindly stimulates the psychic organism and produces an impression answering to the aesthetic expression already produced. The efforts of the associationists, the usurpers of today in the field of aesthetic, to emerge from the difficulty and to reaffirm in some way the unity which has been destroyed by their principle of associationism, are highly instructive. Some maintain that the image called back again is unconscious. Others, leaving unconsciousness alone, hold that on the contrary it is vague, vaporous, confused, thus reducing the force of the aesthetic fact to the weakness of bad memory. But the dilemma is inexorable. Either keep association and give up unity, or keep unity and give up association. No third way out of the difficulty exists. Critique of Aesthetic Physic From the failure to analyze so-called natural beauty thoroughly, and to recognize that it is simply an incident of aesthetic reproduction, and from having, on the contrary, looked upon it as given in nature, is derived all that portion of treatises upon aesthetic which is entitled The Beautiful in Nature, or Aesthetic Physic, 
sometimes even subdivided, save the mark, into aesthetic mineralogy, botany, and zoology. We do not wish to deny that such treatises contain many just remarks, and are sometimes themselves works of art, in so far as they represent beautifully the imaginings and fantasies, that is, the impressions of their authors. But we must state that it is scientifically false to ask oneself if the dog be beautiful and the ornithorhynchus ugly, if the lily be beautiful and the artichoke ugly. Indeed, the error is here double. On one hand, aesthetic, physic, falls back into the equivoque of the theory of artistic and literary classes by attempting to determine aesthetically the abstractions of our intellect. On the other, fails to recognize, as we said, the true information of so-called natural beauty, for which the question as to whether some given individual animal, flower, or man, be beautiful or ugly, is altogether excluded. What is not produced by the aesthetic spirit, or cannot be referred to it, is neither beautiful nor ugly. The aesthetic process arises from the ideal relations in which natural objects are arranged. Critique of the Theory of the Beauty of the Human Body The double error can be exemplified by the question, upon which whole volumes have been written, as to the beauty of the human body. Here it is necessary, above all things, to urge those who discuss this subject from the abstract toward the concrete, by asking, What do you mean by the human body? That of the male, of the female, or of the androgyne? Let us assume that they reply by dividing the inquiry into two distinct inquiries. As to the virile and feminine beauty, there really are writers who seriously discuss whether man or woman is the more beautiful. And let us continue. Masculine or feminine beauty? But of what race of men, the white, the yellow, or the black, and whatever others there may be according to the division of races? Let us assume that they limit themselves to the white race, and let us continue. What subspecies of the white race? And when we have restricted them gradually to one section of the white world, that is to say, to the Italian, Tuscan, Sienese, or Porta Camolia section, we will continue, very good, but at what age of the human body, and in what condition and state of development? That of the newborn babe, of the child? of the boy, of the adolescent, of the man of middle age, and so on. And is the man at rest or at work? Or is he occupied, as is Paul Potter's cow, or the Ganymede of Rembrandt? Having thus arrived by successive reductions at the individual omnimo determinatum, or better, at the man pointed out with the finger, it will be easy to expose the other error, by recalling what has been said about the natural fact, which is now beautiful, now ugly, according to the point of view, according to what is passing in the mind of the artist. Finally, if the Gulf of Naples have its detractors, and if there be artists who declare it inexpressive, preferring the gloomy firs, the clouds and perpetual north winds of the northern seas, let it be believed, if possible, that such relativity does not exist for the human body, source of the most various suggestions. Critique of the Beauty of Geometric Figures The question of beauty of geometric figures is connected with aesthetic physic. But if by geometrical figures be understood the concepts of geometry, the concept of the triangle, the square, the cone, these are neither beautiful nor ugly, they are concepts. If, on the other hand, by such figures be understood bodies which possess definite geometrical forms, these will be ugly or beautiful, like every natural fact, according to the ideal connections in which they are placed. Some hold that those geometrical figures are beautiful which point upwards, since they give the suggestion of firmness and of force. It is not denied that such may be the case, but neither must it be denied that those also which give the impression of instability and of being crushed down may possess their beauty where they represent just the ill-formed and the crushed, and that in these last cases the firmness of the straight line and the lightness of the cone, or of the equilateral triangle, would, on the contrary, seem elements of ugliness. 
Certainly such questions as to the beauty of nature and the beauty of geometry, like the others analogous of the historically beautiful and of human beauty, seem less absurd in the aesthetic of the sympathetic, which means at bottom, by the words aesthetic beauty, the representation of what is pleasing. But the pretension to determine scientifically what are the sympathetic contents and what are the irremediably antipathetic is none the less erroneous, even in the sphere of that doctrine and after the laying down of those premises. One can only answer such questions by repeating with an infinitely long postscript the sunt quos of the first ode of the first book of Horace and the havi chi of Leopardi's letter to Carlo Pepoli. To each man his beautiful equals sympathetic, as to each man his fair one. Philography is not a science. Critique of another aspect of the imitation of nature. The artist sometimes has naturally existing facts before him in producing the artificial instrument, or physically beautiful. These are called his models, bodies, stuffs, flowers, and so on. Let us run over the sketches, the studies, and the notes of the artists. Leonardo, noted down in his pocket-book, when he was working on the Last Supper, Giovannina, fantastic appearance, is at St. Catherine's at the hospital. Cristofano di Castiglione is at the Pieta, he has a fine head. Christ, Giovanni Conte, is of the suite of Cardinal Mortaro, and so on. From this comes the illusion that the artist imitates nature, when it would perhaps be more exact to say that nature imitates the artist and obeys him. The theory that art imitates nature has sometimes been grounded upon the found sustenance in this illusion, as also its variant, more easily to be defended, which makes art the idealizer of nature. This last theory presents the process in a disorderly manner, indeed inversely to the true order, for the artist does not proceed from extrinsic reality in order to modify it by approaching it to the ideal, but he proceeds from the impression of external nature to expression, that is to say, to his ideal, and from this he passes to the natural fact, which he employs as the instrument of reproduction of the ideal fact. Critique of the Theory of the Elementary Forms of the Beautiful Another consequence of the confusion between the aesthetic and the physical fact is the theory of the elementary forms of the beautiful. If expression, if the beautiful, be indivisible, the physical fact in which it externalizes itself can well be divided and subdivided. For example, a painted surface into lines and colors, groups and curves of lines, kinds of colors, and so on. A poem into strophes, verses, feet, syllables, a piece of prose into chapters, paragraphs, headings, periods, phrases, words, and so on. The parts thus obtained are not aesthetic facts, but smaller physical facts, cut up in an arbitrary manner. If this path were followed and the confusion persisted in, we should end by concluding that the true forms of the beautiful are atoms. The aesthetic law, several times promulgated, that beauty must have bulk, could be invoked against the atoms. It cannot be the imperceptibility of the too small, nor the unapprehensibility of the too large, but a bigness which depends upon perceptibility, not measurement, derives from a concept widely different from the mathematical. For what is called imperceptible and incomprehensible does not produce an impression, because it is not a real fact but a concept. The requisite of bulk in the beautiful is thus reduced to the effective reality of the physical fact, which serves for the reproduction of the beautiful. Critique of the Search for the Objective Conditions of the Beautiful Continuing the search for the physical laws or for the objective conditions of the beautiful, it has been asked, To what physical facts does the beautiful correspond? To what the ugly? To what unions of tones, colors, sizes, mathematically determinable? Such inquiries are as if in political economy, 
one were to seek for the laws of exchange in the physical nature of the objects exchanged. The constant infecundity of the attempt should have at once given rise to some suspicion as to its vanity. In our times especially has the necessity for an inductive aesthetic been often proclaimed, of an aesthetic starting from below, which should proceed like natural science and not hasten its conclusions. Inductive? But aesthetic has always been both inductive and deductive, like every philosophical science. Induction and deduction cannot be separated, nor can they separately avail to characterize a true science. But the word inductive was not here pronounced accidentally and without special intention. It was wished to imply by its use that the aesthetic fact is nothing at bottom but a physical fact, which should be studied by applying to it the methods proper to the physical and natural sciences. With such a presupposition, and in such a faith, did inductive aesthetic or aesthetic of the inferior, what pride in the modesty, begin its labours. It has conscientiously begun by making a collection of beautiful things, for example, of a great number of envelopes of various shapes and sizes, and has asked which of these give the impression of the beautiful and which of the ugly. As was to be expected, the inductive aestheticians speedily found themselves in a difficulty, for the same objects that appeared ugly in one aspect would appear beautiful in another. A yellow, coarse envelope, which would be extremely ugly for the purpose of enclosing a love letter, is, however, just what is wanted for a writ served by process on stamped paper. This in its turn would look very bad, or seem at any rate an irony, if enclosed in a square English envelope. Such considerations of simple common sense should have sufficed to convince inductive aestheticians that the beautiful has no physical existence, and cause them to remit their vain and ridiculous quest. But no, they had recourse to an expedient, as to which we would find it difficult to say how far it belongs to natural science. They have sent their envelopes round from one to the other, and opened a referendum, thus striving to decide by the votes of the majority in what consists the beautiful and the ugly. We will not waste time over this argument, because we should seem to be turning ourselves into narrators of comic anecdotes, rather than expositors of aesthetic science and of its problems. It is an actual fact that the inductive aestheticians have not yet discovered one single law. Astrology of Aesthetic He who dispenses with doctors is prone to abandon himself to charlatans. Thus it has befallen those who have believed in the natural laws of the beautiful. Artists sometimes adopt empirical canons, such as that of the proportions of the human body, or of the golden section, that is to say, of a line divided into two parts in such a manner that the less is to the greater, as is the greater to the whole line. BC is to AC, equals AC is to AB. Such canons easily become their superstitions, and they attribute to such the success of their works. Thus Michelangelo left as a precept to his disciple Marco del Pino of Siena that he should always make a pyramid serpentine figure multiplied by one, two, three, a precept which did not enable Marco de Siena to emerge from that mediocrity which we can yet observe in his many works here in Naples. Others extracted from the sayings of Michelangelo the precept that serpentine undulating lines were the true lines of beauty. Whole volumes have been composed on these laws of beauty, on the golden section, and on the undulating and serpentine lines. These should, in our opinion, be looked upon as the astrology of aesthetic. End of chapter 14 Recording by Lisa Reichert Chapter 15 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce. Translated by Douglas Ainsley. 1865 to 1948. 
Chapter 15. The Activity of Externalization, Technique, and the Theory of the Arts. The Practical Activity of Externalization. The fact of the production of the physically beautiful implies, as has already been remarked, a vigilant will, which persists in not allowing certain visions, intuitions, or representations to be lost. Such a will must be able to act with the utmost rapidity and, as it were, instinctively, and also be capable of long and laborious deliberations. Thus, and only thus, does the practical activity enter into relations with the aesthetic, that is to say, in effecting the production of physical objects which are aids to memory. Here it is not merely a concomitant, but really a distinct moment of the aesthetic activity. We cannot will or not will our aesthetic vision. We can, however, will or not will to externalize it, or better, to preserve and communicate or not to others the externalization produced. The Technique of Externalization this volitional fact of externalization is preceded by a complex of various kinds of knowledge. These are known as techniques, like all knowledge which precedes the practical activity. Thus we talk of an artistic technique in the same metaphorical and elliptical manner that we talk of the physically beautiful, that is to say, in more precise language, Knowledge employed by the practical activity engaged in producing stimuli to aesthetic reproduction. In place of employing so lengthy a phrase, we shall here avail ourselves of the vulgar terminology, since we are henceforward aware of its true meaning. The possibility of this technical knowledge at the service of artistic reproduction has caused people to imagine the existence of an aesthetic technique of internal expression, which is tantamount to saying, a doctrine of the means of internal expression, which is altogether inconceivable. And we know well the reason why it is inconceivable. Expression, considered in itself, is primary theoretic activity, and in so far as it is this, it precedes the practical activity and the intellectual knowledge which illumines the practical activity, and is thus independent alike of the one and of the other. It also helps to illumine the practical activity, but is not illuminated by it. Expression does not employ means, because it has not an end, it has intuitions of things, but does not will them, and is thus indivisible into means and end. Thus, if it be said, as sometimes is the case, that a certain writer has invented a new technique of fiction or of drama, or that a painter has discovered a new mode of distribution of light, the word is used in a false sense, because the so-called new technique is really that romance itself, or that new picture itself. The distribution of light belongs to the vision itself of the picture, as the technique of a dramatist is his dramatic conception itself. On other occasions, the word technique is used to designate certain merits or defects in a work which is a failure, and it is said euphemistically that the conception is bad, but the technique is good, or that the conception is good, and the technique is bad. On the other hand, when the different ways of painting in oils, or of etching, or of sculpturing in alabaster are discussed, then the word technique is in its place. But in such a case the adjective artistic is used metaphorically, and if a dramatic technique in the artistic sense is impossible, a theatrical technique is not impossible, that is to say, process of externalization of certain given aesthetic works. When, for instance, women were introduced on the stage in Italy in the second half of the sixteenth century, in place of men dressed as women, this was a true and real discovery in theatrical technique. Such, too, was the perfecting in the following century, by the impresarios of Venice, of machines for the rapid changing of the scenes. THE THEORETIC TECHNIQUES OF THE INDIVIDUAL ARTS the collection of technical knowledge at the service of artists, desirous of externalizing their expressions, 
can be divided into groups which may be entitled theories of the arts. Thus is born a theory of architecture comprising mechanical laws, information relating to the weight or to the resistance of the materials of construction or of fortification, manuals relating to the method of mixing chalk or stucco, a theory of sculpture containing advice as to the instruments to be used for sculpturing the various sorts of stone, for obtaining a successful fusion of bronze, for working with the chisel, for the exact copying of the model in chalk or plaster, for keeping chalk damp, a theory of painting on the various techniques of tempera, of oil painting, of watercolour, of pastel, on the proportions of the human body, on the laws of perspective, a theory of oratory, with precepts as to the method of producing, of exercising, and of strengthening the voice, of mimic and gesture, a theory of music on the combinations and fusions of tones and sounds, and so on. Such collections of precepts abound in all literatures, and since it soon becomes impossible to say what is useful and what useless to know, books of this sort become very often a sort of encyclopedias or catalogues of desiderata. Vitruvius, in his treatise on architecture, claims for the architect a knowledge of letters, of drawing, of geometry, of arithmetic, of optic, of history, of natural and moral philosophy, of jurisprudence, of medicine, of astrology, of music, and so on. Everything is worth knowing. Learn the art and lay it aside. It should be evident that such empirical collections are not reducible to a science. They are composed of notions, taken from various sciences and teachings, and their philosophical and scientific principles are to be found in them. To undertake the construction of a scientific theory of the different arts would be to wish to reduce to the single and homogeneous what is by nature multiple and heterogeneous. To wish to destroy the existence as a collection of what was put together precisely to form a collection. Were we to give a scientific form to the manuals of the architect, the painter, or the musician, it is clear that nothing would remain in our hands but the general principles of mechanic, optic, or acoustic, or if the especially artistic observations disseminated through it be extracted and isolated, and a science be made of them, then the sphere of the individual art is deserted, and that of aesthetic entered upon, for aesthetic is always general aesthetic, or better, it cannot be divided into general and special. This last case, that is the attempt to furnish a technique of aesthetic, is found when men possessing strong scientific instincts and a natural tendency to philosophy set themselves to work to produce such theories and technical manuals. Critique of the Aesthetic Theories of the Individual Arts But the confusion between physic and aesthetic has attained to its highest degree when aesthetic theories of the different arts are imagined to answer such questions as What are the limits of each art? What can be represented with colors? And what with sounds? What with simple monochromatic lines? And what with touches of various colors? What with notes, and what with meters and rhymes? What are the limits between the figurative and the auditional arts? Between painting and sculpture, poetry and music? This, translated into scientific language, is tantamount to asking, What is the connection between acoustic and aesthetic expression? What between the latter and optic, and the like? Now, if there is no passage from the physical fact to the aesthetic, how could there be from the aesthetic to particular groups of aesthetic facts, such as the phenomena of optic or of acoustic? Critique of the Classifications of the Arts The things called arts have no aesthetic limits, because, in order to have them, they would need to have also aesthetic existence, and we have demonstrated the altogether empirical genesis of those divisions. Consequently, any attempt at an aesthetic classification of the arts is absurd. If they be without limits, they are not exactly determinable, and consequently cannot be philosophically classified. 
all the books dealing with classifications and systems of the arts could be burned without any loss whatever. We say this with the utmost respect to the writers who have expended their labours upon them. The impossibility of such classifications finds, as it were, its proof in the strange methods to which recourse has been had to carry them out. The first and most common classification is that into arts of hearing, sight, and imagination, as if eyes, ears, and imagination were on the same level, and could be deduced from the same logical variable as foundation of the division. Others have proposed the division into arts of space and time, and arts of rest and motion, as if the concepts of space, time, rest, and motion could determine special aesthetic forms, or have anything in common with art as such. Finally, others have amused themselves by dividing them into classic and romantic, or into oriental, classic, and romantic, thereby conferring the value of scientific concepts on simple historical denominations, or adopting those pretended partitions of expressive forms already criticized above, or by talking of arts that can only be seen from one side, like painting, and of arts that can be seen from all sides, like sculpture and similar extravagances which exist neither in heaven nor on the earth. The theory of the limits of the arts was, perhaps, at the time when it was put forward, a beneficial critical reaction against those who believed in the possibility of the flowing of one expression into another, as of the Iliad, or of Paradise Lost, into a series of paintings, and thus held a poem to be of greater or lesser value according as it could or could not be translated into pictures by a painter. But if the rebellion were reasonable and victorious, this does not mean that the arguments adopted and the theories made, as required, were sound. Critique of the Theory of the Union of the Arts Another theory, which is a corollary to that of the limits of the arts, falls with them, that of the union of the arts. Granted different arts, distinct and limited, the questions were asked, What is the most powerful? Do we not obtain more powerful effects by uniting several? We know nothing of this. We know only, in each individual case, that certain given artistic intuitions have need of definite physical means for their reproduction, and that other artistic intuitions have need of other physical means. We can obtain the effect of certain dramas by simply reading them. Others need declamation and scenic display. Some artistic intuitions, for their full extrinsication, need words, song, musical instruments, colors, statuary, architecture, actors, while others are beautiful and complete in a single delicate sweep of the pen or with a few strokes of the pencil. But it is false to suppose that declamation and scenic effects and all the other things we have mentioned together are more powerful than simply reading or than the simple stroke with the pen and with the pencil. Because each of these facts or groups of facts has, so to say, a different object and the power of the different means employed cannot be compared when the objects are different. Connection of the Activity of Externalization with utility and morality. Finally, it is only from the point of view of a clear and rigorous distinction between the true and proper aesthetic activity and the practical activity of externalization that we can solve the involved and confused questions as to the relations between art and utility and art and morality. That art as art is independent alike of utility and of morality, as also of every volitional form, we have above demonstrated. Without this independence it would not be possible to speak of an intrinsic value of art, nor indeed to conceive an aesthetic science, which demands the autonomy of the aesthetic fact as a necessity of its existence. But it would be erroneous to maintain that this independence of the vision or intuition or internal expression of the artist should be at once extended to the practical activity of externalization and of communication, which may or may not follow the aesthetic fact. If art be understood as the externalization of art, then utility and morality have a perfect right to deal with it, 
that is to say, the right one possesses to deal with one's own household. We do not, as a matter of fact, externalize and fix all of the many expressions and intuitions which we form in our mind. We do not declare our every thought in a loud voice, or write down, or print, or draw, or color, or expose it to the public gaze. We select from the crowd of intuitions which are formed, or at least sketched within us, and the selection is governed by selection of the economic conditions of life and of its moral direction. Therefore, when we have formed an intuition, it remains to decide whether or no we should communicate it to others, and to whom, and when, and how, all of which considerations fall equally under the utilitarian and ethical criterion. Thus we find the concepts of selection, of the interesting, of morality, of an educational end, of popularity, etc., to some extent justified, although these can in no wise be justified as imposed upon art as art, and we have ourselves denounced them in pure aesthetic. Error always contains an element of truth. He who formulated those erroneous aesthetic propositions had his eye on practical facts which attached themselves externally to the aesthetic fact in economic and moral life. By all means, be partisans of a yet greater liberty in the vulgarization of the means of aesthetic reproduction. We are of the same opinion, and let us leave the proposals for legislative measures and for actions to be instigated against immoral art to hypocrites, to the ingenuous, and to idlers. But the proclamation of this liberty, and the fixation of its limits, how wide soever they be, is always the affair of morality, and it would in any case be out of place to invoke that highest principle, that fundamentum aestheticis, which is the independence of art, in order to deduce from it the guiltlessness of the artist, who in the externalization of his imaginings should calculate upon the unhealthy tastes of his readers, or that licenses should be granted to the hawkers who sell obscene statuettes in the streets. This last case is the affair of the police. The first must be brought before the tribunal of the moral conscience. The aesthetic judgment on the work of art has nothing to do with the morality of the artist, in so far as he is a practical man, nor with the precautions to be taken that art may not be employed for evil purposes alien to its essence, which is pure theoretic contemplation. End of chapter 15 Recording by Lisa Reichert Chapter 16 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce Translated by Douglas Ainsley, 1865-1948 to Chapter 16 Taste and the Reproduction of Art Aesthetic Judgment, Its Identity with Aesthetic Reproduction when the entire aesthetic and externalizing process has been completed, when a beautiful expression has been produced and fixed in a definite physical material, what is meant by judging it? To reproduce it in oneself, answer the critics of art, almost with one voice. Very good, let us try thoroughly to understand this fact, and with that object in view, let us represent it schematically. The individual A is seeking the expression of an impression, which he feels or has a presentiment of, but has not yet expressed. Behold him trying various words and phrases, which may give the sought-for expression, which must exist, but which he does not know. He tries the combination M, but rejects it as unsuitable, inexpressive, incomplete, ugly. He tries the combination N, with a like result. He does not see anything, or he does not see clearly. The expression still flies from him. After other vain attempts, during which he sometimes approaches, sometimes leaves the sign that offers itself, all of a sudden, 
almost as though formed spontaneously of itself, he creates the sought-for expression, and lux facta est. He enjoys for an instant aesthetic pleasure, or the pleasure of the beautiful. The ugly, with its correlative displeasure, was the aesthetic activity, which had not succeeded in conquering the obstacle. The beautiful is the expressive activity, which now displays itself triumphant. We have taken this example from the domain of speech, as being nearer and more accessible, and because we all talk, though we do not all draw or paint. Now if another individual, whom we shall term B, desire to judge this expression and decide whether it be beautiful or ugly, he must of necessity place himself at A's point of view, and go through the whole process again, with the help of the physical sign supplied to him by A. If A has seen clearly, then B, who has placed himself at A's point of view, will also see clearly, and will find this expression beautiful. If A has not seen clearly, then B also will not see clearly, and will find the expression more or less ugly, just as A did. Impossibility of Divergences It may be observed that we have not taken into consideration two other cases, that of A having a clear and B an obscure vision, and that of A having an obscure and B a clear vision. Philosophically speaking, these two cases are impossible. Spiritual activity, precisely because it is activity, is not a caprice, but a spiritual necessity, and it cannot solve a definite aesthetic problem, save in one way, which is the right way. Doubtless certain facts may be adduced, which appear to contradict this deduction. Thus, works which seem beautiful to artists are judged to be ugly by the critics, while works with which the artists were displeased, and judged imperfect or failures, are held to be beautiful and perfect by the critics. But this does not mean anything, save that one of the two is wrong, either the critics or the artists, or in one case the artist and in another the critic. In fact, the producer of an expression does not always fully realize what has happened in his soul. Haste, vanity, want of reflection, theoretic prejudices, make people say, and sometimes others almost believe, that works of ours are beautiful, which, if we were truly to turn inwards upon ourselves, we should see ugly, as they really are. Thus poor Don Quixote, when he had mended his helmet as well as he could with cardboard, the helmet that had showed itself to possess but the feeblest force of resistance at the first encounter, took good care not to test it again with a well-delivered sword-thrust, but simply declared and maintained it to be, says the author, por gelada finissima de encaxe. And in other cases, the same reasons, or opposite but analogous ones, trouble the consciousness of the artist and cause him to disapprove of what he has successfully produced, or to strive to undo and do again worse what he has done well in his artistic spontaneity. An example of this is the Jerusalem Conquistata. In the same way, haste, laziness, want of reflection, theoretic prejudices, personal sympathies, or animosities, and other motives of a similar sort, sometimes cause the critics to proclaim beautiful what is ugly, and ugly what is beautiful. Were they to eliminate such disturbing elements, they would feel the work of art as it really is, and would not leave to posterity that more diligent and more dispassionate judge to award the palm, or to do that justice which they have refused. Identity of Taste and Genius It is clear from the preceding theorem that the judicial activity, which criticizes and recognizes the beautiful, is identical with that which produces it. The only difference lies in the diversity of circumstances, since in the one case it is a question of aesthetic production, in the other of reproduction. The judicial activity is called taste. The productive activity is called genius. Genius and taste are therefore substantially identical. The common remark 
that the critic should possess some of the genius of the artist, and that the artist should possess taste, reveals a glimpse of this identity, or that there exists an active, productive taste, and a passive, reproductive taste. But a denial of this is contained in other equally common remarks, as when people speak of taste without genius, or of genius without taste. These last observations are meaningless, unless they be taken as alluding to quantitative differences. In this case, those would be called geniuses without taste, who produce works of art inspired in their culminating parts, and neglected and defective in their secondary parts, and those men of taste without genius, who succeed in obtaining certain isolated or secondary effects, but do not possess the power necessary for a vast artistic synthesis. Analogous explanations can easily be given of other similar propositions. But to posit a substantial difference between genius and taste, between artistic production and reproduction, would render communication and judgment alike inconceivable. How could we judge what remained extraneous to us? How could that which is produced by a given activity be judged by a different activity? The critic will be a small genius, the artist a great genius. The one will have the strength of ten, the other of a hundred. The former, in order to raise himself to the altitude of the latter, will have need of his assistance. But the nature of both must be the same. In order to judge Dante, we must raise ourselves to his level. Let it be well understood that empirically we are not Dante, nor Dante we, but in that moment of judgment and contemplation our spirit is one with that of the poet, and in that moment we and he are one single thing. In this identity alone resides the possibility that our little souls can unite with great souls and become great with them in the universality of the spirit. Analogy with the other activities Let us remark in passing that what has been said of the aesthetic judgment holds good equally for every other activity and for every other judgment, and that scientific, economic, and ethical criticism is affected in a like manner. To limit ourselves to this last, it is only if we place ourselves ideally in the same conditions in which he who took a given resolution found himself, that we can form a judgment as to whether his resolution were moral or immoral. An action would otherwise remain incomprehensible, and therefore impossible to judge. A homicide may be a rascal or a hero. If this be, within limits, indifferent as regards the safety of society, which condemns both to the same punishment, it is not indifferent to him who wishes to distinguish and to judge from the moral point of view, and we cannot dispense with studying again the individual psychology of the homicide, in order to determine the true nature of his deed, not merely in its judicial, but also in its moral aspect. In ethic, a moral taste or tact is sometimes referred to, which answers to what is generally called moral conscience, that is to say, to the activity itself of good will. Critique of Absolutism, Intellectualism, and of Aesthetic Relativism the explanation above given of aesthetic judgment or reproduction at once affirms and denies the position of the absolutists and relativists, of those, that is to say, who affirm and of those who deny the existence of an absolute taste. The absolutists, who affirm that they can judge of the beautiful, are right, but the theory on which they found their affirmation is not maintainable. They conceive of the beautiful, that is, of aesthetic value, as of something placed outside the aesthetic activity, as if it were a model or a concept which an artist realizes in his work, and of which the critic avails himself afterwards in order to judge the work itself. Concepts and models alike have no existence in art, for by proclaiming that every art can be judged only in itself, and has its own model in itself, they have attained to the denial of the existence of objective models of beauty, whether they be intellectual concepts or ideas suspended in the metaphysical sky. In proclaiming this, 
the adversaries, the relativists, are perfectly right, and accomplish a progress. However, the initial rationality of their thesis becomes in its turn a false theory. Repeating the old adage that there is no accounting for tastes, they believe that aesthetic expression is of the same nature as the pleasant and the unpleasant, which every one feels in his own way, and as to which there is no disputing. But we know that the pleasant and the unpleasant are utilitarian and practical facts. Thus the relativists deny the peculiarity of the aesthetic fact, again confounding expression with impression, the theoretic with the practical. The true solution lies in rejecting alike relativism, or psychologism, and false absolutism, and in recognizing that the criterion of taste is absolute, but absolute in a different way from that of the intellect, which is developed by reason. The criterion of taste is absolute with the intuitive absoluteness of the imagination. Thus every act of expressive activity, which is so really, will be recognized as beautiful, and every fact in which expressive activity and passivity are found engaged with one another in an unfinished struggle, will be recognized as ugly. Critique of Relative Relativism There lies between absolutists and relativists a third class, which may be called that of the relative relativists. These affirm the existence of absolute values in other fields, such as logic and ethic, but deny their existence in the field of aesthetic. To them it appears natural and justifiable to dispute about science and morality, because science rests on the universal, common to all men, and morality on duty, which is also a law of human nature. But how, they say, can one dispute about art, which rests on imagination? Not only, however, is the imaginative activity universal and belongs to human nature, like the logical concept and practical duty, but we must oppose a capital objection to this intermediary thesis. If the absolute nature of the imagination were denied, we should be obliged to deny also that of intellectual or conceptual truth, and implicitly of morality. Does not morality presuppose logical distinctions? How could these be known otherwise than by expressions and words, that is to say, in imaginative form? If the absoluteness of the imagination were removed, spiritual life would tremble to its base. One individual would no longer understand another, nor indeed his own self of a moment before, which, when considered a moment after, is already another individual. Objection founded on the variation of the stimulus and on the psychic disposition. Nevertheless, variety of judgments is an indisputable fact. Men are at variance in their logical, ethical, and economical appreciations, and they are equally or even more at variance in their aesthetic appreciations. If certain reasons detailed by us above, such as haste, prejudices, passions, etc., may be held to lessen the importance of this disagreement, they do not thereby annul it. We have been cautious when speaking of the stimuli of reproduction, for we said that reproduction takes place if all the other conditions remain equal. Do they remain equal? Does the hypothesis correspond to reality? It would appear not. In order to reproduce several times an impression by employing a suitable physical stimulus, it is necessary that this stimulus be not changed, and that the organism remain in the same psychical condition as those in which was experienced the impression that it is desired to reproduce. Now it is a fact that the physical stimulus is continually changing, and in like manner the psychological conditions. Oil paintings grow dark, frescoes pale, statues lose noses, hands, and legs, architecture becomes totally or partially a ruin, the tradition of the execution of a piece of music is lost, the text of a poem is corrupted by bad copyists or bad printing. These are obvious instances of the changes which daily occur in objects or physical stimuli. As regards psychological conditions, we will not dwell upon the cases of deafness or blindness, that is to say, 
upon the loss of entire orders of psychical impressions, these cases are secondary and of less importance compared with the fundamental, daily inevitable and perpetual changes of the society around us and of the internal conditions of our individual life. The phonic manifestations, that is, the words and verses of the Dantesque Commedia, must produce a very different impression on a citizen engaged in the politics of the Third Rome to that experienced by a well-informed and intimate contemporary of the poet. The Madonna of Cimabue is still in the church of Santa Maria Novella, but does she speak to the visitor of today as she spoke to the Florentines of the thirteenth century? Even though she were not also darkened by time, would not the impression be altogether different? And finally, how can a poem composed in youth make the same impression on the same individual poet when he rereads it in his old age with his psychic dispositions altogether changed? Critique of the Division of Signs into Natural and Conventional It is true that certain aestheticians have attempted a distinction between stimuli and stimuli, between natural and conventional signs. They would grant to the former a constant effect on all, to the latter only on a limited circle. In their belief, signs employed in painting are natural, while the words of poetry are conventional. But the difference between the one and the other is only of degree. It has often been affirmed that painting is a language which all understand, while with poetry it is otherwise. Here, for example, Leonardo placed one of the prerogatives of his art, which hath not need of interpreters of different languages as have letters. And in it man and brute find satisfaction. He relates the anecdote of that portrait of the father of a family, which the little grandchildren were wont to caress while they were still in swaddling clothes, and the dogs and cats of the house in like manner. But other anecdotes, such as those of the savages who took the portrait of a soldier for a boat, or considered the portrait of a man on horseback as furnished with only one leg, are apt to shake one's faith in the understanding of painting by sucklings, dogs, and cats. Fortunately, no arduous researches are necessary to convince oneself that pictures, poetry, and every work of art produce no effects save on souls prepared to receive them. Natural signs do not exist, because they are all conventional in a like manner, or, to speak with greater exactitude, all are historically conditioned. THE SURMOUNTING OF VARIETY this being so, how are we to succeed in causing the expression to be reproduced by means of the physical object? How obtain the same effect when the conditions are no longer the same? Would it not, rather, seem necessary to conclude that expressions cannot be reproduced despite the physical instruments made by man for the purpose, and that what is called reproduction consists in ever new expressions? Such would indeed be the conclusion if the variety of physical and psychic conditions were intrinsically unsurmountable. But since the insuperability has none of the characteristics of necessity, we must on the contrary conclude that the reproduction always occurs when we can replace ourselves in the conditions in which the stimulus, physical beauty, was produced. Not only can we replace ourselves in these conditions as an abstract possibility, but as a matter of fact we do so continually. Individual life, which is communion with ourselves, with our past, and social life, which is communion with our like, would not otherwise be possible. Restorations and Historical Interpretation As regards the physical object, Paleographers and philologists who restore to texts their original physiognomy, restorers of pictures and of statues, and similar categories of workers, exert themselves to preserve or to give back to the physical object all its primitive energy. These efforts certainly do not always succeed, or are not completely successful, for never, or hardly ever, is it possible to obtain a restoration complete in its smallest details. 
but the unsurmountable is only accidentally present and cannot cause us to fail to recognize the favorable results which are nevertheless obtained historical interpretation likewise labors to reintegrate in us historical conditions which have been altered in the course of history it revives the dead completes the fragmentary and affords us the opportunity of seeing a work of art a physical object as its author saw it at the moment of production a condition of this historical labor is tradition with the help of which it is possible to collect the scattered rays and cause them to converge on one center with the help of memory we surround the physical stimulus with all the facts among which it arose and thus we make it possible for it to react upon us as it acted upon him who produced it when the tradition is broken interpretation is arrested in this case the products of the past remain silent for us thus the expressions contained in the etruscan or mesapian inscriptions are unattainable thus we still hear discussions among ethnographers as to certain products of the art of savages whether they be pictures or writings thus archaeologists and prehistorians are not always able to establish with certainty whether the figures found on the ceramic of a certain region and on other instruments employed be of a religious or of a profane nature but the arrest of interpretation as that of restoration is never a definitely unsurmountable barrier and the daily discoveries of historical sources and of new methods of better exploiting antiquity which we may hope to see ever improving think up broken tradition we do not wish to deny that erroneous historical interpretation produces at times what we may term palimpsests new expressions imposed upon the antique artistic imaginings instead of historical reproductions the so-called fascination of the past depends in part upon these expressions of ours which we weave into historical expressions thus in hellenic plastic art has been discovered the calm and serene intuition of life of those peoples who feel nevertheless so poignantly the universality of sorrow thus has recently been discerned on the faces of the byzantine saints the terror of the millennium a terror which is an equivoque or an artificial legend invented by modern scholars but historical criticism tends precisely to circumscribe vain imaginings and to establish with exactitude the point of view from which we must look thus we live in communication with other men of the present and of the past and we must not conclude because sometimes and indeed often we find ourselves face to face with the unknown or the badly known that when we believe we are engaged in a dialogue we are always speaking a monologue nor that we are unable even to repeat the monologue which in the past we held with ourselves end of chapter 16 recording by lisa reichert chapter 17 of aesthetic as science of expression and general linguistic this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by lisa reichert aesthetic as science of expression and general linguistic by benedetto croce translated by douglas ainsley 1865 to 1948 chapter 17 the history of literature and art historical criticism in literature and art its importance this brief exposition of the method by which is obtained reintegration of the original conditions in which the work of art was produced and by which reproduction and judgment are made possible shows how important is the function fulfilled by historical research concerning artistic and literary works that is to say by what is usually called historical criticism or method in literature and art without tradition and historical criticism the enjoyment of all or nearly all works of art produced by humanity would be irrevocably lost 
we should be little more than animals immersed in the present alone, or in the most recent past. Only fools despise and laugh at him who reconstitutes an authentic text, explains the sense of words and customs, investigates the conditions in which an artist lived, and accomplishes all those labors which revive the qualities and the original coloring of works of art. Sometimes the depreciatory or negative judgment refers to the presumed or proved uselessness of many researches made to recover the correct meaning of artistic works. But it must be observed, in the first place, that historical research does not only fulfill the task of helping to reproduce and judge artistic works. The biography of a writer or of an artist, for example, and the study of the costume of a period also possess their own interest foreign to the history of art, but not foreign to other forms of history. If allusion be made to those researches which do not appear to have interest of any kind, nor to fulfill any purpose, it must be replied that the historical student must often reconcile himself to the useful, but little glorious, office of a cataloguer of facts. These facts remain for the time being formless, incoherent, and insignificant but they are preserves or minds for the historian of the future and for whomsoever may afterward want them for any purpose. In the same way, books which nobody asks for are placed on the shelves and are noted in the catalogues because they may be asked for at some time or other. Certainly, in the same way that an intelligent librarian gives the preference to the acquisition and to the cataloguing of those books which he foresees may be of more or better service, so do intelligent students possess the instinct as to what is or may more probably be useful from among the mass of facts which they are investigating. Others, on the other hand, less well endowed, less intelligent, or more hasty in producing, accumulate useless selections, rejections, and erasures, and lose themselves in refinements and gossipy discussions. But this appertains to the economy of research and is not our affair. At the most, it is the affair of the master who selects the subjects, of the publisher who pays for the printing, and of the critic who is called upon to praise or to blame the students for their researches. On the other hand, it is evident that historical research, directed to illuminate a work of art by placing us in a position to judge it, does not alone suffice to bring it to birth in our spirit. Taste and an imagination trained and awakened are likewise presupposed. The greatest historical erudition may accompany a taste in part gross or defective, a lumbering imagination, or, as it is generally phrased, a cold hard heart closed to art. Which is the lesser evil? Great erudition and defective taste, or natural good taste and great ignorance? The question has often been asked, and perhaps it will be best to deny its possibility, because one cannot tell which of two evils is the less, or what exactly that means. The merely learned man never succeeds in entering into communication with the great spirits, and keeps wandering for ever about the outer courts, the staircases, and the antechambers of their palaces. But the gifted ignoramus either passes by masterpieces which are to him inaccessible, or instead of understanding the works of art, as they really are, he invents others with his imagination. Now the labor of the former may at least serve to enlighten others, but the ingenuity of the latter remains altogether sterile. How then can we fail to prefer the conscientious learned man to the inconclusive man of talent, who is not really talented, if he resign himself, and in so far as he resigns himself, to come to no conclusion? Literary and Artistic History its distinction from historical criticism and from artistic judgment. It is necessary to distinguish accurately the history of art and literature from those historical labors which make use of works of art, but for extraneous purposes, such as biography, civil, religious, and political history, etc. 
and also from historical erudition, whose object is preparation for the aesthetic synthesis of reproduction. The difference between the first of these is obvious. The history of art and literature has the works of art themselves for principal subject. The other branches of study call upon and interrogate works of art, but only as witnesses from which to discover the truth of facts which are not aesthetic. The second difference, to which we have referred, may seem less profound. However, it is very great. Erudition devoted to rendering clear again the understanding of works of art aims simply at making appear a certain internal fact, an aesthetic reproduction. Artistic and literary history, on the other hand, does not appear until such reproduction has been obtained. It demands, therefore, further labor. Like all other history, its object is to record precisely such facts as have really taken place, that is, artistic and literary facts. A man who, after having acquired the requisite historical erudition, reproduces in himself and tastes a work of art, may remain simply a man of taste, or express at the most his own feeling, with an exclamation of beautiful or ugly. This does not suffice for the making of a historian of literature and art. There is further need that the simple act of reproduction be followed in him by a second internal operation. What is this new operation? It is, in its turn, an expression. The expression of the reproduction. The historical description, exposition, or representation. There is this difference, then, between the man of taste and the historian. The first merely reproduces in his spirit the work of art. The second, after having reproduced it, represents it historically, thus applying to it those categories by which, as we know, history is differentiated from pure art. Artistic and literary history is, therefore, a historical work of art founded upon one or more works of art. The denomination of artistic or literary critic is used in various senses. Sometimes it is applied to the student who devotes his services to literature, sometimes to the historian who reveals the works of art of the past in their reality, more often to both. By critic is sometimes understood, in a more restricted sense, he who judges and describes contemporary literary works, and by historian he who is occupied with less recent works. These are but linguistic usages and empirical distinctions, which may be neglected, because the true difference lies between the learned man, the man of taste, and the historian of art. These words designate, as it were, three successive stages of work, of which each is relatively independent of the one that follows, but not of that which precedes. As we have seen, a man may be simply learned, yet possess little capacity for understanding works of art. He may indeed be both learned and possess taste, yet be unable to write a page of artistic and literary history. But the true and complete historian, while containing in himself, as necessary prerequisites, both the learned man and the man of taste must add to their qualities the gift of historical comprehension and representation. THE METHOD OF ARTISTIC AND LITERARY HISTORY The method of artistic and literary history presents problems and difficulties, some common to all historical method, others peculiar to it, because they derive from the concept of art itself. Critique of the Problem of the Origin of Art History is wont to be divided into the history of man, the history or nature, and the mixed history of both the preceding. Without examining here the question of the solidity of this division, it is clear that artistic and literary history belongs in any case to the first, since it concerns a spiritual activity, that is to say, an activity proper to man. And since this activity is its subject, the absurdity of propounding the historical problem of the origin of art becomes at once evident. We should note that by this formula many different things have in turn been included on many different occasions. 
origin has often meant nature or disposition of the artistic fact and here was a real scientific or philosophic problem the very problem in fact which our treatise has tried to solve at other times by origin has been understood the ideal genesis the search for the reason of art the deduction of the artistic fact from a first principle containing in itself both spirit and nature this is also a philosophical problem and it is complementary to the preceding indeed it coincides with it though it has sometimes been strangely interpreted and solved by means of an arbitrary and semi-fantastic metaphysic but when it has been sought to discover further exactly in what way the artistic function was historically formed this has resulted in the absurdity to which we have referred if expression be the first form of consciousness how can the historical origin be sought of what is presupposed not to be a product of nature and of human history how can we find the historical genesis of that which is a category by means of which every historical genesis and fact are understood the absurdity has arisen from the comparison with human institutions which have in fact been formed in the course of history and which have disappeared or may disappear in its course there exists between the aesthetic fact and a human institution such as monogamic marriage or the fife a difference to some extent comparable with that between simple and compound bodies in chemistry it is impossible to indicate the formation of the former otherwise they would not be simple and if this be discovered they cease to be simple and become compound the problem of the origin of art historically understood is only justified when it is proposed to seek not for the formation of the function but where and when art has appeared for the first time appeared that is to say in a striking manner at what point or in what region of the globe and at what point or epoch of its history when that is to say not the origin of art but its most antique or primitive history is the object of research this problem forms one with that of the appearance of human civilization on the earth. Data for its solution are certainly wanting, but there yet remains the abstract possibility, and certainly attempts and hypotheses for its solution abound. History and the Criterion of Progress Every form of human history has the concept of progress for foundation, but by progress must not be understood the imaginary and metaphysical law of progress which should lead the generations of man with irresistible force to some unknown destiny according to a providential plan which we can logically divine and understand a supposed law of this sort is the negation of history itself of that accidentality that empiricity that contingency which distinguish the concrete fact from the abstraction. And for the same reason, progress has nothing to do with the so-called law of evolution. If evolution mean the concrete fact of reality which evolves, that is, which is reality, it is not a law. If, on the other hand, it be a law, it becomes confounded with the law of progress in the sense just described. The progress of which we speak here is nothing but the concept of human activity itself which working upon the material supplied to it by nature conquers obstacles and bends nature to its own ends such conception of progress that is to say of human activity applied to a given material is the point of view of the historian of humanity no one but a mere collector of stray facts a simple seeker or an incoherent chronicler can put together the smallest narrative of human deeds unless he have a definite point of view that is to say an intimate personal conviction regarding the conception of the facts which he has undertaken to relate the historical work of art cannot be achieved among the confused and discordant mass of crude facts save by means of this point of view which makes it possible to carve a definite figure from that rough and incoherent mass the historian of a practical action 
should know what is economy and what morality, the historian of mathematics, what are mathematics, the historian of botany, what is botany, the historian of philosophy, what is philosophy. But if he do not really know these things, he must at least have the illusion of knowing them, otherwise he will never be able to delude himself that he is writing history. We cannot delay here to demonstrate the necessity and the inevitability of this subjective criterion in every narrative of human affairs. We will merely say that this criterion is compatible with the utmost objectivity, impartiality, and scrupulosity in dealing with data and indeed forms a constitutive element of such subjective criterion. It suffices to read any book of history to discover at once the point of view of the author, if he be a historian worthy of the name and know his own business. There exist liberal and reactionary, rationalist and Catholic historians, who deal with political or social history. For the history of philosophy there are metaphysical, empirical, skeptical, idealist and spiritualist historians. Absolutely historical historians do not and cannot exist. Can it be said that Thucydides and Polybius, Livy and Tacitus, Machiavelli and Guicciardini, Genoni and Voltaire, were without moral and political views? And in our time, Guizot or Thiers, Macaulay or Balbo, Ranke or Momsen, and in the history of philosophy from Hegel, who was the first to raise it to a great elevation, to Ritter, Zeller, Cousin, Luz, and Ars Paventa, was there one who did not possess his conception of progress and criterion of judgment? Is there one single work of any value in the history of aesthetic, which has not been written from this or that point of view, with this or that bias, Hegelian or Herbartian, from a sensualist or from an eclectic point of view, and so on? If the historian is to escape from the inevitable necessity of taking a side, he must become a political and scientific eunuch, and history is not the business of eunuchs. They would at most be of use in compiling those great tomes of not useless erudition, elumbus atque fracta, which are called, not without reason, monkish. If, then, the concept of progress, the point of view, the criterion, be inevitable, the best to be done is not to try and escape from them, but to obtain the best possible. Everyone strives for this end, when he forms his own convictions, seriously and laboriously. Historians who profess to wish to interrogate the facts, without adding anything of their own to them, are not to be believed. This, at the most, is the result of ingenuousness and illusion on their part. They will always add what they have of personal, if they be truly historians, though it be without knowing it, or they will believe that they have escaped doing so, only because they have referred to it by innuendo, which is the most insinuating and penetrative of methods. Non-existence of a unique line of progress in artistic and literary history Artistic and literary history cannot dispense with the criterion of progress any more easily than other history. We cannot show what a given work of art is, save by proceeding from a conception of art, in order to fix the artistic problem which the author of such work of art had to solve, and by determining whether or no he have solved it, or by how much and in what way he has failed to do so. But it is important to note that the criterion of progress assumes a different form in artistic and literary history to that which it assumes, or is believed to assume, in the history of science. The whole history of knowledge can be represented by one single line of progress and regress. Science is the universal, and its problems are arranged in one single vast system, or complex problem. All thinkers weary themselves over the same problem as to the nature of reality and of knowledge. Contemplative Indians and Greek philosophers, Christians and Mohammedans, bare heads and heads with turbans, wigged heads and heads with the black beretta, as Heine said, and future generations will weary themselves with it, as ours has done. 
it would take too long to inquire here if this be true or not of science. But it is certainly not true of art. Art is intuition, and intuition is individuality. And individuality is never repeated. To conceive of the history of the artistic production of the human race as developed along a single line of progress and regress would therefore be altogether erroneous. At the most, and working to some extent with generalizations and abstractions, it may be admitted that the history of aesthetic products shows progressive cycles, but each cycle has its own problem, and is progressive only in respect to that problem. When many are at work on the same subject, without succeeding in giving to it the suitable form, yet drawing always more nearly to it, there is said to be progress. When he who gives to it definite form appears, the cycle is said to be complete, progress ended. A typical example of this would be the progress in the elaboration of the mode of using the subject matter of chivalry during the Italian Renaissance, from Pulci to Ariosto. If this instance be made use of, excessive simplification of it must be excused. Nothing but repetition and imitation could be the result of employing that same material after Ariosto. The result was repetition or imitation, diminution or exaggeration, a spoiling of what had already been achieved, in some decadence. The Ariostesque epigoni proved this. Progress begins with the commencement of a new cycle. Cervantes, with his more open and conscious irony, is an instance of this. In what did the general decadence of Italian literature at the end of the sixteenth century consist? Simply in having nothing more to say, and in repeating and exaggerating motives already found. If the Italians of this period had even been able to express their own decadence, they would not have been altogether failures, but have anticipated the literary movement of the Renaissance. Where the subject matter is not the same, a progressive cycle does not exist. Shakespeare does not represent a progress as regards Dante, nor Goethe as regards Shakespeare. Dante, however, represents a progress in respect to the visionaries of the Middle Ages, Shakespeare to the Elizabethan dramatists, Goethe with Werther and the first part of Faust in respect to the writers of the Sturm und Drang. This mode of presenting the history of poetry and art contains, however, as we have remarked, something of abstract, of merely practical, and is without rigorous philosophical value. Not only is the art of savages not inferior, as art, to that of civilized peoples, provided it be correlative to the impressions of the savage. But every individual, indeed every moment of the spiritual life of an individual, has its artistic world, and all those worlds are artistically incomparable with one another. Errors committed in respect to this law. Many have sinned and continue to sin against this special form of the criterion of progress in artistic and literary history. Some, for instance, talk of the infancy of Italian art in Giotto and of its maturity in Raphael or in Titian, as though Giotto were not quite perfect and complete in respect to his psychic material. He was certainly incapable of drawing a figure like Raphael or of coloring it like Titian. But was Raphael or Titian by any chance capable of creating the Matrimonio di San Francesco con la Poverte, or the Morte di San Francesco? The spirit of Giotto had not felt the attraction of the body beautiful, which the Renaissance studied and raised to a place of honor, but the spirits of Raphael and of Titian were no longer curious of certain movements of ardor and of tenderness which attracted the man of the fourteenth century. How, then, can a comparison be made, where there is no comparative term? The celebrated divisions of the history of art suffer from the same defect. They are as follows. An oriental period, representing a disequilibrium between idea and form, with prevalence of the second. 
a classical representing an equilibrium between idea and form a romantic representing a new disequilibrium between idea and form with prevalence of the idea there are also the divisions into oriental art representing imperfection of form classical perfection of form romantic or modern perfection of content and of form thus classic and romantic have also received among their many other meanings that of progressive or regressive periods in respect to the realization of some indefinite artistic ideal of humanity other meanings of the word progress in respect to aesthetic there is no such thing then as an aesthetic progress of humanity however by aesthetic progress is sometimes meant not what the two words coupled together really signify but the ever-increasing accumulation of our historical knowledge which makes us able to sympathize with all the artistic products of all peoples and of all times or as is said to make our taste more catholic the difference appears very great if the eighteenth century so incapable of escaping from itself be compared with our own time which enjoys alike hellenic and roman art now better understood byzantine medieval arabic and renaissance art the art of the cinque santo baroque art and the art of the seventeenth century egyptian babylonian etruscan and even prehistoric art are more profoundly studied every day certainly the difference between the savage and civilized man does not lie in the human faculties the savage has speech intellect religion and morality in common with civilized man and he is a complete man the only difference lies in that civilized man penetrates and dominates a larger portion of the universe with his theoretic and practical activity we cannot claim to be more spiritually alert than for example the contemporaries of pericles but no one can deny that we are richer than they rich with their riches and with those of how many other peoples and generations besides our own by aesthetic progress is also meant in another sense which is also improper the greater abundance of artistic intuitions and the smaller number of imperfect or decadent works which one epoch produces in respect to another thus it may be said that there was aesthetic progress an artistic awakening at the end of the thirteenth or of the fifteenth centuries finally aesthetic progress is talked of with an eye to the refinement and to the physical complications exhibited in the works of art of the most civilized peoples as compared with those of less civilized peoples barbarians and savages but in this case the progress is that of the complex conditions of society not of the artistic activity to which the material is indifferent these are the most important points concerning the method of artistic and literary history end of chapter 17 read by lisa reichert Chapter 18 of Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Reichert. Aesthetic as Science of Expression and General Linguistic by Benedetto Croce. Translated by Douglas Ainsley, 1865-1948. Chapter 18. Conclusion. Identity of Linguistic and Aesthetic. Summary of the Inquiry. A glance over the path traversed will show that we have completed the entire program of our treatise. We have studied the nature of intuitive or expressive knowledge, which is the aesthetic or artistic fact, Chapter 1 and Chapter 2, and we have described the other form of knowledge, namely the intellectual, with the secondary complications of its forms, chapter 3. Having done this, it became possible to criticize all erroneous theories of art, which arise from the confusion between the various forms, and from the undue transference of the characteristics of one form to those of another, chapter 4, 
and in so doing to indicate the inverse errors which are found in the theory of intellectual knowledge and of historiography chapter five passing on to examine the relations between the aesthetic activity and the other spiritual activities no longer theoretical but practical we have indicated the true character of the practical activity and the place which it occupies in respect to the theoretic activity which it follows hence the critique of the invasion of aesthetic theory by practical concepts chapter six we have also distinguished the two forms of the practical activity as economic and ethic chapter seven adding to this the statement that there are no other forms of the spirit beyond the four which we have analyzed hence chapter eight the critique of every metaphysical aesthetic and seeing that there exist no other spiritual forms of equal degree therefore there are no original subdivisions of the four established and in particular of aesthetic from this arises the impossibility of classes of expressions and the critique of rhetoric that is of the partition of expressions into simple and ornate and of their subclasses chapter nine but by the law of the unity of the spirit the aesthetic fact is also a practical fact and as such occasions pleasure and pain this led us to study the feelings of value in general and those of aesthetic value or of the beautiful in particular chapter ten to criticize aesthetic hedonism in all its various manifestations and complications chapter eleven and to expel from the system of aesthetic the long series of pseudo-aesthetic concepts which had been introduced into it chapter twelve proceeding from aesthetic production to the facts of reproduction we began by investigating the mode of fixing externally the aesthetic expression with the view of reproduction this is the so-called physically beautiful whether it be natural or artificial chapter thirteen we then derived from this distinction the critique of the errors which arise from confounding the physical with the aesthetic side of things chapter fourteen we indicated the meaning of artistic technique that which is the technique serving for reproduction thus criticizing the divisions limits and classifications of the individual arts and establishing the connections between art economy and morality chapter fifteen because the existence of the physical objects does not suffice to stimulate to the full aesthetic reproduction and because in order to obtain this result it is necessary to recall the conditions in which the stimulus first operated we have also studied the function of historical erudition directed toward the end of re-establishing our communication with the works of the past and toward the creation of a base for aesthetic judgment chapter sixteen we have closed our treatise by showing how the reproduction thus obtained is afterwards elaborated by the intellectual categories that is to say by an excursus on the method of literary and artistic history chapter seventeen the aesthetic fact has thus been considered both in itself and in its relations with the other spiritual activities with the feelings of pleasure and of pain with the facts that are called physical with memory and with historical elaboration it has passed from the position of subject to that of object that is to say from the moment of its birth until gradually it becomes changed for the spirit into historical argument our treatise may appear to be somewhat meagre when compared with the great volumes usually consecrated to aesthetic but it will not seem so when it is observed that these volumes as regards nine-tenths of their contents are full of matter which does not appertain to aesthetic such as definitions either physical or metaphysical of pseudo-aesthetic concepts of the sublime the comic the tragic the humorous etc or of the exposition of the supposed zoology botany and mineralogy of aesthetic and of universal history judged from the aesthetic standpoint the whole history of concrete art and literature has also been dragged into those aesthetics and generally mangled they contain judgments upon homer and dante upon ariosto and shakespeare upon beethoven and rossini 
Michelangelo and Raphael. When all this has been deducted from them, our treatise will no longer be held to be too meagre, but on the contrary, far more copious than ordinary treatises, for these either omit altogether, or hardly touch at all, the great part of the difficult problems proper to aesthetic, which we have felt it to be our duty to study. IDENTITY OF LINGUISTIC AND AESTHETIC Aesthetic, then, as the science of expression, has been here studied by us from every point of view, but there yet remains to justify the subtitle, which we have joined to the title of our book, General Linguistic, and to state and make clear the thesis that the science of art is that of language. Aesthetic and linguistic, in so far as they are true sciences, are not two different sciences, but one single science. Not that there is a special linguistic, but the linguistic science sought for, general linguistic, in so far as what it contains is reducible to philosophy, is nothing but aesthetic. Whoever studies general linguistic, that is to say, philosophical linguistic, studies aesthetic problems, and vice versa. Philosophy of language and philosophy of art are the same thing. Were linguistic a different science from aesthetic, it should not have expression, which is the essentially aesthetic fact for its object. This amounts to saying that it must be denied that language is expression. But an emission of sounds, which expresses nothing, is not language. Language is articulate, limited, organized sound, employed in expression. If, on the other hand, language were a special science in respect to aesthetic, it would necessarily have for its object a special class of expressions. But the inexistence of classes of expression is a point which we have already demonstrated. Aesthetic Formulization of Linguistic Problems Nature of Language The problems which linguistic serves to solve, and the errors with which linguistic strives and has striven, are the same that occupy and complicate aesthetic. If it be not always easy, it is, on the other hand, always possible, to reduce the philosophic questions of linguistic to their aesthetic formula. The disputes as to the nature of the one find their parallel in those as to the nature of the other. Thus it has been disputed whether linguistic be a scientific or a historical discipline, and the scientific having been distinguished from the historical, it has been asked whether it belonged to the order of the natural or of the psychological sciences, by the latter being understood empirical psychology as much as the science of the spirit. The same has happened with aesthetic, which some have looked upon as a natural science, confounding aesthetic expression with physical expression. Others have looked upon it as a psychological science, confounding expression in its universality with the empirical classification of expressions. Others again, denying the very possibility of a science of such a subject, have looked upon it as a collection of historical facts. Finally, it has been realized that it belongs to the sciences of activity or of values, which are the spiritual sciences. Linguistic expression or speech has often seemed to be a fact of interjection, which belongs to the so-called physical expressions of the feelings, common alike to men and animals. But it was soon admitted that an abyss yawns between the ah, which is a physical reflex of pain, and a word as also between the a ah of pain and the a ah employed as a word. The theory of the interjection being abandoned, jocosely termed the a ah a ah theory by German linguists, the theory of association or convention appeared. This theory was refuted by the same objection which destroyed aesthetic associationism in general. Speech is unity, not multiplicity of images and multiplicity does not explain, but presupposes the existence of the expression to explain. A variant of linguistic associationism is the imitative, that is to say, the theory of the onomatopoeia, which the same philologists deride under the name of the bow-wow theory, after the imitation of the dog's bark, which, according to the onomatopoeists, 
gives its name to the dog. The most usual theory of our times as regards language, apart from mere crass naturalism, consists of a sort of eclecticism or mixture of the various theories to which we have referred. It is assumed that language is in part the product of interjections and in part of onomatopes and conventions. This doctrine is altogether worthy of the scientific and philosophic decadence of the second half of the nineteenth century. Origin of Language and its Development We must here note a mistake into which have fallen those very philologists who have best penetrated the active nature of language. These, although they admit that language was originally a spiritual creation, yet maintain that it was largely increased later by association. But the distinction does not prevail, for origin in this case cannot mean anything but nature or essence. If, therefore, language be a spiritual creation, it will always be a creation. If it be association, it will have been so from the beginning. The mistake has arisen from not having grasped the general principle of aesthetic, which we have noted, namely, that expressions already produced must redescend to the rank of impressions before they can give rise to new impressions. When we utter new words, we generally transform the old ones, varying or enlarging their meaning. But this process is not associative. It is creative although the creation has for material the impressions, not of the hypothetical primitive man, but of man who has lived long ages in society, and who has, so to say, stored so many things in his psychic organism, and among them so much language. RELATION BETWEEN GRAMMAR AND LOGIC The question of the distinction between the aesthetic and the intellectual fact has appeared in linguistic as that of the relations between grammar and logic. This question has found two solutions which are partially true, that of the indissolubility of logic and grammar, and that of their dissolubility. The complete solution is this. If the logical form be indissoluble from the grammatical, aesthetic, the grammatical is dissoluble from the logical. GRAMMATICAL CLASSES OR PARTS OF SPEECH If we look at a picture which, for example, portrays a man walking on a country road, we can say, this picture represents a fact of movement, which, if conceived as volitional, is called action, and because every movement implies matter, and every action a being that acts, this picture also represents either matter or a being. But this movement takes place in a definite place, which is a part of a given star, the earth, and precisely in that part of it which is called terra firma, and more properly, in a part of it that is wooded and covered with grass, which is called country, cut naturally or artificially, in a manner which is called road. Now there is only one example of that given star, which is called earth. Earth is an individual. But terra firma, country, road, are classes or universals, because there are other terra firmas, other countries, other roads. And it would be possible to continue for a while with similar considerations. By substituting a phrase for the picture that we have imagined, for example, one to this effect, Peter is walking on a country road. And by making the same remarks, we obtain the concepts of verb, motion or action, of noun, matter or agent, of proper noun, of common nouns, and so on. What have we done in both cases? Neither more nor less than to submit to logical elaboration what was first elaborated only aesthetically. That is to say, we have destroyed the aesthetical by the logical. But as in general aesthetic, error begins when it is wished to return from the logical to the aesthetical, and it is asked what is the expression of the movement, action, matter, being, of the general, of the individual, etc. Thus, in like manner with language, error begins when motion or action are called verb, being, or matter, noun or substantive, 
and when linguistic categories or parts of speech are made of all these, noun and verb and so on. The theory of parts of speech is at bottom altogether the same as that of artistic and literary classes, already criticized in the aesthetic. It is false to say that the verb or the noun is expressed in definite words, truly distinguishable from others. Expression is an indivisible whole. Noun and verb do not exist in themselves, but are abstractions made by our destroying the sole linguistic reality, which is the proposition. This last is to be understood, not in the usual mode of grammarians, but as an organism expressive of a complete meaning, from an exclamation to a poem. This sounds paradoxical, but is nevertheless a most simple truth. And as in aesthetic, the artistic productions of certain peoples have been looked upon as imperfect, owing to the error above mentioned, because the supposed kinds have seemed still to be indiscriminate or absent with them. So, in linguistic, the theory of the parts of speech has caused the analogous error of dividing languages into formed and unformed, according to whether there appear in them or not some of those supposed parts of speech, for example, the verb. The Individuality of Speech and the Classification of Languages Linguistic also discovered the irreducible individuality of the aesthetic fact, when it affirmed that the word is what is really spoken, and that two truly identical words do not exist. Thus were synonyms and homonyms destroyed, and thus was shown the impossibility of really translating one word into another, from so-called dialect into so-called language, and from a so-called mother tongue into a so-called foreign tongue. But the attempt to classify languages agrees ill with this correct view. Languages have no reality beyond the propositions and complexes of propositions really written and pronounced by given peoples for definite periods. That is to say, they have no existence outside the works of art in which they exist concretely. What is the art of a given people but the complex of all its artistic products? What is the character of an art, say Hellenic art or Provencal literature, but the complex physiognomy of those products? And how can such a question be answered save by giving the history of their art, of their literature, that is to say, of their language in action? It will seem that this argument, although possessing value as against many of the wanted classifications of languages, yet is without any as regards that queen of classifications, the historico-genealogical, that glory of comparative philology. And this is certainly true. But why? Precisely because the historico-genealogical method is not a classification. He who writes history does not classify, and the philologists themselves have hastened to say that the languages which can be arranged in a historical series, those whose series have been traced, are not distinct and definite species, but a complex of facts in the various phases of its development. Impossibility of a Normative Grammar Language has sometimes been looked upon as an act of volition or of choice, but others have discovered the impossibility of creating language artificially by an act of will. Tu, Caesar, civitatum dare potes homini, verba non polis, was once said to the Roman emperor. The aesthetic, and therefore theoretic, nature of expression supplies the method of correcting the scientific error which lies in the conception of a normative grammar, containing the rules of speaking well. Good sense has always rebelled against this error. An example of such rebellion is the so much the worse for grammar of Voltaire. But the impossibility of a normative grammar is also recognized by those who teach it, when they confess that to write well cannot be learned by rules, that there are no rules without exceptions, and that the study of grammar should be conducted practically, by reading and by examples, which form the literary taste. The scientific reason of this impossibility lies in what we have already proved, that a technique of the theoretical amounts to a contradiction in terms. 
and what could a normative grammar be but just a technique of linguistic expression, that is to say, of a theoretic fact. Didactic Purposes The case in which grammar is understood merely as an empirical discipline, that is to say, as a collection of groups useful for learning languages, without any claim whatever to philosophic truth, is quite different. Even the abstractions of the parts of speech are in this case both admissible and of assistance. Many books entitled Treatises of a Linguistic have a merely didactic purpose. They are simply scholastic manuals. We find in them, in truth, a little of everything from the description of the vocal apparatus and of the artificial machines, phonographs, which can imitate it, to summaries of the most important results obtained by Indo-European, Semitic, Coptic, Chinese, or other philologies, from philosophic generalizations on the origin or nature of language to advice on calligraphy and the arrangement of schedules for philological spoils. But this mass of notions, which is here taught in a fragmentary and incomplete manner as regards the language in its essence, the language as expression, resolves itself into notions of aesthetic. Nothing exists outside aesthetic, which gives knowledge of the nature of language and empirical grammar, which is a pedagogic expedient, save the history of languages in their living reality, that is, the history of concrete literary productions, which is substantially identical with the history of literature. Elementary Linguistic Facts or Roots The same mistake of confusing the physical with the aesthetic, from which the elementary forms of the beautiful originate, is made by those who seek for elementary aesthetic facts, decorating with that name the divisions of the longer series of physical sounds into shorter series. Syllables, vowels, and consonants, and the series of syllables called words, which give no definite sense when taken alone, are not facts of language, but simple physical concepts of sounds. Another mistake of the same sort is that of roots, to which the most able philologists now accord but a very limited value. Having confused physical with linguistic or expressive facts, and observing that, in the order of ideas, the simple precedes the complex, they necessarily ended by thinking that the smaller physical facts were the more simple. Hence the imaginary necessity that the most antique, primitive languages had been monosyllabic, and that the progress of historical research must lead to the discovery of monosyllabic roots. But, to follow up the imaginary hypothesis, the first expression that the first man conceived may also have had a mimetic, not a phonic reflex. It may have been exteriorized, not in a sound, but in a gesture. And assuming that it was exteriorized in a sound, there is no reason to suppose that sound to have been monosyllabic rather than plurisyllabic. Philologists frequently blame their own ignorance and impotence if they do not always succeed in reducing plurisyllabism to monosyllabism, and they trust in the future. But their faith is without foundation, as their blame of themselves is an act of humility arising from an erroneous presumption. Furthermore, the limits of syllables, as those of words, are altogether arbitrary and distinguished, as well as may be, by empirical use. Primitive speech, or the speech of the uncultured man, is continuous, unaccompanied by any reflex consciousness of the divisions of the word and of the syllables which are taught at school. No true law of linguistic can be founded on such divisions. Proof of this is to be found in the confession of linguists that there are no truly phonetic laws of the hiatus, of cacophony, of diaresis, of synaresis, but merely laws of taste and convenience, that is to say, aesthetic laws. And what are the laws of words which are not at the same time laws of style? Aesthetic Judgment and the Model Language The search for a model language, or for a method of reducing linguistic usage to unity, arises from the misconception of a rationalistic measurement of the beautiful, from the concept which we have termed 
that of false aesthetic absoluteness. In Italy we call this question that of the unity of the language. Language is perpetual creation. What has been linguistically expressed cannot be repeated, save by the reproduction of what has already been produced. The ever-new impressions give rise to continuous changes of sounds and of meanings, that is, to ever-new expressions. To seek the model language, then, is to seek the immobility of motion. Every one speaks and should speak according to the echoes which things arouse in his soul, that is, according to his impressions. It is not without reason that the most convinced supporter of any one of the solutions of the problem of the unity of language be it by the use of Latin, a fourteenth-century Italian, or of Florentine, feels a repugnance in applying his theory when he is speaking in order to communicate his thoughts and to make himself understood. The reason for this is that he feels that were he to substitute Latin, fourteenth-century Italian, or Florentine speech for that of a different origin, but which answers to his impressions, he would be falsifying the latter. He would become a vain listener to himself instead of a speaker, a pedant in place of a serious man, a histrion instead of a sincere person. To write according to a theory is not really to write. At the most, it is making literature. The question of the unity of language is always reappearing, because put as it is, there can be no solution to it owing to its being based upon a false conception of what language is. Language is not an arsenal of ready-made arms, and it is not vocabulary, which, in so far as it is thought of as progressive and in living use, is always a cemetery containing corpses more or less well embalmed, that is to say, a collection of abstractions. Our mode of settling the question of the model language or of the unity of the language, may seem somewhat abrupt, and yet we would not wish to appear otherwise than respectful towards the long line of literary men who have debated this question in Italy for centuries. But those ardent debates were, at bottom, debates upon aestheticity, not upon aesthetic science, upon literature rather than upon literary theory, upon effective speaking and writing, not upon linguistic science. Their error consisted in transforming the manifestation of a want into a scientific thesis, the need of understanding one another more easily among a people dialectically divided, in the philosophic search for a language which should be one or ideal. Such a search was as absurd as that other search for a universal language, with the immobility of the concept and of the abstraction. The social need for a better understanding of one another cannot be satisfied save by universal culture, by the increase of communications, and by the interchange of thought among men. Conclusion These observations must suffice to show that all the scientific problems of linguistic are the same as those of aesthetic, and that the truths and errors of the one are the truths and errors of the other. If linguistic and aesthetic appear to be two different sciences, this arises from the fact that people think of the former as grammar, or as a mixture between philosophy and grammar, that is, an arbitrary, mnemonic scheme. They do not think of it as a rational science, and as a pure philosophy of speech. Grammar, or something grammatical, also causes the prejudice in people's minds, that the reality of language lies in isolated and combinable words, not in living discourse among expressive organisms, rationally indivisible. Those linguists or glottologists with philosophical endowments who have best fathomed questions of language resemble, to employ a worn but efficacious figure, workmen piercing a tunnel. At a certain point they must hear the voices of their companions, the philosophers of aesthetic, who have been piercing it from the other side. At a certain stage of scientific elaboration, linguistic, in so far as it is philosophy, must be merged in aesthetic, and indeed it is merged in it, without leaving a residue. End of chapter 18. Read by Lisa Reichert.